Please be seated. Someone's got a well. Someone's got an open mic. One, two, three. Does any of the lawyers have an open mic? Madam Court Reporter, is it yours? I have two microphones that I have used since day one, and it's not done this up to this point. to the bottom of it. Testing. Testing one, two, three. It almost seems like it's coming from right here. It does. And I have my two mics sitting there that they've been Five, three, two, one. Let's take appearances. Gregory Anderson and Nick Whitney, what do you have to tell you? Well, Howard Hunter, Your Honor, on behalf of All Children's Hospital, with Ethan Shapiro, Pat Crowell, and David Hughes. And our, our corporate representative today is uh, Dr. Michelle Smith at Mike Streamline. From a preview while we're waiting for IT to come deal with the academic. There seems to be a lot of things we've got to deal with this morning. We've got an echo issue that's coming from over here. I wonder if that laptop is surface. One, two, three. One, two, three. Test one, two, three. Testing one, two, three. Testing one, two, three. Yeah, sure. Can you push that microphone down a little bit? Okay, thank you. Much better. There seems to be a, a number of issues we need to deal with this morning. It looks like there's a lot of exhibit issues that we have to deal with. Uh, I'm ready um, to discuss the my thoughts on the jury instructions relative to the suicide um, issue. I'd kind of like to get that also done, but that's probably going to take 10 minutes or, or so, given my thoughts. Um, the, I did receive both memos on the issue of the delayed disclosure. I don't think we have time to deal with that this morning, maybe late this afternoon. If not, we'll deal with that tomorrow. No, we don't have Tom Elliott here for the jury instruction. We can have him here, though, in a break or later. Um, I didn't realize we were going to argue it this morning. It's not more of an argument. It's more of a pronouncement. And we can probably have... I'm, I'm actually going to be asking when we I make a, my thoughts, I'm going to ask the court reporter to actually transcribe that portion of it and send me a copy of it. So um, he'll have that. And then I, I saw there was also a motion to ask for a special instruction relative to the Facebook message from Friday and then, of course, whatever you all need. So it's very ambitious. Has there been further movement on the exhibit issue from this exhibit list? Uh, Your Honor, we have uh, 
Has there been further movement on it, yes or no? Barely. Most of these two are fit within 803 or 804. Right. So the answer is no. The answer is no. Okay, let's, let's not, we don't have time this morning for the long-winded yes, answers. I can go ahead and receive that. those that were stipulated to, is that correct? Yes, sir. Okay. The court receives the uh, totality of Exhibit 2044, 2353, 2354, 2355, 2356, 2362, 2419, 2420, 2421, 2425, 2426, 2428, 2435. Now let's move on to what we need to, Mr. Anderson, relative to these exhibits. Uh, yes, Judge. Uh, so we can either take up all of the exhibits for today, which would include those, so the court's aware, we have uh, first uh, Yarek Silberic, uh, the deputy the, uh, detective. On the Are you intending to use all of these exhibits today? That's the idea. I'd like to get as many of them as we could. Okay. Well, let's start dealing with them. And this, on this exhibit list, beginning with 2018. However you want to do it, it's your case. I'll tell you what. Um, do you have the list uh, for Yarek Silberic? A short list? No. I have the full list of apparently for today. If I may sit down, Judge, I think I can transpose real quick. I tell you, actually, just let me tell you the ones we've got to worry about today. J just start with one. Let's, let's yes, 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 sir. Two zero three one photographs from the scene of Viata Kowalski's death. Uh, actually, we're not going to use that. We're going to use two zero three one A, which is photographs from the scene of Viata Kowalski's death, blurred, uh, and then. We would like to put in later uh, 2031 unblurred, but for today in the public realm, we would like to use the blurred face. Okay. Why are you going to put in, is it the same photo, just blurred and unblurred? It's the exact same photo, it's just a face. Why, why are we putting in two different versions of the same thing? Uh, public uh, dispersal of the image of Beata Kowalski and her, with her being able to see her face going out in the media. We would prefer not to have that. And we, but for the jury, obviously the original is the better choice. I am open to suggestions. Ms. Crowells. Thank you, Judge. We object to all of the photographs. We don't think any of them are necessary for the purposes of the issues in this case. There's no dispute that she committed suicide. If the court is planning on putting in any of the photos, we don't think that the last photo that shows the frontal view and shows her face blurred or unblurred is necessary. It doesn't add anything. There's no additional information for this jury to make its decision that these photographs act at all. And we especially object to the one that shows her face. And there's no issue that these address uh, for the jury. Well, he, he, here's my view on the blurred versus unblurred. If we are showing something to the jury, then I feel the public has the right to see what the jury sees. That's part of the genius of our, our system. So, Make a choice, right? Well, if, if you wish to put in the unblurred, then that's what is going to be shown <clears throat> here in the courtroom, and then if the media wishes to blur their, the image, that's the media's choice, but we're going to have the... We'll go with 2031, the unblurred. Hopefully the media will be respectful and, uh, and blur out her face in death. How, how many how many photos are we talking about in this series? 
there are, I believe, simply, well, let's see. Um, half out of the house for the dryer. Don't we have a one up from the back? There's 26 photos in 2031. All right. Um, then there is, uh, for right now, there is, let's just move to the next one, which is 2031-003, photo of the front of the house with police tape across the driveway, document date, time. I'm, I'm sorry, Judge, I don't know where I, Mr. Anderson's I don't know. talking. I just, I, I'm asking pointed questions. Let's not have lengthy answer. I just need a specific answer. How many photos are in 2031? Four we intend to put in. Well, Judge, I don't left. know which four those are because they just gave them all. How many are in the series? Just tell me that. 26. 26 in the series. Okay, we're not putting 26 photos in of the I same understand. issue. Yes, I understand. Now, on Ms. Crowell's point about not putting any in, I'm, I disagree with that. I do think um, there, there was evidence or is going to be evidence that Mr. Kowalski viewed the scene, and I feel like that's going to be relevant to the issues in this case. So you're going to get some, but you're not getting 26. Yes, Your Honor. If I'll explain, uh, Ms. Perry is uh, ill uh, this morning, and I had uh, three others, and I will identify them quickly while we go through the rest, but I'll just tell you very quickly, within 2301, one is the same photo from behind, uh, another one is of her wrist, and another one is from Can, can the you just tell bag. us the 2031, what numbers? That's, you know, we've wasted about seven minutes trying to get to this specific point. 019. You want 019. Yes, I know. That one. Zero two one. I didn't hear that. I'm sorry. Zero two one. Okay. All right, I actually go back. That one. Zero two three. Okay, go back. Uh, that one. Zero two four. That's four. That's four. Mm -hmm. Well, police tape's a separate one. Okay. Uh, go, go further up. This is the first one. Go keep down. going. Just go back. Uh, go back one. Another one. All right. No, keep going. Okay. Let's see what else. We do not have time for you not to be prepared, Mr. Anderson. And that is uh, zero one one. Zero one one. So one more judge. So there's five photos. Defense, have you looked at those five photos? Is I'm looking at them real quickly, Judge. Now, for the members of the, the public, let me just, whenever the, when are these photos coming? This morning. Okay. Well, with the Detective Severic. Which one? I, I anticipate and expect that everyone in the courtroom, including the gallery, uh, just give you a heads up. Some of these photos are pretty gruesome. And I expect everybody not to react when they are uh, shown. I think we are all adults here and understand that, uh, you know, this is coming. If you don't think you cannot react, or if you're going to react or you think you're going to react, I'm going to invite you to, to leave when that happens. Because I do not want a spectacle in the courtroom when these photos are shown. Anything Judge, other than uh, just regular other, relevance? I'm sorry. Anything um, other than regular relevance on those five photos? On this one, four. On, on uh, 
zero. I'm sorry, are we still in 2031, Judge? 2031. Yes. So we would object to the 011 photograph. And what's the basis for that one? Hearsay. It hasn't, not something that Mr. Kowalski, I don't think, viewed. I'm going to need to see the photo. So either someone can just hand me the, the photo uh, or... Here, I flagged the ones, Judge, that... I'm going to overrule as to zero one one. Okay. Right. Anything with the other Not, four? No further objection other than stated. Okay. This, the court's going to admit over the defense exempt, uh, objection two zero three one dash zero one one zero one nine zero two one zero two three and zero two four. What's next? The next is, uh, I don't know if this is encompassing with it. Uh, you, you, know, you just ruled on 011, Judge. Is that right? Yes, I see. Okay. Uh, police report, it's uh, 2032. 2032. You're putting Judge. in a, a, a law enforcement report? Yes. Yes, Your Honor. It's uh, 8038. Yes. Law enforcement reports generally don't come in. So uh, explain to me why you're trying to put in a law enforcement report. You know, now that court mentions it, <clears throat> I think what we'll do is just use a refresh recollection on that. Okay. What's next? And then 232-12 uh, to 13, those are the uh, suicide numbers. Wait a second. I'm sorry. What, what, what number? You're, you're, you're reading two, wrong numbers. 232-12. Two, two, you're missing a number someplace. And one three. Judge, he's talking about within two zero three two. Oh, oh, within sorry. two zero three two. Yes. If I could help. So within I'm not two sure. zero three two. What are you trying to put in now? Suicide notes. Is there a number on those? Two zero three two dash twelve and thirteen. Thank you. One second. Those aren't these actual suicide notes. Those are the transcriptions of them that are appearing in the police report or, or in the autopsy and the computer. Those are the actual notes. Those are the actual notes? The actual notes. Okay. All right, Judge. All right. No objection. Okay, so... Mr. Anderson, you're representing that 012 and 013 of Exhibit 2032 is the actual notes? Yes, there were two. There was one that was transcribed within the police report, and there was a second one that was typed out by Beata Kowalski and then printed out. We have the printed out pages. So no objection from the defense? Is that correct? Zero one two and zero one three. I'm sorry, no, Judge. No, Judge. It's suicide one is twelve and thirteen. Two three two, twelve to thirteen is suicide note one. Two three two fourteen is suicide note. You, you're you're you have four digits, not three digits for your exhibits, okay. and, and you keep right. Two three two. Two zero three two. Two zero three two zero zero one two and zero zero one three. Original suicide note one. Two two zero three two dash zero zero one four and zero zero one five. Second suicide note. I'm going to object. On both pieces. Uh, hearsay. 8043. 8043. Tell me what, what, what you're Statement saying. of dying declaration. Statement under, under impending death. Okay. Court's 
and we agree 012, 013, 014, and 015 are the correct pages? Yes. Okay. The court's going to overrule the uh, defense objection. I will receive into evidence 2032 pages 012, 013, 014, 015. What's next? 2034. For the record, Sarasota County Sheriff's Records, Riata Kowalski, death. So you're, you're trying to put in the law enforcement report again? No, I believe this is something different. Let me pull it up. Judge, it contains the law enforcement report. It also contains the autopsy report. Um, no, it, Judge, it, uh, there's only one part of it, and it's actually down at 2034-0019, which is a list of the medications found by the detective on the scene. Did, let, let me, just out of curiosity, did you tell them that you were only going to use 0019 out of 2034? I don't recall exactly what the conversations were because, to tell you the truth, Judge, we never got that far in our discussions. Judge, there was no discussion about this. They gave us the list yesterday, part of it at noon, part of it at 6, and one at 9 o'clock at night. They said, this is our list. What you're seeing here is they created this list. I just added my objections to the side. So this is what they sent us, that they're putting in this exhibit, 2034. And this is precisely what I'm trying to avoid, Mr. Anderson. I need you, and I need your team, to be specific with the, with the exhibits that you're going to use. If you are going to only use certain pages, identify those certain pages. We have spent probably 15 minutes this morning of time we don't have while you're trying to figure out the specific page numbers. That, that is not my time that we should be doing with. I understand, Your Honor. So, and I can't have this rolling, you know, 12, 6, 9 p.m., especially on a weekend. So I think we need to get back to, you've got to tell them by the end of lunch on the day before, the, the business day before. So that means today at the end of lunch, you need to tell them what your exhibits are for tomorrow. That would be extremely difficult considering the preparations for the next witness and with the witnesses for the next day in this instance simply because there are two doctors, Dr. Kirkpatrick and Dr. Hanna. And that will require at least an hour's worth of review from me to separate out. The reason we're having these problems is I have a sick paralegal and Kelly Perry knew all about these and so we jumped into it relatively <coughs> late when we knew she finally said, I can't go. So all of this was worked out. I would point out what the defense has had all of these for at least a year and a half. And so what again, we'll do though. Again, 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 I've been on you to narrow the, the list and to be specific, and you haven't done that. And if, I, if it looks like I'm starting to lose patience, that's because I have lost my patience on this issue. I understand. I don't have time, and in, it's unfair for our jury they're the ones that are going to bear the brunt of you're not being prepared. Yes, Your Honor. What do we have to do this morning before the jury comes in in six minutes? I would suggest that we do Debbie Hansen's exhibits, which are... I have no idea who Debbie Hansen's exhibits are because I don't have that on my list. Just give me a number. 001-2030. I missed the first four digits. Tell me again. 101-1001. That's in evidence. All right. And so is 32? Yes. And is 2165A71? That is not in evidence. You need to discuss it. All right. This is 2165A-71. Can we put it up, please? Exhibit 2165A-71. Now, I 
obviously, Judge, we're going to highlight the relevant portion of this. This is the accessing records for Maya Kowalski's Johns Hopkins record on October 8th, 2016. When you say the access log, this is of the medical records? Yes, Your Honor. And this is who was actually viewing the medical records? On the 8th, yes. Judge, he's, he's indicated... One, two... He's in a, indicated a week's worth of this access log that consumes a number of pages like you're seeing on the screen in front of you. It's not explained. This witness, with all due respect to her, Ms. Hansen, is not one who created it or maintains it or who is even familiar with it. And it, it, it's, it's being offered out of context without explanation without, and without foundation. I don't know what he's intending to show with it, but I know two things. Number one, this thing, if you look at it, is about 10 columns of different pieces of information that are within the purview of the information technology department, not the social work department. This lady who who's he's going to use it with has no involvement with creating this, no involvement with, with having any part of it, and, and it, it's very unclear what he intends to do with it. It is clear that there, is, there has been, on multiple occasions, raised through this case an allegation that this access law documents a HIPAA violation. We've had, a, you'll, you'll recall that we had a motion on that, a motion in limine on that. Your Honor asked for a brief from the, from the plaintiff in response to our motion in deferring ruling on it. That brief was never forthcoming and it's never been ruled on. So pending that ruling and pending clarification and a proper foundation, we object to this exhibit. This is, if the court may recall, there were corporate records custodians which were waived. So the corporate records exception to the hearsay rule was waived. Not only that, this is a 80318 admission since it was created. I don't think there's any dispute. Created by Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital. Well, tell me how you're going to use this. I intend to ask her. And, and who are you, know, you asking? Judge, now that I think about it, I'm not going to use this with her. I just want it in evidence so that I can ask her about procedure. From, from, from a 30,000 foot view, I don't have a, a problem with the access log, assuming that it is the access log of who was looking at the medical chart. I don't. I, I, I join your honor in that, in that position. I don't have a problem with the access log, but I got a problem with is this witness in the access log. I don't believe this witness will be able to identify Sally Smith's specific uh, entry. So I do not intend to ask her to try to do that and waste the time of the court or the jury. However, I do not want to draw an objection about facts not in evidence or something else. Because I have the right to tie this together later. But as long as this is in evidence, then I should be able to explore Johns Hopkins procedures. This is the only witness that I've been able to get from Johns Hopkins to testify. And who is this what? witness? Debbie Hansen, the only former employee of Johns Hopkins. Well, Judge, there's going to be strenuous objection over the foundation for her knowledge about some of this stuff. I don't know what counsel intends to ask her about, quote, procedures, unquote, but I do know that her job description doesn't doesn't contain and doesn't involve information or procedures regarding access to medical records. Well, on the issue of what might be an unpled HIPAA violation count, are you going there no. at all in this case? No. Well, we're going to argue it, but I'm not going there until we have a ruling from the court one way or the other. So what I can ask about is patient confidentiality and based on the patient statement of rights, which is that in evidence? That's in evidence. Yes. So I intend to use the patient statement of rights and instructions she received at Johns Hopkins at or around the time about how to maintain patients' privacy as to records. Now that's an admission, party admission. Well, 
I don't have a problem with this document as it, it, as it exists. I, I just I, I just don't. It, uh, Judge, I, again, I don't have a problem with this document per se. I have a problem with excerpts of the document as opposed to the whole document if we're going to go here. But there's no question that we created this that's part of our part of our corporate records. The question's going to be ultimately whether the witness he's trying to put on to do this has any competence to address this. Then why can't we just put in the whole the whole access log? I'm ass I'm assuming 2165A is the entire access log for Maya Kowalski's stay? At 2165A, Your Honor, is a subset of the access log from October 7th to October 14th. So it's relevant to and, and that inc first week. And, and incidentally, Judge, there isn't any question that, 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 that Dr. Smith did, in fact, access um, Maya Kowalski's medical record on or about, I think it was the 8th of October, and, and that can be covered with her, uh, and does it need to be covered with this particular witness who testified her deposition that she would, she had no contact with Dr. Smith on this. So I, I'm, I'm not sure where counsel's going with any of this, but the bottom line is I don't have any problem with the entire access log, but that access log is many multiples of what this is. Okay, so Mr. Whitney is telling me that two two one six five A is for a period of what one week or two weeks? One week, Your Honor. Is there an exhibit that has the entirety of Maya Kowalski's stay? Without looking, two one six five. I can find the joint exhibit list. It, it's at several hundred pages, but I believe two one six five would be that document, Your Honor. And just one moment, then. Why don't we just put in the entirety of the access law? Yes, Your Honor. It's 234 pages, and that's the entirety of it. And it's 2165? Yes, Your Honor. So, Mr. Hunter, instead of putting in A, do you want to just put in 2165? I understand that you don't think that this witness can talk about 2165. I understand. Yes, sir, Your Honor. So, plaintiffs, are, you, are we moving in 2165? We move... Two one six five and two one six five eight. We have that one. Your Honor, we do have two one six five eight. They're all marked as five A. We don't have a claim of two one six five. We haven't submitted. I guess we haven't submitted the entire. We can submit the entire judge at the appropriate time. We just need to print it out. Okay. So we seem to be falling behind on your exhibits. So we still need some flash drives with videos. Your Honor. All the ones that have been uh, admitted last week, we have received. You did receive them this morning? Uh, yes. Okay. So you can bring 2165, the paper version, tomorrow? Yes. Yes, Your Honor, we will. Okay. Right. But you have, you have it electronically, right? Yes. Okay. So the court will receive 2165. Do you want to go back to that one? Okay. It's past 9 o'clock. And uh, uh, 203419, the list of meds found by the detective. It is an objective fact that it does not contain anything, and he can uh, testify to the contents and where it came from to lay a foundation. It is part of the police file, but it contains no narrative. Let's put up 2034, page 19, please. This is it just this one page? Is there a second to this? It says page two. It's a 37 page exhibit, Your Honor. No. Well, Judge, this no. is the medical no, examiner no, no. autopsy hang, hang report. The 2034, the entire report, the court was correct about the refreshing recollection. However, this particular exhibit, 2034 019, we're asking the court to allow this portion of it in because it is an objective statement of fact, it contains no narrative, and it is a, a public record.
Your Honor, we'd object. It's part of the medical examiner's report. I don't know who created the list. That's what this witness is going to testify about. Well, the prescribing physician. Well, Judge, he can refresh his recollection with it, but I don't know why the actual part of the report would come in. Yeah, this. Yeah, he's not part of the med. He's not the medical examiner investigator. He's part of the witness is with the sheriff's office, and this is the medical examiner's report. He prepares all of the data for the medical examiner's reports like this. That's the point. This looks like a summary. No, this is actually, if I can lay the predicate with the witness, I can demonstrate to the court. What witness are you talking about? Detective Sibareski. Did I just murder that? Sibareski. Sibareski. And how are we using this? The relevance, Your Honor. I'm sorry? The relevance. How are we using it? I want to have him identify it, explain how it was compiled, and then comment on the contents of any and all, after a sweep of the house, any and all medications, prescription medications that were found in the house. Relevant and material to the allegations that Beata Kowalski was infusing ketamine to her child at home. And this is after they found everything in the house and everything in her car. But I didn't let the defense test the remaining fluids for the presence of ketamine. I didn't think that by the time they got around to it, my understanding from the detective was that at the time it was taken, there was a request by him to have it tested. And I understood that by the time we got into it and that had been requested, that the results were it was not available, that it was too long, it wouldn't have shown anything. Now, that's just my knowledge of it, and I don't recall the specifics of their motion. Well, my recollection of how we dealt with this issue was the fact of the suicide is not really in contest here. And is the defense going to be contending at trial that somehow, either through intravenous or oral, she gave herself ketamine, she being Beata Kowalski? Judge, the potential did exist as a result of what plaintiffs said in opening about this issue. Your Honor will recall that we attempted to get vitreous fluid tested two years ago, and the objection at that time was that it was irrelevant, and Your Honor sustained that objection. The fact of the matter is that the IV, certain empty syringes that were found on the decedent's body, and the saline bag, as well as its tubing that were in the autopsy pictures, were not preserved, and they were not tested. The vitreous fluid is still in the medical examiner's locker, and it was not tested. There have been, as I told Your Honor, two witnesses who have said that there was dosing of ketamine going on at home through the port, and the evidence will be, if it needs to be, that there is a dose of IV ketamine that was filled, a prescription for IV ketamine that was filled while Maya Kowalski was in the hospital and not able to have it administered at home, that to this day remains unaccounted for. So that's the universe of proof here, and I'm not sure, I mean, it either needs to be irrelevant or relevant, and, you know, we keep going back and forth. Here's my thought process. The biggest issue in my mind was 
what the defense was going to try to do is make an inferential leap that somehow Beata Kowalski was uh, administering ketamine to um, Maya at home. And if Beata Kowalski had ketamine and administered ketamine to herself as part of the suicide, how that she still committed suicide. She still died by suicide. And so I don't see why the ketamine issue for Beata Kowalski is, is an issue, nor, nor do I really see all these other uh, medicines. Why, why is that? Because there is an allegation in this case of Munchausen by proxy, which has not been abandoned by the defense. The key to their Munchausen by proxy claim is that they were, Beata was pushing a lot of meds, medical treatment on her daughter. This demonstrates, including the fact that there was a prescription two years old for 15 hydrocodone and 13 still left. There's a prescription of Xanax, 30 and 30, all of them left. This demonstrates that there was absolutely no misuse of any type of prescription drugs in the house. And it goes to our point that Beata Kowalski was a very careful nurse and that she monitored all of this. And the reasonable inference from that is someone like that is not going to violate the orders of a doctor and administer ketamine IV at home, if the court will recall. The, the prescription was for IV ketamine, but on it, the method of delivery was orally. And the testimony is they put it in grape juice or Gatorade so that Maya could take it orally. Inefficient, but in emergencies, that's what they did. And the evidence is undisputed about that. There is absolutely no evidence whatsoever that Beata Kowalski ever injected Maya Kowalski at home. None. But this goes to prove her propensity or whether the, the, in the normal course of their living practice at home, whether they, Beata Kowalski, Jack Kowalski, maintained care and control of their prescription drugs. And a reasonable inference could be from the jury that this kind of person is not likely to do anything like that. Well, how is the detective going to, off, you know, deal with this record? He is going to say, we swept the house, we swept the car, we were looking for any indications with the IV bag and, the, and all that. We were looking for any indications of whether Beata Kowalski had uh, uh, given herself uh, medication or whether there were any indications of unprescribed medicines, medications around the house. It was the typical thing that they do. It's their usual procedure, especially in a suicide, because they find pills, the means of suicide. Here it was fairly obvious, but again, people were wondering, and, I, and I'm concerned about the jury speculating about what Beata Kowalski may or may not have given herself at the time. There is no evidence whatsoever from the autopsy or any direct evidence anywhere that Beata Kowalski injected herself with ketamine or anything else. The speculation might be that she gave herself something to knock her out so it wouldn't be quite such a, uh, and it's not speculation, it's a regional inference, that she gave herself something that would make it easier to go through what she was about to go through. Anything further, Mr. Hunter? No, sir. It, Mr. Anderson has convinced me that there is some relevance to this document to rebut a theory of Munchausen syndrome by proxy. Now, as far as its use by this witness, is he going to testify that they that that he or she went around and pulled all these? Uh, pill bottles. I mean, there's a lot of information on here that looks like a summary. I believe his testimony, I haven't spoken to him about it, is that either he or someone at his direction, there was, there was another police officer there. I don't know that he swept the entire house himself, but someone under his direction and control swept it. There, were, there was a representative of the medical examiner, there was a, another uh, police officer there, and 
I, I wouldn't t testify to say that this is so much a summary, Judge. This is an actual, accurate portrayal. What I can't tell you is that whether he personally counted out every pill, but he they, it was all done under his investigation and control. And it's only this one page? Just this one page. I'm going to go ahead and, and admit in page 19 of Exhibit 2034. Is there anything that we have to do? Because we're no. now 16 minutes beyond the time that. Not in our view, Your Honor. From the defense. Yeah, Your Honor. I, I've got all this stuff in my mind. I need to get it out as soon as possible. Hopefully, maybe towards the, towards the lunch break. Yeah. I, 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 I really. <laughs> Well, I mean, I've got it all here, got it all flagged and highlighted, so let's bring in the jury. Hey, please be seated, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Did you have a good weekend? Yes. Glad to hear that. I want to confirm while you were away, you did not discuss this case amongst yourselves. You did no investigation. You received no information. Is that correct? Yes. Since the last time you were with us, has anyone approached you about this case? Uh, since you were last with us, have you seen any media coverage about this case? No. Okay, thank you. Mr. Anderson, call your next witness, please. Thanks for the attention, Your Honor. Uh, plaintiff's call, <coughs> detective, Yarek uh, Solbirik. Solbirik? Solbirik. I do. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Good morning. Please state your name for the record. Yarek Shalrek. Let me make sure. Sol. Sol. B. Rek. B. Rek. Can you spell that for us real quick? Yes. The first name is J-A-R-E-K. Last name is S-Z-A-L-B, as in boy, I-R-A-K. Thank you, sir. Uh, now, sir, are you being called here as the investigating detective at the Sarasota County Sheriff's Department for the suicide of Beata Kowalski? Yes. And can you tell us uh, our... Are you still with the Sarasota County Sheriff's Department? I retired from the Sheriff's Office. And approximately when? Uh, March of 2020. And uh, at the current time, uh, you work for the Department of Defense, is that right? Or a I government agency? I work for the federal government, yes. work for the federal government. Um, and so I want to uh, take you through a little bit of your background and training in terms of your job as a detective. 
that you brought with you into this investigation. Uh, first, tell the jury how you started uh, with this. Was this through college or a school or what? So um, I started in 1994. Uh, I went to the academy, and um, I worked in. I started out working in the jail, then went to patrol, and then to detectives. Last 16 years of my career was as a detective. And, and what year did you finish the academy then? Uh, there were two different academies. So one was in 1994, and the other one, I want to say it was like 98, maybe. I don't recall. Okay, and since that time, have you had that, in between now and then, have you had the opportunity to attend any continuing education? I'm not sure what it's called, the law enforcement business, but... Yes, it's continuing education. So uh, constantly, especially as a detective, we're constantly sent to different schools uh, to um, and, improve our skills. And uh, have you attended uh, a and I'm not sure how, how it's called, a uh, training for um, it was um, either at Suncoast Septical College training for police officers was where the first round was? Yes. Okay. And did you then go back to another series of seminars that dealt with witness investigation and interrogation? Yes. And what was that called? Uh, I, I attended numerous uh, schools. Uh, the latest one that I attended was National Center for Credibility Assessment. And where is that? That's in uh, Columbia, South Carolina. And how long is that? Approximately four months. And at the, once you attended that, did, did it reinforce many of the techniques and uh, knowledge that you'd gained previous to that? Yes. <clears throat> So what, are your, what were your duties and responsibilities as of uh, uh, January 7th of 2017? Okay. So um, I was uh, a detective in criminal investigation section for the South District of Sarasota County. Okay, and what did that involve? Uh, basically uh, investigating any major crimes uh, to include any death investigations. And you, were you a resident of Sarasota County at that time? Yes. So are you still? Yes. Uh, how long have you lived in Sarasota County? Um, nine, since 1990. All right. Now, um, I understand that as part of your duties as a detective, you investigate uh, deaths. Yes. And approximately, tell the jury approximately how many deaths during over the course of your career in Sarasota County that you investigated. Um, I approximate about 500 scenes that I responded to death scenes. And out of that 500, can you give the jury an idea of how many were involved a suicide as opposed to uh, some form of other violence? Uh, I would estimate that most of them were suicides, so probably north of 90%. And. So before we get into the specifics here, when you're investigating suicide, I gather you did this all the time, um, what were you looking for upon arrival at the scene? Okay. So when we respond to any death scene, um, the reason why we're there, a detective is there is to make sure there's no, make sure that there is or there is no crime. So we always walk into it, or at least I always walked into it seeing, okay, is this a homicide? Um, and then looking for clues to prove or disprove whether it was or not. And so on this day, would it, for uh, benefit, your benefit, um, was a report prepared in connection with his suicide? Yes. Would it refresh your recollection to be able to refer to that report? Yes. Do you have it there in your possession? I do. Judge, do you need me to broadcast over here as well or just go with that? So long as they know what he has. I need to. Mr. Hunter, do you want to look at his report? Or 2032 or 2034? It is, uh, it goes from 92000 on base numbers 00092 up to. Maybe a book to look at it, though. Sure. 128. If you could show Mr. Hughes what you're looking at.
You may continue, Mr. Anderson. Thank you, John. All right, approximately uh, what time did, and when did you arrive on the scene? If I may refer to my notes, please. Turn to that page. So January 8th, 2017, 8.50 hours, so 8.50, just 10 minutes before 9 a.m. And what was the first thing you do when you arrived there? Well, usually the first thing that I do is when I prepare for uh, responding to a scene as I'm getting ready, get that call, I always ask for the 911 call. So uh, you, you listen to it on the way there. Uh, once I arrive at the scene, I'm always briefed by a patrol deputy who's responded there. At that time was uh, Deputy uh, Leo Egan, who was personally known to me because uh, he's worked with me as a detective in Had you uh, worked with uh, uh, this uh, officer before? Had you worked with this yes, officer before? Yes, he was a detective in the same uh, section that I was in for a number of years. And can we p please publish, with the court's permission, 2031-003 uh, in evidence? Is it, which, which number is this? Okay. Yeah, sure. Isn't the police tape photo in evidence? There's one of them. Tell me the number again. 2031-003. I don't think that one's in evidence. Can we just show the witness? I'll have him identify it, and then I'll move it in. Can we have the number again? I'm sorry. Two zero three one dash zero zero three. Two zero three one are the photographs, Your Honor. It. Never mind. So, is a yellow tape put up around the house uh, to secure it? Yes. And what other steps are taken to ensure that nothing comes in or goes out, other oh. than the officers? Right, so there's uh, usually at least one, uh, in this case I remember there were two deputies, uh, they hold the scene until uh, crime investigations arrives, and um, if anyone's in the house, they usually stay with the person in the house and make sure there's nothing disturbed uh, with the scene. And what do you do in terms of the contents of the house? So. Um, Whenever we respond to a death investigation, uh, we go, I go through the whole house and uh, just look at the totality of uh, anything suspicious, anything disturbed, meaning is there any evidence of struggle, any fights, uh, any evidence of a crime being committed. Uh, the other thing that we always, I always look for is any drugs, medications, uh, anything that would be illegal in itself. And did you find any evidence of an altercation, overturned furniture, anything like that? No. And then did you also uh, sweep the house to determine, like, like you said, uh, not only the med medical cabinets but in other areas where there were any prescription or non-prescription drugs? Right. So um, because people store their prescription medication in different places, um, whether it's the bedroom or their kitchen or sometimes their bathroom. Uh, I go through everything looking for, again, any evidence uh, of uh, any medications. And there's two reasons for that. One is I want to know if they had taken anything. Second is I collect any medications because it goes to the medical examiner's office with the victim. And would that include the victim's automobile, the Prius? No. So would the medical examiner then perform that task of inventorying the Prius? Object. Also speculation. If you know. Can you repeat that? Can you can you repeat? Yeah. Going through the car itself to find out if there's anything in it of right. interest. So I went through the car okay. and there was nothing of interest or anything that medical examiner needed to have. Okay. And uh what refresh your recollection are though you might have it. Uh, here, a uh, list of the medications found by you? Yes. Uh, can we publish 2034-0019? Uh, yes, you may. All right. Now, if you could, it's a little hard for me to see, so I'm going to bend down. Uh, so this tells you the date it was filled, uh, the 
amount issued and the amount uh, remaining. And of these uh, going down, uh, to the best of your knowledge, the first ones, uh, the noratriptyline hydrochloride, the silipram, the levothyrosine, and the, uh, however you pronounce that next one, are the, those narcotic drugs you would be concerned about? No. Then zolpidin uh, tartrate, is that Xanax? The next one? Um, oh, no, no. Is, is, are you familiar with that as a sleeping aid, sorry, Ambien? Yes, and that is not a scheduled narcotic. Okay. Mr. Ashton, I need to cycle the TV again. Hold on a second. Is that Ambien? Yes. And so how many did you find? Or issued? Um, oh, excuse me, how many were issued first? I'm trying to put my eyes on it. And I it's uh, one, see. two, three, four, five. Uh, so I believe it's five now. This is all beginning. Yes, so um, it looks like there were 30, 20, 30 issued and five remaining. And if I may, please, so I have to count every bottle, how many, how many pills are in there, and record that. I see. So you went through the bottles to see? Every one of them. Every one of them. All right. And so it shows one tab at bedtime. Based on your review there, did it appear that these were being taken according to the prescription? Sustained. What date uh, were, was this prescription filled? Uh, it looks like it was filled on October 10th, 2016. And how many months prior to this was the uh, was it filled from the uh, date you inspected it? Approximately three months. And there were 30 issued for three months? Correct. Next going down, uh, if you recognize it as a controlled controlled substance, let me know. But then there's alprazolam. Uh, do you recognize that as Xanax? Yes, uh, that's Xanax, uh, and it's in the group of benzodiapine. And uh, are, are you familiar? Is it a scheduled drug? Yes. And it, when was it filled? Filmed? Filled. Let me put my eyes on it. I apologize. January 21, 2016, I think. I see it. I got it. Um, so November 21st, 2016. All right. And so this was, again, approximately two months, a month and a half before the, uh, the death? Yes. And how many were issued and how many were remaining? Um, so issued on the bottle said 60, and there were 60 in there. And so then if you move down, unless you recognize any of those as controlled, uh, and oxycodone, and it was in the interest of time, uh, issued on November 21st, 2014. So that would have been how long? A little less than two years before? Yes. And how many were issued in 2014? So there were 15, and I counted 13 in the bottle. Did that indicate to you that over the course of the preceding year and three quarter, only two had been used? Yes. Let me ask you, from your training experience and, and investigating 500 suicides, uh, if there is a, if, if you find, strike it, what are you looking for if you, there is a belief or suggestion that there's been any uh, involvement of uh, overuse of prescription narcotics um, or misuse of prescription narcotics? So somebody who's dependent, 
overall, you can answer. Somebody who's dependent on drugs usually doesn't keep them, hold on to them. They use them, uh, and that would be true of any um, opiates. And uh, what I've found in the past is not only will you find empty bottles that were recently filled, but also prescriptions that were multiple prescriptions that were filled up at the same time by multiple doctors, doctor shopping. And did you find that in this instance? No. So then, uh, through the course of this, did you find any uh, cell phones? I did. Uh, can we show 2031 uh, I, I thought it was 007, but I want the phone. 11? One, one? Yes, with a note on it. 2011. So 2031 0011? Yes, sir. No. Uh oh, hang on. That's 2031 0011. Or 011. So 2031 0011. That is an evidence, so yes, you may publish this. Maybe publish this. So tell the jury what you found here and, uh, and where you found it. So um, this phone. I believe it was in the laundry area just preceding uh, entering the garage. And uh, it was a phone uh, with a pink case. And during the investigations, I learned that was a phone that Beata was using. So then uh, you continued on. And uh, can you describe then the scene of the suicide? Yes. So. Uh, I entered the garage and um, the victim was suspended by some belts from the structure of the, uh, of the garage door, so the, uh, the rail. And I believe we have a photo of that from behind, and that is? Two zero. What is it? Okay. Well. Zero one nine. That's what? Zero one nine. Zero one nine, Your Honor. May we Is this uh, the scene? Yes. And so to describe for the jury uh, what, what you saw there that may be depicted in this photo. So um, I saw the victim. I saw the uh, belt that she used. Um, and there is a ladder in close proximity to her. And then you also see a, uh, a line that is going from a... Um, a, a bag with a solution that goes into her left arm. Okay. Now, um, I want to uh, switch then to a. Uh, did you find a small uh, plastic pan, if you will, that contained some materials a nurse would use? Yes. We have that, and it is. For the record, what is it? Two, three. What? Two, three. All right. It's the same two, three, two, zero, three, one, zero, two, three. May we publish? Yes. Can you take that down for a second? Ms. Reyes, you, you're, you're on it. A, right? Mr. Anderson, I need Mr. Anderson and the attorneys to approach.
All right. Again, let's uh, take the jury through what you saw on this one that's in evidence. Hunt blurred. So tell us what we have here. Um, so this was um, some alcohol pads. There was another syringe and uh, gloves. So what did this indicate to you knowing that she was an infusion nurse? It appears she was a professional and treated, handled uh, those items as a professional would. Even when she was planning to take her own life? Apparently. Yes. All right. Um, and so what was the means of uh, strangulation here? How did she go about it other than just having this around her neck, the belt? And was this a wide belt or a narrow belt? It was a wide belt. Okay. So um, any death scene in Sarasota County is going to fall under the jurisdiction of the medical examiner. So as a detective and investigator, I put all the pieces of the puzzle together and it is the medical examiner who actually renders the cause of death uh, in, in any case. And what did, what did it appear to you from your years in investigating these, how Beata uh, managed to get herself up there and then uh, get any support out from under her? So it appears that um, because of the proximity of that ladder to her, I would assume that uh, she probably used that to step up and uh, use it to uh, create the, the belt in, in which she was going to hang herself with and uh, possibly used, stepped off of that to put the pressure on her neck. And so during this period of time, uh, from your uh, training and experience, uh, is there a range of time it can take for people to strangle? Through the course of your training, have you taken courses in which different forms of suicide <laughs> are explained? Yes. And did any of those courses, and if you can elaborate, you fine, but did any of those courses explain about strangulation death? Yes. And did any of those courses also explain different forms of lack of oxygen, such as drownings and other ways that O2 fails to reach the brain? Yes. And had you, prior to this, investigated a number of suicides by hanging? Yes. Approximately how many? Just a rough guess if we can. I mean, how prevalent I, was that? It, well, it's very prevalent in most of the death scenes we go to, if, if you live in Sarasota County, you know that we don't have that many homicides. So most of the death scenes are going to be your suicides, predominantly, uh, overdoses, accidental. So those are the majority of it. And so in this instance then, um, would you uh, be able to tell from the information you had how long it would be between uh, a few seconds to a few minutes, or would that be in the range? As well as foundation for the medical test. Sustained. How long have you been trained to understand that it takes for brain activity to cease uh, in terms of a suicide situation of strangulation? Relevance per view of the medical test. Sustained. I'll get it in the other one. All right. So. Uh, you saw a, uh, in evidence a phone on the dryer there, and so did the fact that it, strike that, um, did you also listen to the 911 call? I did. And based on, and, and did you have the opportunity to invest, uh, to uh, interview witnesses, including Mr. Kowalski? I did. And 
from the interviews and the 911 call and the physical description, uh, did you were you able to determine what the term re retaliation, if not uh, specifically, but generally referred to? Overrule that one. Good answer. So, in my experience before, in the cases that I work, retaliation usually implied that there was somebody that was causing whatever drove the person to the suicide uh, finally give up and take their life. And uh, I, be, I, I vividly remember one case uh, here in Englewood where uh, a husband and wife, they were having issues, problems, and the husband said, I'm going to show you sir, what... Sir, sir, let, let, let's not talk about other cases. Okay. Thank you. Just from your experience then, uh, what, and, and your training, I mean, what does it, what are you looking for in terms of the motives and uh, thought processes of the victim leading up to the suicide? And is that part of your investigation to try to figure out why this happened as well as, well as how? Yes. So, so after, so the first thing I always do is walk in, look at the scene to see what I have. Once I'm satisfied that there's nothing suspicious, then I will start doing my interviews. And uh, I did interview Jack after walking the scene. And... Did you learn from that interview that there had been a uh, stressful and emotional situation going on with their daughter being kept at a hospital? Yeah, it, over, overruled. Yeah. Yes. So um, any of those um, suicides, me and the loved ones always want to know why. Why did this happen? So I look at that. The first thing that Jack told me uh, was that in October of 2016, they went to all children's with Maya with severe stomach pains. Um, he informed me that the hospital that did not feel that uh, Maya would had any disease, and actually accused his wife of Munchausen by proxy. Um, and as a result of it, she was not allowed to see her for three months. So that was the first thing that he told me, which indicated to me uh, as a father that that was probably causing her a lot of stress. Psych psychological stress? Yes. That we're talking about here. And in, and in your training and investigations of these suicides, uh, have you had the opportunity to speak to or, or interview people who have actually, for lack of a better term, survived suicides, uh, Baker Act people or yes. so forth. So uh, one of the responsibilities that we have as deputies and detectives is uh, placing somebody under Baker Act. And basically what that is is uh, talking to an individual in, uh, when they are attempted a suicide. Sustained as to this, that question. Uh, well, based upon your investigations and research into these causes, um, what have you found to be an overriding rationale among the victims that you have interviewed, the surviving victims that you have interviewed? Jack Carell is a I sustain that one. What, if any, uh, you know what, I'll move on. So, uh, through the course of this, um, did you find in the House any indications at all that Beata or Jack Kowalski or anyone else had been using uh, any drugs of any type in an illegal or uh, unauthorized way? No evidence of that. Now, the jury will be curious about the IV bag. What was on the outside of the IV bag? What was it? Uh, so it was a clear fluid. I'll give you one second, and I will tell you what it said. Sodium chloride. And that's salt water? Yes. All right. And so was this a, did you look at this as a clue or a 
uh, reason in any way for why she took her life, or was this something you looked at more from a, I, I don't know, a practical way, <coughs> explain the significance to you? So Earl, you can answer that one. So she was an infusion nurse, and um, I really don't know why she used the, the injection. I couldn't figure that one out, but it, you know, every, every suicide is unique and unique to that person, so it might have had a meaning to her, but I don't know what that was. And so did you have the contents uh, as much as you had of these different things uh, delivered to the medical examiner? Yes. And you know, did you receive any reports back? I understand as to the uh, injector there that that evidence was not preserved? As opposed to the bag? Yeah, so that goes to the medical examiner's office, and I, and I don't know what uh, Dr. Baggett did with it. And from any, everything you saw and heard, was there any indication of any other cause of death other than hanging, that is, strangulation? Right. So the totality of the investigation went to Dr. Vega. Uh, he did his part, which uh, he made a report, and his conclusion was that uh, they ought to hold All right. And through the course of this, uh, had you had the opportunity to uh, review the backgrounds to determine whether there was any history in the records of uh, child abuse or domestic violence on the Kowalskis. Uh, yeah, there was no indication of uh, law enforcement responding to their house for any domestic violence or anything else. Okay, and so did Beata Kowalski leave suicide notes? She did. And, of course, permission, may I publish 2032-12 and 13, suicide note number one? Yes. I'd like you to take a look at this and uh, tell them what, if any, uh, significance this had to your investigation. All right, so we talked about the why, and Beata wasn't there to tell us this in person. But she certainly left uh, two notes, and this is one of them. So um, as I was looking at this note, I, I, I'm picking out uh, her state of mind, her mind frame. The first thing that says in there, it says, take care of Maya. And she also expresses her love for Kyle. Um, in that note, what I focused on as to her state of mind, um, one of the last sentences, I no longer can take the pain being away from Maya and be, being treated like a criminal. I cannot watch Maya suffer in pain and keep getting worse while my hands are tied by the state of Florida and the judge. It's been three months today of Maya not being home. So that kind of shows what her state of mind is and the pain she was going through. All right, and so in the event of her uh, death and Jack's death, did she say who she gave her parental rights to in the event of both of their passing? I gave yes. my parental rights. Uh, to her sisters and brother in Chicago area, and then and then she wanted the uh, she wanted to be cremated. Correct. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Let's um, and did this further confirm your uh, theory, but but your the results of your investigation as to the why of this. That gives us really good clues. That gives us a really good clue as to what she was going through emotionally. Um, the depression, being in pain, in emotional pain, and no longer can take that pain. Then if you 
uh, if we could, Judge, publish 2032-14 to 15, suicide note number two. Mm -hmm. Let's publish this. All right, and so uh, what was significant here to you, if anything? Okay, so um, my attention came to the the very first sentence where it says, all children in hospital in D.C. Have, have destroyed Maya physically and mentally. Um, she said you let them continue to destroy her even more slowly each day. Maya will never be the one, be who she was before October 13th, 2016. And uh, then she went on to say, by taking the side of uh, all children in hospital in D.C. Have, you have destroyed my family, my marriage, and you have put us into bankruptcy. Um, now, did she give some idea down there, a second from the last, about her history, personal history, that was significant to you? Uh, I grew up in Poland. Uh, yes. So she talked about growing up in Poland and watching the, the communist and socialist um, system being a nightmare referring to taking away people's uh, rights, and uh, she felt that's what she was experiencing here. And after reviewing all of the materials that you looked at in your report and the results of all the investigations, was there any doubt that the cause of death, from your perspective, was a strangulation, suicide by strangulation? From his point of view. Overruled. Right, so from my experience and training, uh, there was, it, it appeared to be what it is, an apparent uh, suicide by hanging. Oh, yes, I missed something. Go to the second page of 015. That's pretty important. Let's go over that. So, let's go down to uh, the I hope. Yes. I should have added oh. that in before. Yes. Yeah. She said, I hope that you will make sure that Dr. Malik at Altrino Hospital, and Sally Smith will lose their medical license and never ever hurt another child again. Very good. And did you say anything else after that in the next paragraph? Um, she said, I hope that, that my family will be able to hug, her, hug and kiss Maya soon since you have denied me the to execute my parental rights towards my child. Thank you. And may we approach for one moment on oh, no, this procedural thing? <laughs>
may continue, Mr. Anderson. Good morning, sir. Good morning. You previously asked about a suicide letter. Yes. Just a moment ago. Do you remember that testimony? Yes. Who was that suicide letter addressed to? Um, which one are you referring to? The last one you were just speaking to, uh, Mr. Anderson, about. That letter was ad uh, addressed to uh, Judge Hayworth. Um, you saw a picture that was identified at 230119 in your testimony. Do you recall looking at that photograph? You're going to have to show it to me again. Sure. Can we please put it up? Yes. Okay. Um, we have it oriented properly. The top right hand corner of this photograph, do you see a uh, empty plastic bag? I do. Did you preserve that empty plastic bag? Yes. Where in your notes does it indicate that you preserved that plastic bag? Everything goes to the medical examiner's office. Are you aware what the medical examiner's testimony in this case was about the receipt of that empty plastic bag? I don't. Would it come as a surprise to you that he indicated he did not Objection. receive the testing? I didn't. I didn't hear something. Uh, it sounds like I'm going to have to sustain that objection. Do you know what the results of the testing were for that empty plastic bag? That would be something that Dr. Vega would be able to testify to. During your, if we look at this picture too, uh, around the knee area, there is an, a syringe which your notes indicate a, had a clear liquid inside. Yes. Did you preserve that syringe? That syringe went to the medical examiner's office. Do you know if it was tested? That's something that Dr. Vega would testify to since it's his responsibility. Anywhere in your report does it indicate what the results of that uh, what the testing was for that syringe with clear liquid. Okay, so as far as Dr. Vega, what he does, my report would reflect that when I received his report, and uh, the last thing that said in my report that I'm going to make it part of this case file once uh, the toxicology is conducted, um, then that report is made part of my case file as a standalone document. So I don't write anything else except for the manner and the cause of death. So as you sit here today, are you able to say what was in the syringe with the clear liquid inside? I cannot tell you that. As you sit here today, are you able to say what was inside the bag in the upper right hand corner of this photograph? I cannot. Okay. In your report, I also saw reference to um, two additional syringes located under Ms. Kowalski's sweatshirt. Do you have any recollection about that? I remembered uh, that they were there, yes. Okay. Do you know what the, what the, did you preserve those two syringes? Again, that would have went to Dr. Vega with uh, the victim. As you sit here today, are you able to tell what the result of the testing, if any, in those two syringes were? Again, that would be something uh, that's Dr. Vega's responsibility who would be able to testify to Do that. you have any knowledge about what Dr. Vega tested or did not test? I, the toxicology report definitely showed what he tested for. Do you know if that toxicology report was testing Ms. Kowalski's bodily fluids or the contents of the syringes and bags? Again, that's something that he would speak to. I wasn't there. I don't, you know, I could look at the report. I could tell you what, what he tested for and the results. Thank you, sir. Anything else, Mr. Hughes? Yeah. Oh, second, Mr. 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 Hughes, yeah. anything else? Mr. Anderson. And so, having been asked on direct examination about that uh, toxicology report, can you tell the jury then what was tested for? Yes, if I may refer to my notes. Give me one second to find that. Okay, 
so I am looking at the medical examiner's report and um, it's titled report of autopsy uh, it enumerates a number of drugs that she was tested for uh, one, two, of, two of the things that stand out to me in looking at the medications that I sent to the medical examiner's office are the ben, benzodiazepine. Can't pronounce it right now. Benzo, the, the alprazolam, the Xanax. So basically, that says there was non detected. The other one that I was looking at is the opioids, which would be the oxycontin, and again, it says non detected. Move to admit. Move to admit what? Medical examiner report, report of autopsy, the summary of autopsy finding well, an let's object. Let's go with exhibit numbers. Say again? Let's go with exhibit numbers. Sorry. 2034-023. Just <coughs> that part of the medical examiner's report contained within his report. No, we reject this on the same basis that we did before the jury came in. Open the door. Sustained. So we should ask Dr. Vega, uh, never mind. So in this toxicology report, were there any indications whatsoever of any narcotics or other drugs that would have caused or contributed to Beata Kowalski's death? No. And as a practical matter, since she ultimately died of strangulation, would it have made any difference? What if any what if any difference in terms of death would the presence or absence of any type of uh, not a narcotic or other drug make in light of what you saw? Same objection. Sustained. Were there any signs of any other cause other than strangulation? Not to me. And again, uh, I would have to defer to Dr. Vega in the same report that you're referring to, the uh, cause of death is hanging, manner of death, suicide. Mr. Hughes. Members of the jury, do any of you have any questions for this witness? I don't see any. Uh, may this witness be excused? You may, Your Honor. He may be excused. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Here you go. Mr. Anderson, is the next witness relatively short, or is it? Uh, I believe this witness will take significantly longer than uh, the last. So this is a good time for a break? It would be a good time for a break. Members of the jury, uh, let's take a morning break. Let's try to keep it to 10 minutes. Uh, do not discuss this case amongst yourselves. Do not do any investigation and receive no information. All rise. Jury is exiting. Thank you. Uh, the jury's out of our presence. Are there any issues we need to address before we go on our break? None by plaintiffs, Your Honor. Okay. Let's take a 10 minute break. All rise.
Please be seated, everyone. I'm sorry? One matter. Earlier today, we handed the court, and of course we prepared and sent over to the defense last night, our, the, the full exhibit list for all of the witnesses today, and we didn't get all the way through it, and when we were discussing it, uh, I wanted to move in some of their policies and procedures. There's, there's a number of them, but I only have one, two, three, four to move in, and I'd like to move in 2252001, which is the risk assessment for potential child absence. Can we pull that up for the court? Hey, this won't take a second, Judge. 2252001. All of these are policies of Johns Hopkins, and I thought they were in the Johns Hopkins records, but apparently they're separate. How many pages is this? 2252? Two. And how are we uh, going to be using this? This witness is a social worker. Who's the witness? Debbie Hansen, Deborah Hansen. She's a social worker, and out of all of the ones that we listed from last night, we really only have one. We have that one. We have 2214001 through 007. Okay, let, let's deal with one at a time. Yes, sir. So 2252. And it's some sort of matrix as to when to make a, an abuse report? Yes, sir. That's Judge, a, this is going to be a recurrent theme with this witness, I'm afraid. This witness was a social worker who made the initial call to DCF uh, on behalf of, uh, at, at Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital. She saw this patient and uh, the family for about two hours on the day of admission. Uh, she's testified that she had a, a, about 10 to 15 minutes contact with Maya Kowalski that day, but most of her involvement with the case was making the first phone call. And this, this child abuse recognition matrix has nothing to do with anything that is left in the case after the rulings that have been made by the court regarding the good faith and reasonableness of the first of the phone calls in general, as well as the Chapter 39 immunity. So I don't see the relevance of 2252. A number of these um, policies and procedures they're trying to move in right now came over yesterday evening after, frankly, after I had looked at the, at the exhibits uh, for today. <clears throat> Uh, I did. I was not aware until, frankly, this morning, that these these additional exhibits were were going to be proffered today. But that one has no relevance. Number one for this witness in particular, but in general, as to the case any longer. Mr. Anderson, it doesn't seem like this goes to anything that's actually in the case. Yeah. Judge, yes, it does, because our case is not predicated upon those two calls. Our case is predicated upon, on the medical malpractice side, about them, the timing of when they made a decision on a diagnosis and whether there really was any type of team or differential diagnosis. Debbie Hansen can testify, and she is in the medical records, two fairly extensive reports that she put in, and she can testify to how the Kowalskis presented when they first came in, because she was there, she was on duty that day when they first came in, whether Beata Kowalski appeared reasonable or whether she appeared to be uh, out of control, as has been portrayed other, elsewhere in the records. She can testify to whether they, they were agreeing to stay or not to stay over the 24 hours, which is one of their big points. She can testify to how uh, Maya ended up in the PICU so quickly 
She can testify thereafter about the steps that needed to be taken, and mostly she can testify to before there was supposed to be any uh, overarching uh, diagnosis, especially any psychological diagnosis, how the social worker has to be involved by their own rules and regulations and how she was told she did not need to be involved in this and she was not going to be involved in this. And so her testimony... So she's not involved, but she made a call to the hotline? It doesn't make yes, any sense. Yes, that's exactly our point. She was directed specifically by Lisa Winton to make a call to the hotline before she completed her uh, uh, social psychological evaluation, which according to their rules is absolutely necessary. Not, and, and leave aside for a second the call, but that's necessary in the evaluation of the patient. So she has very important information to get before the jury about what the practices and procedures were. She had been there since 2009. She had been there at the time Johns Hopkins took over. Well, 2252-001-002, go to nothing that is in this case. Well, so because look at other, other I'm fictitious. I'm going to sustain the objection that document's not coming in. All right. And then the, the, the reality is, you know, the court wrote, I guess about two years ago now on this, maybe a year and a half ago, about as soon as the court made the conclusion that there was, I forget the specific standard, but reasonable cause for the for the um, the call, then Chapter 39 immunity applies. And I know I had some discussion about the good faith and all that, but you know, the, I concluded the existing case law forced me down the road that I went. And so I I understand. May I speak to that? Mm, I. First. I'm confident on that ruling, and so I think we need to move on to the next issue. So 22-14001, this is the mandatory requirement of a social worker being notified and involved in the event that there's any claim of medical child abuse, which there was to start with, morphing into let's money. Let's put 2214 up, please. I'm sorry, this is like rinse, wash, repeat. This is the same sort of thing, Judge. Hang on. Well, again, let, to be fair to me, I, I need to see these exhibits. I, I don't... I understood, Judge. I haven't lived with 10,000 documents or 100,000 documents like you all have for years and years and years. So th this is talking about making an abuse report, right? No, uh, that's... Policy uh, statement 1A. All yes. cases of suspected child abuse must be reported to the Florida Department of Children and Families of Central Abuse Hotline. That is true, Judge, but if you go down under C, social work services must be notified when a report is made or needs to be made to the appropriate agency. Social sur sur work services will assess the patient and family situation, coordinating the reporting process, and facilitate interviews made by the investigative agencies. I am not arguing this for the purposes of challenging. I specifically told the jury in opening we are not challenging those calls. What I am questioning here is the involvement of a social worker to complete the psychosocial analysis before a diagnosis is made because we have the right under the medical malpractice count to challenge those initial diagnoses that were made. Why and can't you have the testimony, but why do you need this document that talks about sexual abuse and all these other things that... Well, Judge, it's a party admission, and here's the big problem. If you recall, we brought up to the defendants and to the court when the entire record of Johns Hopkins was to be put in. We, were want we wanted to put in specific sections, if you recall. The defense objected and wanted the entire record put in. Now, that record is in evidence, and it speaks at length into this entire process. And I do believe I heard the court in, uh, in some of these summary judgment orders and otherwise directing us 
that the underlying facts are one thing, and the underlying facts are game. And the defendants here seem to have been playing along with that and, or agree, agreeing to it because they rejected our overture to just put in the stuff that was relevant material. I believe the court would remember me talking about this, the hearsay contained within, but they didn't. They pushed strenuously for the entire report in. Now it's in. Now all those facts are in front of the jury. Since all those facts are in front of the jury, I should have a chance to uh, analyze them under their own rulings. And that's my big concern here. But your policy statement 1A talks about making reports to the central abuse hotline, which is not an issue in this case. The reporting isn't, but the fact that a, I understand, but the fact that all of that is already in evidence, I should be able to explain it somewhat. Anything else, Mr. Hunter? No, sir. I'm going to sustain the objection. 2214 is not coming in. All right. So the next one uh, simply involves a clinical policy. It is not directed to, uh, I'm so sure there are some areas in here that. I'm sorry. 2209-001 through 008. Can I see the next couple of pages? The next page. Next. Next page. Yeah, two more pages. And then next. Oh, yeah. Judge, this has to do with clinical documentation of patient conditions and diagnoses and treatment, none of which social workers make. There's no foundation for this, for this to be admitted in connection with this witness's testimony. And it's not, it's not been shown to be relevant at any point in any of them. It, it actually is under E8 there, and regardless of which witness it is, since we waived the uh, necessity for a corporate records custodian. I, I see 2209 as being relevant in this case. I mean, how you chart something. I mean, there is a fraudulent billing count here as well. So I do think 2209 is relevant. So... I will admit 2209. Now, whether this witness is speak intelligently about this policy, I don't know, but 2209 will be received. Next is 2237-001-004. Is it one is through four or just one and page four? It's 001 through 004. Yes. This is discharging against medical advice? Yes, sir. Judge, the, the policy is relevant. I don't see the relevance of this witness. It's six. It is. It's six pages. It's six pages as opposed to four? Yes, sir. I, I think the policy on uh, against medical advice is relevant in this case, so I will receive 2237 overrule the relevance <clears throat> objection. Anything else? So, for the record, uh, the flow chart for it's a two two three seven dash zero zero five. Didn't you just? I just admitted two two three seven. Okay, sorry. Then uh, it's already in evidence, but just for the record, so we're clear, we're going to be referring to joint exhibit. 1001-2032 and 
3-0-2-0-3-1. These are notes. I believe they're social worker yeah, notes they from are. the relevant time. They are in evidence. I was just doing something nice for counsel and <laughs> know what I was going to use. We have those notes. Is there anything else that we need to address? I don't believe so, Your Honor. Anything from the defense? I'm, I'm sorry? No, Your Honor. Okay. Let's bring in the jury, please. Yes, sir. <coughs> yeah. Everyone, please be seated. Members of the jury, let me ask you a few questions. I want to confirm that while you were away, you did not discuss this case amongst yourselves. You did no investigation and you received no information. Is that correct? Yes. And since you were last with us, I want to confirm that no one approached you about this case. Is that correct? Yes. And while uh, you were away, I want to confirm that you spent a lot of time watching the media and everything about this case. <laughs> Y'all are paying attention. I appreciate it. So I want to confirm. <laughs> want to confirm that while you were away, you did not uh, see any media coverage about this case. Is that correct? Right, right, right. Fantastic. Mr. Anderson, your next witness, sir. Deborah Deborah Ann Hansen. And have you been asked to testify here because you were a social worker covering the inpatient room on October 7th, 2016? Yes. You remember that day? Yes. And you remember the day all of this started that day? Yes. Before we go into those facts, uh, the jury would like to know a little bit about you. Um, are you, you moved to Florida? Uh, from Houston and when you were what 13 yes and why the move uh, my dad was hired by Bendix to work on the lunar module for the, uh, for the space shot the moon shot being, yes going to the moon did you subsequently go to college University of Florida and what years were you there 71 uh, 75 and what did you study there Psychology and French. <laughs> okay. And following that, did you have an opportunity to travel to uh, Europe or before or after that? Um, after college, I went. I it was seventy-five, so the, there weren't many jobs because of oil. I went to France and was an au pair in Paris. Did you get a chance to travel around uh, Europe uh, as part of that job? Um, on my free time, absolutely. <laughs> and so, uh, let's, uh, before we finish, and I will go into the, the jobs in a moment, but did you ever return to University of Florida to pursue any advanced degrees? Not University of Florida. Where did you go? Florida State University. And what were you pursuing there? Master of Social Work. 
And did you achieve a master's of social work? I did. After that, did you uh, try any additional uh, education towards your profession? Yes. I um, was accepted to the first public interdisciplinary public affairs program, PhD program, at University of Central Florida. And interdisciplinary was health service administration, social work, criminal justice, and public administration. And did you achieve a, a degree from there? I was all but dissertation. I completed all the coursework and the qualitative exams, but I did not complete my dissertation. Was that the equivalent of a PhD, or was it a PhD? It would have been a PhD. And, and it was, you just didn't finish your dissertation? That's, I did not complete my dissertation. All right. And so when you first left, uh, kind of tell us the first job you had that involved uh, social work, whether by that name or otherwise. Um, the first job was actually with a sheltered workshop in Stewart, Florida. Okay. And what did you do there? Um, I was, I can't remember actually. <laughs> yeah, no, I did uh, work <coughs> with the population. They were disabled, mentally disabled, okay. mentally developmentally disabled. You have a very soft voice. So you're going to have to pull that microphone a little closer to you, if not for the jury for me. All right, and so then um, what was your next position? I worked at a residential facility in Titusville, Florida, as the Fran Walker, I forgot the full name, residential treatment facility, for young female adjudicated dependent girls. What were you doing with that? I was um, doing some intervention and with the girls and sometimes um, group work. Were these, any of these girls, had they been abused? Um, I can't recollect exactly, but they would likely have been abused. They were all uh, challenged? They, had they, they were adjudicated dependent. And all right, and what did you do after that? Um, I was hired um, in West Palm Beach as a child uh, with the state of Florida in West Palm Beach as a child abuse case coordinator. Now, is that the predecessor to DCF? That is DCF. That is DCF. And again, what part of DCF did you work for? Um, as a case coordinator, were you like... Yeah, for that, children. Okay. Was that the... Uh, were you part of a particular team, or was this a... So when children are deemed, um, they go to court and are sheltered or uh, placed out of the home for abuse or neglect, then they're placed on a care plan, and I was the case coordinator with a care plan to work with the families. How important are these case plans on either side, that is the parents <coughs> and DCF? If a parent doesn't complete a care plan, we try to work with a parent to help them overcome any barriers to, to following a care plan. But if a parent is unable to follow through outside of the barriers, then um, they may lose the rights to their children, rights are terminated. But if they never sign the care plan, they're not obligated, are they? Thank you, Your Honor. Roll. Was there a strike? I'll come back. Okay, so how long did you do that? Um, I think until 19. Well, I was with the state of Florida, and, oh, sorry, till 83, but I did child abuse as a case coordinator, I think, until 80, and then I was hired as a child abuse investigator. So the first call comes <coughs> in, would go to an investigator who investigates child abuse. So then I was hired for that position. And within a year, I was hired by uh, the Orlando Regional um, District. Again, with DCF? State of Florida, yes. Um, well, I, at that point, it was the Child Protection Team. They were newly formed, the Child right. Protection Team. So I was one of the... And what did you do there? When a child was... Um, there was suspicion of child abuse, the... Um, the state of Florida, they they were investigating, so the investigate 
investigators would bring the children in to the child protection team for medical evaluation. And did you do part of that? I was part of the team that did the medical evaluation. I didn't do the medical, I did the psychosocial. The psychosocial. And tell the jury what psychosocial evaluation is so in psycho- this context. So a psychosocial is looking at social factors, um, cultural factors, and social factors would be an education, employment, history of abuse in the family. Um, sorry, I. It's more the social and the dynamics, family dynamics are all part of trying to understand this dynamic. All right. And again, how long did you do that job? I did that job from 81 to 83. And what did you do after that? I got married. Okay. <laughs> and, then the you, uh, and you had children? I had children. Uh, three of them? Yes, sir. And... How long were you out then, uh, or, or did you then go to the Ph.D. program after that? Um, I started the Ph.D. program in 98. Okay. And were you in it then, what, until 2001, 2002? Um, yes. Mm-hmm. All right. And so then what did you do? I started working at, um, I went back to work as a case, a social worker at Orlando Regional Medical Center. And were you familiar with their policies and procedures while you worked there? Um, not all of them, but... But as they applied to you. <laughs> yes. Uh, all right. And was there anything in particular you did uh, at uh, Orlando Regional? I um, worked with adults I didn't, um, at Orlando Regional. They had a children's hospital, but I wasn't working at that department. So I did adults, and it was... Um, facilitating discharge planning with case managers. So I was under the case management department. All right, is this where you were working as an intermediary between the parents and the, the medical system? Uh, no, I, in Orlando Regional I was working with adults. So I actually was working in the intensive care unit. Your training, is it both as to children and adults? Yes. So then, uh, I understand after that, or as part of that, you sent over, uh, strike that. At that point, uh, did you join All Children's Hospital in a former fashion? Yes, I left Orlando Regional and Orlando to go to the Gulf, <laughs> to be on the beach. Okay. And uh, I moved to Tierra Verde and got a job at All Children's as a grant coordinator to develop a parent-to-parent network for bone marrow transplant and cancer patients. All right, again, you gotta speak up a little bit, but as I think I heard you, these were pediatric uh, oncology patients, kids with cancer? Yes, and undergoing bone marrow transplants. And why is that difficult, the um, bone marrow pra- transplants? Uh, bone marrow transplants are painful as they're treatment for cancer, and also there's always the risk of death. Is it difficult for the parents? <laughs> Sorry. Absolutely. Okay. And before we go any farther into Johns Hopkins, uh, all children's, where do you work now? I work at a boarding school up in New Hampshire as a psychotherapist. And where a is counselor. That? Sorry, it's my title as a counselor. And where is that? Concord, New Hampshire. And how long have you been there? A year. So this first job was setting up a network of parents, or was it a one-to-one parent system? Uh, It's a mentoring, a parent who had been through the experience of bone marrow transplant or childhood cancer. I would match those parents with a parent coming into the program. Uh, with a newly diagnosis or um, undergoing bone marrow. And we're undergoing bone marrow transplant. I understand. Uh, when did you get your f- license first as a, first, are social workers licensed? Not all. Are they, li- are hospital, uh, are medical social workers licensed? Not necessarily. What licenses are there for them? Um, in Florida, it's a licensed clinical social worker. For what? For, so- for Florida. Okay, for Florida. Um, and what are they in Florida? Licensed clinical social worker is the license. And when were you 
2015, I believe. Okay. I completed all them. All right. I took my time. Okay. All right. So um, <laughs> tell us about then after the uh, parent mentoring, uh, the bone marrow transplant program. Um, what did you do after that? Um, so the, it was a one-year grant, and as I was completing the grant, I was asked to take the position as pediatric oncology social worker on, at All Children's Hospital. I declined. Um, I didn't need to work, and I traveled. Okay. And did there come a time that you came back to Johns Hopkins? Yes, um, 2009. And at that point, was it still All Children's? Yes. And what was your position there? They offered me, I was, um, they said, would you like this job, the pediatric oncology social worker position. I took it at that point in time. The person who had taken the position in 2007 left in 2009. And so what were your duties and responsibilities? Let's take it forward to uh, October of 2016. Um, but generally, what were your duties and responsibilities? Strike it. Did you stay in that role up yes. to 2016? All right. And explain a little bit about that, what that role at Johns Hopkins All Children's at that time entailed. So the role is psychosocial support for children and families under experiencing childhood cancer. And most parents, when they hear their child has cancer, it just immediately there's, is my child going to die? So. I sit, I spend a great deal of time working out whatever their barriers to care are, access to care, um, providing support for the families, some working with families about grief in that area, anticipatory grief or actual loss of a child. So are you that, were you then a, like a patient advocate or was it a different job? Well, I would certainly advocate on behalf of the parent and families and represent their voices in, in the meta, sorry, the multidisciplinary team. Psychosocial care and cancer care is, is a very important role. And again, you're, do, as part of your job, would you explain how the hospital system, the medical world works? Uh, sometimes, yes. <laughs> it's a very complex now, as part of these jobs over this time, did you have the opportunity to meet people of all different nationalities, cultures, types? I got to meet people from different countries, <coughs> different cultural backgrounds. Okay. And uh, Latino? Latino, yes. Uh, black? Yes. Indian? Yes. And a few Asian folks? I'm not... I can't remember, honestly, Asian, Indian, but I can't remember Asian, sorry. Okay. Eastern Europeans? Yes. Right. Okay. And so, um, had you had any experience pr prior to uh, the wall falling in 88? 91. 91, excuse me, um, with uh, any parents from Eastern Europe? I'm not sure. I, it would have, have been, been rare, but... Before 91? Before the... Yes. So, before. the, like, at any time in my career, would I have worked with families who lived under the Eastern Bloc? Correct. Yes. On more than one occasion? Yes. On more than one occasion before you met the Kowalskis? Um... At least once a month. All right. But did you make it a point then to understand different cultures, different needs? I always try to understand. After living in Europe, I always wanted to understand other cultures. I spent a month in Greece, and it was like a third world. And it was well, can you tell the, the jury why in this position of explaining to... Um, for instance, doctors' symptoms or how the hospital operates, understanding a culture might help. Um, it goes to she can answer. Could you repeat the question, please? Sure. Why is it important to understand 
different cultures in your role as a social worker in every place, but particularly at Johns Hopkins? It's important to understand culture, uh, families' culture, because that can impact the way they understand it, um, the symptoms, what the symptoms mean, what the cause of the symptom is, how you would treat a sim those symptoms, um, the stigmas attached to different parts of the medical system. I can give an example if you'd like. Sure. I think uh, you, you had informed uh, before about a, uh, uh, was it Somali, African, and, and explain why that might be relevant. So Somali families, uh, in my... This is simply a predicate to demonstrate an example of other, Sustained. how you do their job. Sustained as to this specific one. Is it, uh, I understand. And then in general, did you come across cultures where certain ideas, concepts, uh, such as even depression, were unknown? Or, or, um, or not? Families would understand what sadness, they knew sadness, but they didn't know it as depression. And that was part of your job? Yes. Okay. And they would treat it a lot differently than we would here in the United States. Or there was stigma attached to Okay. Now, um, at Johns Hopkins, did you work on the oncology floor? Yes. Usually? And was that a different floor than the pediatric intensive care unit? Yes. Uh, was it floor above or below? Or? Below. I was on the seventh floor. In the did social workers rotate? Did they go from floor to floor with a patient, or did they stay on the floor uh, for whatever specialty it was? I would stay on the oncology floor, and if a patient from the oncology floor would go to the PICU, ICU, which was did happen, um, I would not continue my work as a social worker. I would go up and support the family, but it was then on the social worker on that floor that would follow the family. To integrate or hand off, is that right? Yes. Okay. But generally speaking, would the social workers, was a policy for the social workers to stay on their floors uh, that they were assigned to? Yes. All right, so now um, I wanted to go through, if we could, a little bit about the patient and family rights and responsibilities. Uh, for the record, 1082-0002 in evidence and through 00, uh, I think just two pages, no, 0003. Um, if we could pull up the page after, that would be the third page. Are you familiar with these? Yes. And yes. did you have to consider these throughout the time you were interacting with different families? Yes. Patients? Could we have uh, 1082-0003 up for the jury. Okay. Um, I wanted to go through some of them, but it says there, uh, to expect privacy and respect while you receive your medical care. What does that include? Does that include chaperoning? Does that include what? Well, the role as the foundation, Your Honor. It, it's predicate for what's coming. Overruled. Okay. Um, so privacy and respect, well, from a social worker standpoint, <laughs> um, the privacy respect is you always um, respect the dignity of a human being. Mm -hmm. That's important, and privacy is uh, related. I with HIPAA. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then uh, was it important then to be able to refuse treatment? If you look down to the next from the bottom there, we could. So your question again? Did you educate the parents, or I guess children at some time, that they had the right to refuse care other than as written by law? Um, I didn't do the education of the rights with the families. They were handed the um, Bill of Rights and Responsibilities once they were admitted into the hospital. That was typically the, I think it's a hospital representative. who okay. was part of the admission process. So by the time they got to you, this had been gone over? I don't know to what extent um, the rights and responsibilities. They received it? 
They would have received it, yes. All right. And then it says to be given complete information and advice on financial resource. No, I'll skip that one. I'm sorry. It's a different one. I just skipped it. Well, it's part of what comes to her. All right. And then uh, I don't want to, the jury will have this uh, back there, but I wanted to point to you to the um, far right column top bullet point, to talk with another doctor or specialist at your own request or expense, or to ask for a transfer to another health care provider, providing it is medically acceptable and the other provider will accept your transfer. Is that right? That's what it says, yes. Okay. That's their right. All right. And from time to time, did you have parents who wanted second opinions? Yes. <laughs> Was that unusual for a parent to want a second opinion? Uh, no. And did the parents have the right to reject what the hospital was saying was the right uh, treatment for something? Objections calls for a legal conclusion. Sustained. What, if anything, were you instructed in terms of a parent's right to accept or reject a treatment? Same objection, Your Honor. Like He's going to overrule that one. Will you ask the question again, please? From your training, what were you told or, or trained about a parent's ability and right to reject a suggested treatment from Johns Hopkins? A parent has the right to refuse treatment. They, and they have the right to leave against medical advice if they so choose. There are consequences. But. Right. And then I had one more I wanted to go after. It's the uh, middle one, the third from the bottom, to practice your cultural values and believe so long as they do not interfere with the well-being of others and are within the limits of hospital policy and the law. Object to leading as well as critic. Well, what's the specific question? Specific question is, as part of your training and as exemplified here, were patients allowed uh, to practice their cultural and spiritual beliefs, religion, for lack of a better term? Overruled uh, the objection. Um, as long as it didn't interfere <laughs> with care. But okay. they were. But having said that, it's important to respect those beliefs and values. But they're allowed to practice their religion on the, in the hospital, are they not? Leading your own. What if any? So, for example, if uh, some cultures want to uh, use sage to clear, clear the negative energy in a room, that would not be acceptable because it's fire and you don't have fire in the hospital. So, for example, that what would not be <laughs> permitted. What about being able to practice the Christian faith? In the hospital. There was a chapel, which was open to all faiths in the hospital. And was the hospital required to, from your training, allow patients to practice their religion, if it was Christianity or Roman Catholics? Check the relevance, conclusion, and credit. Overruled as to all bases. Um, absolutely. If there were some Muslim families that brought their prayer. What are you talking about? Blankets to the hospital rooms and were able to practice their religion. And we were very considerate of their um, beliefs. And also, we, if it was only a female in the room, a male could not enter that room without a female present. Okay. Now, I'd like to go over then, before we talk about what happened that specific day, a couple of the clinical policies that involve you. And if we could put up 2209-001 through uh, 008, and uh, I'm looking at here. Well, first, tell us what this is once it comes up here. A clinical documentation policy. And what does this involve? Documentation in the medical record. 
And then look at uh, number eight there under E, second page, E8. Uh, E8? Yeah. Or uh, A. I'm sorry. A. No, sorry. It's E on the second page, and you go down to 8, number 8. Yes. All right. Multidisciplinary notes by other clinical disciplines involved in patient care will be documented in the medical record as appropriate. Now from your training, and we don't need to go through this whole thing, but was the purpose here to ensure that all important facts were supposed to be put down in the medical records? Jack, to your honor, she, she's being asked to speculate about the purpose of the policy. She has no predicate for having it created. Sustained. Do you have, did you work within this clinical policy guideline during the time you were there? Yes. And were you trained on how it was supposed to operate? Yes. And through the course of your uh, times there, uh, if needed, was it available for you to review? Um, was what available for me to review? <laughs> Sorry. The clinical policy, or would you have to go look for that? <clears throat> Not have to go look for that. Okay. Now. Or talk to my supervisor. Uh, the, the question would be from the way you were trained in looking at this clinical documentation here, was it required that the different multidisciplinary roles put down the important facts about a patient's care? Yes. And in that process, tell us how you fit in. Um, I'm a social worker. Uh, so I would put in notes relevant to my role on mm -hmm. the multidisciplinary team that affected the patient's care or impacted or disclosed. Okay. Or <laughs> I got it. Okay. And um, this is the minimum. If you look under the first page, which is 2209-001, and that is uh, 1A, it says this is describes the minimum clinical do documentation standards for all patients receiving care throughout and within the all children's health system. Is that right? Check deleting uh, what does that require, the policy statement at 1A? calls for concluding, Your Honor. Her role, she can answer. Um, What's only the minimum? I mean, you have to have this information, and what you add to it is there could be additional information you could add, but there's a baseline you have to have in the medical record. All right, let's look then at uh, what's in evidence as 2237 001 through 004, the discharge of patients against medical advice, AMA. Do you have that in front of you? Yes, sir. All right. Um, now, usually, if a parent was, I mean, what is AMA first so that they Against understand? Against medical advice. So that means the hospital says you stay and, and you make a decision to go. Uh, the hospital would recommend you stay and um, to complete the treatment. If you don't stay, I mean, you have the right to leave if you don't want. All right. To, okay. And it's divided up there. Um, Usually, uh, a parent, if a parent wanted to leave AMA, who was making the initial decision based on the team's input? Objection. Would it be a nurse, a doctor, a social worker? Objection calls for conclusion. No predicates. Sustained. In your experience, working within the team there, who usually would make the decision about uh, a patient leaving AMA? Stand. Now, there are two sections there I see, adult leaving AMA and minor leaving AMA, there on the first page. And I'll turn your attention to uh, the minor leaving AMA. All right, 
Um, so it says under A there that essentially the uh, hospital will discourage, discourage the discharge of patients against medical advice because the risk of adverse med patient outcomes. Is that right? That's what it says, yes. Okay. All right. And then if uh, you look under A there on the next page, it would be 5A. And so if a patient wanted to leave, they are, were they offered assistance to complete discharge plans to make sure the discharge was handled appropriately? Attempts would definitely be made. And this was regardless if it was AMA or not? Form, pleading your own. Sustained. Was this true if a patient decided to leave AMA as well as with not AMA? Same objection. Overruled that one. Um, the hospital staff would assist the family in discharge, provide the resources they needed, and would attempt to do the same with families who are leaving AMA, as I understood. All right. Um, I did not participate in the AMA process. Okay. And then it says under 7 there, A, if you go down to 6 and 7, it says a refusal to sign an AMA from certificate of discharge uh, had to be within the records? Uh, that's my own. Testified she's not part of this process. Sustained. Refusal to discharge uh, instructions. Never mind. We'll go on. Okay. And at the end it says this policy applies to all children's. And let's go to the last page here. And this is, uh, can tell us, is this a flow chart about uh, an adult leaving? Actually, it should be a uh, child leaving, but we can use this one. Okay. This is on 2237-004. Excuse me, Honor. Once again, the witness has testified she's not part of this process. Sustained. This is in evidence, Judge. Can she simply follow through with the jury what the process is? This isn't the witness to do this with. Are you familiar with this uh, procedure for uh, Patients leaving AMA. Yes. And did you have patients leaving AMA through the course of your time at Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital? I had families who were discussing AMA, yes. And did you advise, based in part on this particular guideline, uh, the procedures for leaving AMA? I didn't discuss that I recall the procedures of leaving for AMA, but I would sit with the family to understand where they were, their perspective and reasoning for leaving AMA. Understood. Okay. Um, again, may I inquire, Your Honor, on the uh, trial exhibit 2237-004? About an adult leaving AMA? It should be a, ch a child, and there's, I just got the, Number mixed up. Hang on. Judge, the witness has testified that a lack of predicate here. The policy does, in fact, speak for itself. I tend to agree with Mr. Hunter. All right. So take us through the process as you know it for a child leaving AMA. As she knows. She's indicated she wasn't part of the process. This is for her perspective, Your Honor. She can talk to us about what she understood and her observations. Very good. Let's stop asking her questions about the AMA policy. I get you. Okay. Describe that. I'm not policy, but just procedures is what I'm going to ask. Policy, procedures, whatever you want to call it. All right. So let's turn to the day in question. And these are in evidence. So as uh, turning to 1001. It's 3-2, 2-0-3-2, 0-0-1-2, 0-3-2. Okay, is this your social worker note? Yes, it is. Okay, and did you prepare it? Yes, I did. All right, I'd like you to take us through with this, refreshing your recollection, if you need it, um, a little bit about what you found out and did at this time. And can you tell, tell us what time this was first? Um, 
I wrote my note at 2.23. Okay. What time did you arrive there that day? I, one Project. o'clock uh, huh. between, uh, yeah. In the afternoon? Yes. Were the Kowalskis already there? Yes, they were in the room. All right. And so can you take us through then what was going on under reasons for consult referral? What did Maya come in with from what you saw? Um, so the reason for this note is when a patient arrives on an inpatient unit, depending upon the acuity of the case, that could be a factor, social work is asked to do an initial um, screening. Right. And what is your role in that screening? Um, part of the role is to understand what's going on and um, get a, understand the parents or the child's point of view, psychosocial assessment. All right. And what is a psychosocial assessment? Psychosocial assessment is assessment to look at the social dynamics, barriers to care, um, cultural dynamics, family history, employment, school. Telling you, uh, getting the big picture about it. The holistic, try to get that. Social work looks at, at a person in the environment. So we're looking at a lot of factors that impact family or person dynamics. And does it say here that uh, Maya was being treated with steroids for bronchial spasms? Uh, that's, yes, my note does state that. All right. And then it says uh, mother perceives extensive use of steroids resulted in RSD, which now affects the patient's entire body. Is that right? This is a predicate question. <laughs> And right? so please repeat the question. Sure. Does it say there that uh, the mother perceived ex extensive use of steroids resulted in RSD, which now affects the patient's entire body? Yes. Mother right. perceived that the use of steroids affected her daughter's right. body. And did she say they already had a treating physician for CRPS? Yes. And is CRPS essentially the newer term for RSD, reflex sympathetic dystrophy? She mentioned about an out. She, uh, Maya was seeing somebody outpatient of, for pain. Now I didn't know those acronyms at the time; those were new to me. Okay, all right. So, but was it made clear that there was an outside physician who was managing the CRPS? Yes. And so, um, there is more filling in, and you're informed about uh, parents travel to Mexico for treatment and are considering uh, traveling again for treatment not approved in the U.S.? Yes. All right. And then um, it says there that uh, parents have definite ideas regarding pain management. Is that right? Yes. So they would have the right to reject the hospital's program under the Bill of Rights there, excuse me, the, yeah, um, if they so chose. Sustained. What if any decision could the parents make if they decided they did not want to follow the pain regimen? I'm sorry, would you ask that question again? Sure. What if any steps could the parents take to not let's ask a better question? Were the parents allowed to reject a medical treatment? Reject, Your Honor. Calls for conclusion. The witness. Sustained. Under the patient's family rights and responsibilities. Was there a section that says that the patient and parents have the right to uh, reject a particular treatment if they so choose? Objection, Your Honor, is misinterpreted. It doesn't quote this as beyond the scope of her expertise, lack of predicate, legal. Sustained. What was your understanding? of what a parent could do in the event that they rejected the proposed treatment? Could they, I don't know, did they have to follow it? Did they not follow it? Parents can seek. Objection, Your Honor, a compound question is still legal. Well, I'm going to allow that question. You can, you can answer. Parents and patients can seek second opinions. 
Okay? And so, now, um, tell us how the Kowalskis presented. When I, as I recollect, walking into the room for initial inpatient screen, mm -hmm. which is part of the process, um, there was tension in the room. There was, parents were distressed. The healthcare team was distressed. So there was tension in the room. Um, my role was from is to support and understand a family. So when I had the opportunity, I observed conversations. But when the health, a member of the healthcare team, a nurse, I think at the time, left the room, I was able to sit down and have a conversation with a family, develop rapport to understand their perspective and under, can start the psychosocial assessment. Right. And I thought our conversation went fine. Did they just, seem in any way, uh, did, they, did, they, did you perceive in any way that they were a threat to the child? Objective to form a conclusion, Your Honor. Overall, she can answer that. I perceived that they were distressed about their child who was, um, they, they I, the, Maya was asleep at the time, but they were very concerned for their daughter. Were they appropriately concerned from what you saw? I worked in pediatric oncology. I saw distressed parents every single day. They reminded me of distressed parents who were worried about their child. Did they seem as though they were acting appropriately for the circumstances given your experience with parents with children uh, having very painful diseases? They were distressed parents, concerned for their child, and yes, that seemed appropriate. All right. How long had they been there by the time you saw them? Do you know? I knew they um, had come in through the emergency center. I don't know when they came in, and, but when they were inpatient, I, was the, I believe I was the first social worker consulted. And did you feel comf comfortable then that these parents could be worked with in order to try to alleviate the central problem? Objection, Your Honor. Could, uh, lack of predicate calls for conclusion. Uh, Madam yes. Court Reporter, can I have that question again, please? Question, and did you feel comfortable then that these parents could be worked with in order to try to alleviate the central problem? Overruled. Uh, she can answer that one. So, I'm sorry, could you repeat the question one more time? Right. In there with the parents, did they appear to you to be the good parents that you could work with towards resolving Maya's issues? As a social worker, I'm trained, and I've had experience to work with distressed parents and develop the rapport, and I didn't see anything that indicated they were not people I could talk with and develop a rapport and ask questions, and I got answers. <laughs> and over that period of time, did you see any indications? That, and how long did you spend with them, four to six hours? Uh, I was in and out, so I don't know a total. I would say a total of two to three hours. Over that period of time, did you see or any? two hours, sorry. Thank you. Over that period of time, did you see any indications of what's known? Do you know what Munchausen by proxy is? Yes. He, all right. And had you had some experience with that before? A minimal, but yes. You understood the definitions? Yes. Did you see any signs or indications of Munchausen by proxy with this family when you went in or over your time? I saw distressed parents very concerned for their daughter. I did not see any indication of Munchausen by proxy. And did you see anything to indicate that the patients were being unreasonable? That is, you could not come up with any solution that they would accept. There, there were times that the, I felt the family would benefit from being de-escalated, if you would. And that's not quite the right term. Sometimes I don't articulate well, so my apologies. But, um, but they calmed. I was in our conversations. They were calm, and um, so I didn't see it persist. Was the de-escalation, from your view, involving the discussions with the physicians? I wasn't clear of what they're just. You know what was. Um, 
the all of the causes of the distress. That was part of what I was trying to understand, what's going on, that they're so distressed. That, right, okay. That could impede collaboration and care. Sure. Now, um, how far along were you with your psychosocial analysis at this point? It wasn't complete. I hadn't done any, I hadn't done a full assessment at all. Did you, um, uh, did you have some of it done? Yes. Okay. And what was your plan in terms of continuing that psychosocial report? Well, um, I, as I recall, there were multiple conversations going on in the room, so it was difficult to continue a psychosocial with other conversations with medical providers at the time. I can't recall exactly when I left the room to go back to my unit, but I was, you know, I'll come back and we'll sit. But there were so many discussions that a psychosocial couldn't really be completed at that time. Understood. Now, let's turn to 1001-232. And this is uh, the social worker note. I believe you completed it, what, uh, 14.23, so it's 2.23 p.m.? That was the first, yes. Where's our second one? All right. This one, uh, yeah, it's 2.032. I believe this is the second note, is it not? Well, actually, if you go back to the first page, there's an addendum because, it, um, as I recall in reading my note, there was a concern that a uh, request for a safety assessment because Maya indicated uh, she wanted to die is what I was, was reported. So you'll note it on the addendum and the previous note I added. Mm -hmm. But I tried to do an assessment, but she was sedated, so there was no way to complete the assessment at that time. All right, and did the parents explain to you the context of that? Later, uh, in my third okay. visit or third note. Tell us about that. So then I was called back to the floor for suspected child neglect, medical neglect. So that t that's another process for risk assessment. Yes. Please, the court. Um, 
So you were still trying to complete your report, is that right? So I'm covering, and right. I have to go back to my unit. I get another call. It, About what time? Let's say there. Later in the afternoon. Okay. And um, this time it was su suspicion of child abuse or neglect. I got it. Okay. And tell us uh, then, did you continue a uh, interview of the patients? Of the family, yes. And it's like a risk assessment as well as, um, you know, a psychosocial. Again, part of the risk assessment is in the, can be in the psychosocial. Or the psychosocial, oh, sorry. And did the family explain the context of Maya saying she wanted to go to heaven? So that's a suicide safety assessment. That's mm -hmm. not a child abuse or neglect assessment. All right. So what's the difference there? So suicide is if a, I work primarily with children, and if but if a, a person is identified as identified or has been identified as having suicidal ideation, you a social worker would be contacted to do a safety assessment. Is this person at risk for committing suicide? Um, and then. Uh, what did you do from there? So my strike it, strike it. so did you pursue in any way some ideas about why Maya would have said this? When I came back, as I as I read my notes, honestly, I, it's hard to remember everything seven years ago. But uh, from my notes, I came back again to the room as there was. a um, a referral for child abuse and child neglect. So at that time, I did ask them about Maya, uh, saying that um, report there were reports that Maya talked about wanting to die. I, I, I'm sorry, I can't remember the exact verbiage. Um, and so, of course, I asked. <laughs> Was it your understanding that Maya Kowalski came in with an original diagnosis of having stomach problems, constipation. That's what I was told. What, if anything, was your understanding about the diagnosis? Sorry, Judge. I correct you. asked a different question, so. <laughs> what, if any, uh, what was your understanding about the diagnosis that the child came in with? Pain. And again, I didn't, these acronyms were new to me. A, um, RSD and CRSD. Uh, P.S., sorry. Okay. And so from your review here, was it apparent to you that the parents were not of a type to ever abuse their child? Objection. Objection. Calls for legal conclusions leave. Sustained. What, is it true you didn't see any signs in there of uh, from the parents that they would be of the type that would over medicate or take advantage of their child in that way. Same objection, judge, and relevance. Sustained. All right. All right. So it says parents have. Uh, we'll continue on with what happened. Tell me what else happened that day. Uh, at that time, when I was um, asked to um, screen for child abuse and neglect, do a risk assessment. Uh, Yes, and what I... Hold on a second. The attorney's approach. Please don't answer.
before. Yeah. Did you have the opportunity to call Eagle's Wings? <clears throat> yes. And what is Eagle's Wings? It's a counseling center that um, the family informed me that Maya uh, had been seek where she sought counseling. So did you follow up on that? I made a call that Friday, uh, part of the assessment, and um, I didn't, no one answered the phone. I don't know if it was because of the hurricane or, you know, just the nature of an organization, but they did call me on Monday. I was no longer covering the case on Monday, and I, when I got the call, I talked briefly. They, had, uh, they affirmed that Amaya had been a client, I believe the family even, and um, so I informed the case manager on PICU that the, the Eagles Wing had called. This is her number, and you may want to follow up. And so uh, the, in, in part of the record, it alleges that the Kowalskis refused psychological evaluation. Did you confirm that Maya was having psychological evaluation already? I, at that phone call, I'm no longer covering the case. I understand. So I pass that over to the, uh, the Kathy Beatty and the case manager. All right. So Kathy Beatty was involved by this time? Uh, I hadn't talked with her by, on Monday. I, she wasn't there when I arrived at the, when I went into the office. Who was the case manager? I believe it was Joyce Shear. And did you explain to Joyce Shear that you had confirmed or that they had called back confirming that the Kowalskis had already had Maya through uh, counseling and psychological help? I informed them that she had been a patient. I didn't, I didn't know the length of time or affirmed that she had. But the fact that she had. So now, to the best of your knowledge, and I don't want to know what you did after it, but to the best of your, your knowledge, had the, the team informed you of any diagnosis, medical diagnosis at this point? All I understood was interference with care. All right. But the, no actual medical diagnosis of what was wrong, whether she had CRPS, didn't have CRPS? Directly, you Overall, you can answer. Um, I, again, in one of my visits with the family, I think it was the first one, they were talking about a CRPS, which was unfamiliar with me, but they were talking, um, the doctor and the family were talking about transferring care to Nemours on the East Coast of mm -hmm. Florida, who either specialized in treatment for CP, CRPS or was familiar with the diagnosis. And so that's the only uh, diagnosis at that time that I was aware of. But you passed all this along to the team member, uh, case manager. Would the case manager be part of the team? Yes. Um, all right. And you passed that information along? Not Friday. I did Later, did you? Uh, she uh, would have known. She She's part of the health care team. She's... Uh, would have been in your notes. And if she would be... Uh, I don't think they are my notes. She would have been... The case manager handles transfers and discharges. All right. So by this point, uh, and what time of the day are we talking about now? Uh, where we're, there's, uh, with what conversation or what activity? Not on Monday, but the last. Uh, on Friday? Yes. And so there were many activities going on from my role on Friday. Which activity are you referencing that ha at, that you're asking me to identify the time. At the last time you talked to the Kowalskis. It, um, so I I'd assume it must have been around three or four again. Mm -hmm. Okay. And at that time, then, did the hospital know from some source that the Kowalskis believed their daughter had CRPS? I was in the room earlier when the parents and the physician, I can't identify the physician, talked about CRPS and transferred to Nemours. 
All right. And the parents believed that the transfer to Nemours would be for CRPS care. That right? was the discussion I... Sustained. What if... Well, I think it's in the note. Let me check here. Were the parents of, from, from what you, did the parents tell you that they wanted more CRPS care for their child? Objection here, sir. For a st statement for medical purposes. Go ahead. Overruled. Uh, you can they, answer. They did not talk to me about that. All right. I witnessed that conversation in the room. All right. So you witnessed the conversation, right? All right. And did they also explain that, the, that there was an attending physician, a Dr. Hannah, that was treating the child already? Yes. So at this point, the case manager knew that this was a CRPS case from the parent's point of view. Is that right? I... Form leading overruled. She can answer that one. Go ahead. I don't know. I didn't have much conversation with the case manager that I recall, so I don't know what she knew and didn't know, but I would assume she would have known that there would have been a discussion about discharge planning, which was a transfer to Nemours. I would assume that, but I don't know. Okay. And so then they knew that there was a attending physician treating the CRPS, to the best of your knowledge? Sustained. What, if anything, did you know about Dr. Hanna and his involvement? Just that he was um, Maya was seeing him on an outpatient basis for treatment all right and then uh, was it discussed in front of you what that outpatient treatment was going to be no was the treatment she was to receive at Nemours discussed in front of you no did you read at the time any records that indicated what that would be? No. All right. Can you read for me the part in your record about the Nemours transfer? You have it? I don't see it on the screen. I don't see my notes. Sorry. Okay. One moment. I have a blank screen. Okay. I'm working on it. I think it's under uh, 1001 2031. Oh, hang on. Don't show that one. No. I can't show that one. Um, I'll withdraw on that line of questioning. So did you ever get a chance to complete your psychosocial analysis? No, or the risk assessment. And why is that important here? To form your honor, it assumes that there wasn't one done at some point. I, judge, that's a speaking objection, and that's not true. Okay. Well, both sides, no speaking objections. Both sides. Going to overrule the objection, she can answer. I'm sorry, the question. Why was the psychosocial evaluation, your evaluations, important? Are they required? Uh, by the child abuse policy in the hospital, a risk assessment, a social worker is, or a social work consult is ordered to do a risk assessment if there's suspicion of child abuse and then coordinates that suspicion after a risk assessment, they contact um, the child abuse, the in state so far, of Florida child abuse so, registry to make on, a report. In, ter in terms of the... Hold on a second. I'll wait for the next question. <laughs> okay. At the time... At the end of this, did you ever learn, leave aside the child abuse, did you ever learn what the doctors actually thought Maya had? Okay. And at the time you left, had you ever completed your psychosocial analysis towards any decision in that regard? Ask and answer. Yeah. Sustained. Look 
looking to see if this is yours. All right, let's look at 1001-2030 at the bottom of the page there. Do you have that? No, sir. May I have water? All right. Okay. So let's look at the bottom of the page there. Okay. Um, let's uh, look down there. And does it say that uh, there the patient was being seen by Dr. Hannah, a pain specialist in the outpatient setting? And that was your knowledge? Yes. All right. And you said, please refer to pain team and EC notes for, and what is HCT? Healthcare team. All right, discussion with Dr. Hannah. Do you know if there was a discussion with Dr. Hannah? If I reference uh, notes, I would assume there would have been a discussion with Dr. Hannah. All right, and then it says, HC team and mother came to a compromise for care regarding pain. Medication, Medication for, temporarily. For, yeah, temporarily. Let's say that. And so were the parents willing to work with the hospital about a specific treatment? Object form, Judge Goss for conclusion. Overall, she can answer. I'm sorry, I asked the question again. Okay. It, it says there that HCT and the mother came to a compromise for care regarding pain medication temporarily. Then that means that the mother, the mother, parent, and the teen agreed to collaborated on the pain regimen at then, that time. Okay. And it says mother told HCT, and that's who again? Uh, oh, healthcare team. All right. That patient would not cooperate with blood pressure monitoring unless she has additional pain medication, as patient had awakened and was thrashing about on the bed, right? That's what I wrote. And so the reason that Beata Kowalski, for the best of your knowledge, wanted the cuff to be held off was because the child was in pain and it would cause her more pain. That's my understanding. And so did that appear unreasonable to you? Objection. Uh, <laughs> Sustained. So then um, did the father request a manual blood pressure cuff? Um, that's how my note reads, and I do remember a discussion about using a manual blood pressure cuff versus... A digital. All right. And then did the mother refuse psychiatric intervention because they don't help us? Objection to the speculation regarding state of mind. It's in the note. Sustained. Does it say mother also refused psychiatric intervention as, quote, they don't help us? Uh, am I allowed to answer that? Uh, I think so. Okay. So at the time... Um, Mom did not want psychiatric uh, an, an, a psychiatric evaluation by this hospital's psychiatrist. But at that time, can you tell the jury that the health care team, or at least you, knew the child had already received that type of care at the Eagle Swings? Counseling and a psych evaluation are two different things. Okay. But had they had some psychological counseling by that time, to the best of your knowledge? They had been clients at Eagle's Wing. All right. And so uh, I gotta watch out for this. All right. And if you look at the end there, um, well, I can't ask about that. And were you directed? Can't ask that. Did any nurse or doctor ask you your opinion about this family? Not that I recall. And if they had asked you for your opinion at that time, would you have affirmed what you found here? Objection, Your Honor. I don't understand the question. Sustained. To this point, had they, had they indicated or shown you anything to indicate that they were engaged in any type of abuse of Maya? Objection, Your Honor. I call it for a conclusion. 
sustained. What, if any, symptoms did you see? Of, you didn't see any symptoms of child abuse, did you? Same objection, Your Honor. Symptoms. Same. Symptoms. Same. I understand. All right. Did you complete a psychosocial form with the family? Um, it's an interview, so it's not, I just hopefully no, remember all the questions. <laughs> Got it. Okay. And did it appear to you uh, that, strike it. I want to ask some more judge, but I got to figure out how. One moment. Based on the rulings, no further questions. <coughs> Mr. Hunter, how long do you anticipate your cross to be? Less than 10 minutes. Then come on down. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's 12. I'm just concerned about everyone's I'm lunch. Sorry, I, 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 I share your concern most <laughs> profoundly. Good morning or afternoon, whichever that is. <laughs> whichever. Um, we haven't met, have we? No, sir. You did have a chance to speak with Mr. Anderson or his team before you testified here today, correct? Yes. Okay. And you flew down from New Hampshire to testify here today, correct? Yes. Um, if I'm understanding correctly from your deposition, you had contact with this family uh, for about a total of two hours in and out of the room. Is that right? Two to three. I'm not, you know. Okay. Well, if we put up um, the two notes you have, first uh, 2001, 1001, 2000, 2030, we see that your last note was signed at 6.44 p.m., correct? Yes, sir. So that would be after your last interaction with the family. Yes, sir. And your first interaction was signed off. If we could put up 2032, it looks like you opened the note at 2.04 p.m., then signed it off at 2.23 p.m. Is that right? I'm sorry. Please answer that. I'm sorry. I'm back at... Uh, 2032, it looks like you began the note at uh, 2.04 p.m., that's 14.04, and that it was signed off at 14.23, which is 2.23 p.m., correct? Yes, sir. And that would have been after your first encounter was complete, right? Yes, sir. Okay. Now, both these notes that you have accurately reflect your interaction with this patient, correct? To the best of my knowledge, yes, Okay. Sir. <laughs> as far as you know. Okay. And you never spoke with Dr. Hannah yourself. No, sir. But your notes indicate that the health care team did, correct? Yes, sir. Okay. And um, when you saw, th this was all the interaction you had with this case, is that right? I was only covering for Friday, yes, sir. Okay, you were you were covering for Friday. Uh, covering for Kathy Beatty that Friday, which was Hurricane Matthew, yes, sir. Okay, that's and why you were you were in the PICU at all. That's the only reason. And on Monday morning, when I notified the case manager that Eagles Wings had called me back to confirm that Maya had been a client, okay, so that they could follow up. Okay. I'm sorry, I thought you said something, Judge. Um, Not say a word. Okay. Um, 
when so you didn't talk to Eagles Wings until Monday, but at that point you didn't you didn't have any understanding of what exactly the services were that the family had obtained there, correct? I called Friday. Right. And they called me back Monday morning. Okay. But the point is, you didn't have any understanding of what psychological services they had gotten at Eagle's Wings. I was Beyond told, the fact they'd been a patient there. I don't understand your question. Sorry. Okay. Did you have any understanding from Eagle's Wings what services the family had gotten there above and beyond the fact that there was a, that they were a patient there? Um, counseling. <coughs> That's my understanding. Okay. And you didn't have any idea whether it was a psychologist or a social worker or oh. who it was? Uh, no, sir. Okay. And you didn't know the extent of any evaluation they had gotten there? Uh, no, sir. Okay. Did you have any understanding of whether the, whether the patient, Maya Kowalski, had ever been seen at Tampa General Hospital? So, uh, no, sir. But, oh. again... In your previous question, could you, could you ask your previous question again? Did you have any idea who, what level of psychological person, counselor, okay. was rendering service to the family at Eagle's Wings? Uh, I didn't get that information. When they called me back Monday, I was handing that information over to the case right. manager to follow okay. up. So by that point, you're off the case. I'm off the case. <laughs> okay. Um, when you looked at, uh, when you were in the room, you, your note indicates that, um, I'm, I'm referring to 2030 now. Your note indicates that the patient had awoken and was yelling, is that right? That's my recollection. Okay, and she she was saying that she wanted her sedation. That's what I heard. It's and she was, throw, she was throwing things. That's my recollection, yes. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I've seen in oncology patients feeling very, uh, <clears throat> chemotherapy is very painful, and I've seen similar behaviors. So. Okay. But she was agitated, is the bottom line. Yes. Okay. And um, that was adding to some kind of confusion in the room, I'm gathering. Yes. Okay. And did you have any follow-up knowledge of efforts made to transfer this patient to Nemours? From Friday? I, I was witnessing the conversation. I um, I did not follow up that day what the decision was. Is that your question? Yes, ma'am. You had no knowledge of what happened after that? Uh, no, sir. That would be the case manager that would handle the transfer. Okay. And on, on the day you were involved, you were aware that there was a call placed in the moors, but that it was closed due to the hurricane. Well, I my understanding is that Nemours couldn't accept her that day because of the hurricane. Um, okay. The hospitals stay open. <laughs> okay. But in any event, the, the hurricane was a problem that day. That was a problem on the East Coast. Nemours is on the East. Okay. Like, yeah. So, near Orlando. The eastern side, eastern side of Orlando. Right. Okay. Um, briefly here. Now, you were aware that the team had spoken with Dr. Hanna, but you didn't know what Dr. Hanna's treatment had consisted of? Uh, no, sir. Okay. That's a medical. And if we want to refer to it later, once again, your notes and your social work notes here, or your writings and your social work notes are accurate, as far as you know, correct? To the best of my knowledge, yes, sir. Okay. I don't have anything else. Thank you. Any follow up? Just one. Of all of all of the people in the healthcare team, you were the one that was supposed to have the most input on determining whether or not 
There were some indications of abuse. True. Objection. Calls for conclusions are relevant. Sustained. No more questions. Members of the jury, do any of you have any questions for this witness? Okay, just write it out, sir. Hey, uh, members of the jury, um, I'm going to be able to ask some but not all of the questions. Uh, the question is, who was the case manager at this time? I'm not exactly sure what this time is, but. Well, I was the case manager on the PICU at, when I was there Friday. It should have been Joyce, as I recall. Joyce Shear, I believe was her name. Okay. And then the other question I'm not going to be able to ask. Okay. Uh, plaintiffs, do you have any follow-up? No, Your Honor. And no any, questions, Your Honor. Okay. Any follow-up from the jury? Okay. Let me... Members of the jury, I think your lunch is going to be a little bit longer today. Let's have you back here at 145 ready to go. I will try to finish everything by then, but I'll do my best. While you're away, please do not discuss this case amongst yourselves. Do not do any investigation and receive no information. And we'll see you after you have a hopefully a yummy lunch. Seated. The jury is out of our presence. Um, may uh, this witness be excused? Um, probably not quite yet, Judge. Like for she's going to come back today, or maybe in the future. In the future. Okay. So, Miss Hanson, apparently, I, 
you're going to be finished for today, but there's a chance that you might be asked to come back. Rebuttal. But, but from, from my perspective, I just need you not to talk about this case except for with the attorneys. Okay? So am I allowed to go home to New Hampshire and then do I fly back <laughs> or do I have to stay here? And I have no objection to that. Sounds like uh, the plans are okay with you going back to New Hampshire. And Thank you. If they want to bring you back, uh, they'll okay contact you. Judge. I'm sorry? We're okay with releasing. Oh, thank you. Have a, have a good day, ma'am. <laughs> thank you, sir. Now, for our perspective, I want to, before we leave, I want to few out my thoughts on Mr. Elegant and Mr. Um, Alton Burns' assignment to me. But are there other issues that we need to address before we leave for our lunch? Your Honor, I, I want to uh, move in limine and, if necessary, or, or uh, obtain an uh, instruction to strike as to that we had a, a request for admission about whether or not a pediatric neurologist had ever examined, and they admitted they never had. Yesterday in cross-examination, counsel threw in, were you aware that a pediatric neurologist uh, reviewed the case or was involved as of the summer of 2015? That's directly opposite of an admission. So I'd ask that no more uh, evident, quote, evidence be put in, because once a party answers an admission, then they're barred from... I'm, I'm, I'm unclear, because the admission that we read was from October 2016 to January 2017, and now you're talking about a 2015 time period, which is not part of the time frame of the admission. Let me check the admissions. I thought there was exactly. a second one. It would seem to me that the request for admission in... That question had to do with two different things. I understand, Your Honor. Anything else before? Just only, Your Honor, um, we would like to inquire from the plaintiff who they intend on calling tomorrow since it's new now. Uh, tomorrow we've got uh, Dr. Hannah in the afternoon and Dr. Kirkpatrick in the morning. Thank you, Counselor. And we're going to try to play it. If they somehow get done early, which I can't imagine, then we would uh, play a deposition the rest of the day. I'm going to ask everybody to be back here at 1.30. Now, we're still going, but I'm not sure how many people want to stay to listen to me prattle on about our jury instruction issue. But um, for those that want to stay, great. For those that want to go to, for lunch, that's fine, too. Just be back here at 1.30. Judge, do you anticipate that the prattling on will uh, take longer than a half hour, and will the courtroom be open? Well, the courtroom will be open so long as I'm on the bench, so yes. And my hope is I can do it in 10 to 15 minutes. Very good. My hope. Okay, so if anyone wants to leave, please do that now. If anyone wants to stay, just go ahead and stay.
everyone. See, we're back. What's uh, the next issue? 2740A is a video of a fire. It's about uh, 10 seconds to 15 seconds long. It, well, I can just show it to the court. It just shows. Uh, is Mr. Jack Kowalski testifying today? Yes. He's about to go on. Okay. okay. I'm sorry, what's the number again, please? It is 2748. It can't be 2748. The dividend's beginning only went up to 25. Oh, wait a minute. I'm sorry. Is that the new one that you sent this morning? Yeah. I'm sorry. So I don't have that written down. 2748. It was last night at night. Okay. We have to argue with 2748A. Okay. It's a brief clip. And then we have a bit more, but we really can save a lot of these. Judge, this was my plan. I, I don't want to have this slow down the jury in any way, shape, or form. I'm just going to have my client go up and tell his story and not worry about too many exhibits. And then this thing should go through fairly smoothly, except for, you know, objection to every question. However, um, the idea would be then, uh, if necessary, I'll bring him back if we not reach any further agreement on things. And that'll minimize, again, the only things he would be doing would be to authenticate certain documents. And then from there, uh, it would either be conjunction with uh, or separate from his third time. I can do the latter part today. I can wait. Okay. I'm not sure I'm understanding what you're asking me. I want to avoid, I'd like some leeway from the court on, on rulings of things being uh, asked and answered or redundant because there may be some spillover from him telling a story to a predicate for a photograph or document or exhibit, other exhibit. I'm unclear. Are you moving something in right now or yes, not? We're going to move quite a bit of things in. Is there a further agreement from this morning? No, Your Honor. Okay. Then let's just get at it. All right. So uh, up in, I understand that now 2528-8 uh, is admitted, 1421-24. 37 and 45 are in evidence. Is that right? I think the clerk was struggling to keep up with that, Mr. Anderson. I'm sorry. I thought they were. In. So again, it's 2528 8, 2528 14, 2528 21, 2528 yeah, 24, 2528 37. 2528-45, 25, it's a marriage certificate, 2426, uh, and then 2428 is objected to. Are you still no, objecting to that? No, 2428 is not objected to. All right, so that move that into evidence. It's been in, it's in evidence. All right, and then... Why, uh, why are we... If they're already in evidence, why are we spending any time on it? Because I wanted to make sure that all of these were in evidence, and I also wanted to make sure that if we, they weren't, we could have brief argument on things like the birth certificates, uh, the Polish birth certificates, the nursing license, things like that. Are all those in, counsel? All those being the ones you just read off? Yes, two, four... Two two, two four two four. No, two four two two is not in. All right, 
Do you have an objection to the birth certificate? I don't. I guess we don't have objections. I, I just assume they would just testify to it as opposed to putting in a court record their birth certificates with their date of birth. To me, it's sort of a, aren't they just going to testify as to their date of birth? You're going to put in a public record these individuals' dates of birth. So I guess that's up to you. In 99% of the cases, I wouldn't. In this case, discretion is the so better part of it. So it sounds like there's no objection to 2422. So sure. let's go ahead and receive 2422. Ask the clerk to note that there might be information that will ultimately have to be redacted. 2424? No, that's not it. I know. I'm asking you. Do you have an objection to the poll? I don't see the relevance to For Kyle and Maya. Just an objection is relevance. Were they born in the United States? Uh, they were not, but this is Polish citizenship. So 2422. The official birth certificates are already in. The official birth certificates. So I didn't, we didn't understand. I'll withdraw it. I'll withdraw it. Uh, then we have uh, 2435. Is that in? That Are is you? in. Then we have the video of a brief 10 second video of Jack uh, Kowalski as a firefighter demonstrating his job and abilities. Judge, I believe that's 2748. 2748. We object to a video of Mr. Kowalski fighting a fire. There's no claim in this case that has any bearing on Mr. Kowalski. Didn't I let in a, a, a very attractive photo of Mr. Kowalski in a, in a deputy fire chief helmet? No. That's already it. Then no, 2748's out. Can I at least make argument for the record of what that's about? If, can the court at least watch it? Because it sure. demonstrates his ability. Let's, I mean, I, I think let, let's watch the 10 seconds. And of course there has to be predicate. How does that go to any issue in this case? Because Mr. Kowalski was the person that got all of those people out from behind there before that wall collapsed on him. And it goes to his background and for the court to, or for the jury to eventually evaluate him under the general damages as what he has seen and not seen in his life. It also goes to our testimony we will have about his dreams and desires for all of this happened to join FEMA and his abilities and knowledge of being able to do that. So this is important for the purposes of establishing to the jury, rather than just seeing a hat, that these, this man was real live deputy firefighter and was involved in some pretty dangerous situations and gave him the background training and experience that they should consider in two different areas. Okay, my ruling stands. All right. uh, two, four, three, one, which is uh, Mr. Kowalski's firefighting career. Uh, it has a 20 year service award, uh, certificates for his performance, uh, accommodation letter, and the promotion in 2388. So this would be 2431, and that would be. Uh, Pages 161, 8, 9, 9, 4, 9, 7, 100, 106, 109, 114, 253-57, and then again, 2431-238, his promotion to deputy fire chief. And that also goes to diminish earning capacities, all of these. It's, it's, his, it's his career. Judge, there's no claim that his, we don't believe it's relevant, we think it's prejudicial, we think it's, um, 
improper character evidence. There's nothing about this case that encompasses Mr. Kowalski's career as a firefighter and all the accolades that he's gotten as a firefighter. It's not a claim that's being made in this case. It gives he's the... retired. He was retired at the time of this whole incident. So we remain baffled and object. I'm going to sustain the objection. And then uh, two five, excuse me, two three five three is in. I understand. Two three five four is in. That's a 2014 tax return. Two five uh, two zero one five is in. That's the fit 2015. No, two three five five. Yes. All right, and then two three five six to 2016. Yes. Th that's in? Yes. 2357, 2358, and 2359 are objected to? We object to those, Judge. Those are after Mrs. Kowalski's passing. They don't have any, all they tell the jury is what their income is after she passed. That it doesn't give them any information as to what the information the jury needs with respect to income that Mrs. Kowalski was contributing to the household is contained in the 13, 14, 15, and 16 tax returns. The 17, 18, and 19 tax returns just show what Mr. Kowalski makes. That's, first of all, his income is not supposed to be part of the jury's consideration. There's a motion to eliminate about finances not being part of this case. And it doesn't give them any additional information. The information as to what she earned is in the prior tax returns. So we object the relevance and 94.3. If you, this is a comparison to show the difference in earning capacity without Viata Kowalski, uh, Kowalski and her uh, health benefits, medical insurance, to what it was before. That loss is material to the lost accumulations in the uh, state case. And so it would be relevant and material to demonstrate how much the income has gone down, and it would also show the loss of her income, which eventually is brought back to present value. Just out of curiosity, if that's the case, then why don't I have 20 through 22? Well, that's a good question, Judge. Um, we should have 20 through 22. Two. I don't know. I thought we thought we thought three years after compared with three years before would be appropriate. Judge, again, it gives the jury information as to the quality household income, which is not something the jury should be considering. What they can, what they currently make, want what they can consider is what Mrs. Kowalski contributed to that household, not what they currently make. That's a different thing. The prior tax returns tell them what she made. They know they, that it hasn't been included since then. Did the 2017 contain any income from her in the small part of January? I don't know the answer to that, Judge. I don't know. My information is there was a W-2 issue. Is that true? Uh, for 2017, it's part of the 27 return, wasn't there a W-2 attached for her one month of income? Just a moment. Should be attached. Seven pages. Yes. Yes. Yeah, Caremark LLC agent for Quorum Specialty Infusion Services. In, in that case, Judge, the W-2 alone should... Well, I don't have a problem with the 2017 coming in. 18 and 19, I agree with Ms. Crowell's. But 17 does contain information about uh, Beata's financial contributions. 
2362 is the 20, oh, okay. uh, and then 2051, 205, well, let's go with this one at a time. 2051 is Rawlings Company, uh, Sunshine Health, Notice of Lean, and Ledger, which uh, shows we had argument over the amount of damages from the fraud, and the court had previously stated on the record that a lien could be construed as damage, a financial damage. So we have three liens there. Judge. That would be 2051, 2052, 2053. Ms. Cross. Well, Judge, the lien information typically would be introduced outside the presence of the jury for purposes of determining the amount of damages that the jury is entitled to and reducing any claim for medical bills to the amount of the lien. Um, 2053 is a lien for medical treatment post the hospitalization. It looks like we've got up 2051. Okay, 2051. So, I mean, that's our argument, Judge. It doesn't, it's not evidence of a claim they're making because they're not making a claim for just the lien of the heart. But they are. It's typically done outside the presence of the jury with respect to any type of lien information. So, I'm not sure why that would be admissible. You, Mr. Anderson? It's admissible to show the damages. I don't have a problem with not putting them in so long as counsel is not continuing to ma maintain that there were no damages as to this, the fraud claimed there, per the summary judgment rule. Well, typically I see this in after the trial is over, I deal with it then. So I don't see why I wouldn't handle it as a collateral source issue post-judgment if we need to get there. Will the court then take judicial notice or otherwise? And we want to avoid a gotcha where they come in and claim that there is no damages to the fraud count and the misrepresentation count on the uh, billing. And we had a summary judgment over this and the court on the record had stated that... It seems to me that if if there is a legal obligation to repay some or all of it, um, that kind of forecloses the defense argument that there's no damages. It would seem to me. So Am I testify? missing something, defense side? It's, yeah. it's yeah. sorry. Go ahead. It may, no, however, the claim of lien would go to the medical malpractice action, not necessarily the fraud claim. Mm -hmm. So, you know, just so the record's clear. We're not conceding that the existence of a lien would be evidence of fraud. That would be a totally separate issue that the plaintiff would need to bear proof of. But we understand that the Rawlings may be claiming damages for any claims of medical malpractice. That would be what it would be related to. But didn't Mr. Hunter, in opening statement, make a offhand comment if they were damaged at all? Well, right. I mean, we're, you know, because the evidence that's going to come forward in the trial, especially when the defense case goes forward, is that the hospital was paid in reimbursement from Aetna per day for the bed. They were not paid for treatment for CRPS versus the other diagnosis codes. It's all just one bill they get reimbursed for. So there's a claim of lien from the Rawlings Company, and the Rawlings Company claims liens in any case where there's a dispute about the medical bills. Well, okay, so let's play this out. You're going to tell the jury that uh, all this money was paid by someone else, which you normally would not see in a case. And now you're suggesting that we don't tell the jury that there is an obligation on the behalf of the Kowalskis to pay that money. I'm, I'm just trying to figure out. I mean, it doesn't seem fair at that point. Well, Judge, can I, can I suggest this? We're not contesting the, the accuracy of these notices of lien. I don't know why Mr. Kowalski would have to testify that there are liens. Because I think this is a bigger issue as to whether it's legitimate or whether it doesn't come in. 
I mean, we're objecting to them coming in in front of the jury at this point. But we're not saying they have to leave, that they have to bring somebody in from Rawlings to admit these or that they need custody of Mr. Kowalski to admit these three items. The objection is that it doesn't come in front of the jury. And I don't know how Mr. Kowalski, other than receiving the notice of lien, would have any additional testimony to add to that. Well, I mean, from my perspective, if the defense is trying to tell the jury that the Kowalskis, that all of this has been paid by insurance, which would give the impression that the Kowalskis have no out-of-pocket damage, but the lien tells us otherwise. But the lien only comes into being if they receive money from the jury and they have to pay it back. They don't have a damage as we sit here. They have no obligation to pay this lien back as we sit here. The obligation to pay the lien only occurs if the jury gives them money for these medical bills that they are claiming a lien for. And only then do they have an obligation to pay it back. There is no active lien that they are obligated to pay back absent the jury awarding them money damages for the medical bills which they are claiming a lien. And so the defense's suggestion is we can malpractice, take the money from the insurance company, and you don't need to worry about paying it back because you just can't win because the bills are paid by insurance? No, sir. What I'm saying is that the plaintiffs have not incurred a damage because of this lien. I think what I'm hearing from the court is that the notice of lien is evidence of damage they sustained when in fact the notice of lien is not effectuated or doesn't even become an issue unless the jury awards medical bills. And only then do they have to pay it back. The problem I've got is the perception that the defense is trying to present to the jury that there is no obligation to pay anything. And if I'm hearing Mr. Hunter in his opening statement that they don't have to pay anything because insurance paid everything, then it seems like we've got a problem of potentially misleading the jury as to what actually is the reality of the situation. Now, I'm not wedded to the notices of liens, but I think I've previously said and ruled that that is an obligation of the Kowalskis to pay. I understand it might be contingent, but there's only one time that the Kowalskis get to go to the jury on this. As long as the jury would understand that that is not, they don't, as they sit here today, have to write a check to the Rawlings Company. There's no, they have no obligation at this point. And it would be, I think, incorrect to leave the jury with the impression that as we sit here, there is a lien against the Kowalski family that they are obligated to pay because that's just not true. They don't have to pay it unless they actually receive an award from this jury for those medical records, those medical bills. Otherwise, they don't have this obligation. So it's a disservice for the defense for the jury to be led under the impression that they have a lien against them, that they have to cut a check for 30 grand or 100 grand or whatever it is because that's not true. Yeah, I see that point too. I mean, obviously, this is complicated because of the existence of the medical bill issue fraud claim. Which is why I don't know that, I don't know that this has to be resolved before Mr. Kowalski's testimony because, or if he wants to, I don't know. I'll leave that to the court. Well, perhaps, Mr. Anderson, this issue needs to be fleshed out more because just as I don't want to give the impression the one way against the defense, I don't, or against the plaintiffs, I don't want to do the same thing for the defense. May I, I understand and we don't want error. So I would ask that we be able to ask Mr. Kowalski the 
vague question, I guess. It's not vague, but the question of whether he has any liens filed on behalf of the, his health insurers that contain amounts attributable by the hospital to CRPS. That's essentially what we're talking about here. And so I guess for the purposes of the record here, it would simply be that there was evidence in the record of the existence of these Judge, as a contingent liability. I think that's going to leave a misimpression for the jury. And secondly, their, their complaint said the damages include co-pays, increased premiums, difficulty finding insurance, and having to pay insurance payments they should not make. It also says plaintiffs continue to be injured and the Kowalski's health insurers may seek reimbursement from the Kowalski's for the CRPS treatments and services that were fraudulently billed during my shelter in at JH. Mr. Anderson, I think this issue is going to take too much time to resolve. So my, my view is let's not present this issue at this moment. If you need to call Mr. Kowalski back on this issue before you rest your case in chief, after we've had a chance to, to really flush it out. Perhaps the better way to deal this is that you all will come up with a joint statement stipulated facts. as to what right. the situation is. That might be the better way of handling it. Right. I got it, I think. Uh, I, we understand the court's ruling in that regard. And then from there, uh, we have, uh, there's no objection to 2044, as I understand it, the cremation burials. Correct. So that's in evidence, or remove it if it isn't. It's in evidence. Uh, 2018, the quorum CBS specialty infusion services employment records pertaining to Beata Kowalski. Judge, we object. There's like over 200 pages of Mrs. Kowalski's employment file. I objected to the whole thing, or we objected to the whole thing, and then I put some specific references, like 114 and 122 are subpoenas and letters from us, 081 and 093 are reviews, but in total, we object to the record. We understand the relevancy of the judge. That her income is in evidence. Her tax returns are in evidence. Other than that, I'm not sure the significance of the file. What's the purpose of the file? The significance of the file is that our... Uh, experts, both the life care planner and the economist, uh, relied on uh, increases in Ms. Uh, uh, Ms. Kowalski's um, income over the course of time. And this gives us some idea, and they can then testify that a, an employee of this value and based upon her reviews and how she was doing, uh, the likelihood, probability of her making more and more money in advanced positions was there. And the other thing here is, Judge, under 90.8037, uh, that's an absence of entry in business records. And uh, if there was any complaint against her, it would be reflected in this record. But there is no complaint against her about any of this. Her... Uh, character, for lack of a better term, has been impugned, maybe not in that term, but in terms of uh, whether she was trying to hurt her child. And so this Munchausen allegation and then the negligence, the, uh, uh, can, can, can what I it ask? got converted to the medical abuse. So this was under, both of the, I'm sorry. under both of those bases, it should come in as relevant. And it is a business record, and more important, it's, an, it's the absence of entry in a business record where it would usually be in someone's employment file if there was a problem with one of these things. Judge, what I've heard is that this is potentially relevant to his expert's opinion. They can rely on documents that are missed, first of all. Secondly, I don't think it's that they can do Mr. Kowalski's testimony. Am I correct? Well, right now, I'm just putting it in. I don't know yet all of the questions I'm formulating for Mr. Kowalski on the damages aspect, which I stated I was going to break up from the first part of his testimony. Well, experts all the time rely on documents that are hearsay that never come in front of the jury. So I don't, that fact that the 
your experts might have relied and reviewed the file doesn't mean that the file needs to come in. It would also go to any propensity, any habit, any uh, motive, any plan, anything else involving, um, in, and I say this because they were actually raised it, they actually raised the issue of whether she was somehow, and have been implying that she somehow was obtaining ketamine off record. I mean, where was she getting it if she was supposed to be giving her child ketamine? I mean, and so... Assume that's true. What would, your, what would the employment records have anything to do with that? Because the jury may infer from these employment records that this employee's employment history clearly demonstrates an outstanding employee and the likelihood of that, what they're contending, that she would go back inside the corporate records and, or uh, corporate assets, whatever you want to call them, supply, and remove them is extremely unlikely. And it goes to that point of what was her propensity. And also, finally, the jury is being asked in uh, both survival and the, uh, and the other action to evaluate Beata Kowalski as a person and the loss of her to her family. And this gives them a wider perspective about what kind of person she was. Okay, but that doesn't mean that the file itself comes in. I mean, if you want to call somebody from her employer to testify, that seems to be fine, but I I'm having problems with the actual file. Um, right. You just don't put in people's personnel files normally. Normally you don't. So and I'll tell you what, Judge, I'll withhold on that right now until later. So I just I want to see about a predicate there a little bit more. All right. Um, there is a note from Maya Kowalski, a press and recollection recorded of 2366. I'm sorry. We could bring up 2366. And... We've only got two more after this, Judge. Actually, yeah, two more. Judge, I believe this has already been tried to be put into evidence, and it's been denied. Um, it's hearsay. This this was pre this was it was a different number, but this was previously attached to something that the plaintiff tried to put in. This looks familiar. Yes. And, and the court sustained the objection as to hearsay. We filed a motion to admit uh, child abuse hearsay statements pursuant to Florida Statute 90.802, paren 3, or 2, 2, 3, on this point. And I think this is the third time I've, I've told you at this point. You've got to have a hearing. I, I saw over the weekend you filed something. I have not had a chance to read the 89 pages. But those hearings almost always happen well before the trial starts. Well before the trial starts because it, those are pretty involved hearings. I understand, Judge. And so you can't file the motion and say, let it in at this point. So I, I don't think you can get in at this document under that hearsay exception because we haven't had a hearing on it. So it's uh, his... If he knew of this once, I would intend to refresh his recollection with these. Yeah. Judge, he, refreshing his memory as to hearsay that he was told by his daughter, that, that's objectionable on several levels. Well, well hers, uh, time out. Refreshing recollection, which obviously would not be shown to the jury, you can use pretty much anything to refresh recollection. I, I understood, Judge, but what they want to use is a hearsay statement by his daughter to refresh his memory as to hearsay that his daughter, items that his daughter told him, which would be objectionable in the first place as hearsay. Well, most likely, yes. But 8033, then existing mental, emotional, or physical condition taken down at the time. What, whatever this document number is it's not showing is still not admissible. 2366-001. And so, What's next? will that be, um, but I can use that to refresh recollection if I'm understanding the court's ruling. The answer is yes, but that doesn't mean the content of what you're trying to get him to refresh his recollection is coming in. Right. Because it most likely is going to draw a hearsay objection and it's most likely going to be sustained as hearsay. I understand. 
Uh, and I don't want one of these, you read it in front of the jury. No, I understand. Uh, two, three, six, seven, Maya Kowalski's note to Dr. Kilgore, Dr. Amin, and Kathy Beatty. Judge, again, I don't know that it's a note to them. I don't think she sent this note to the doctor, Dr. Manor Kathy Bean. It's about them. And it says attorney info on the back. It's the second page of the document the judge already sustained objection to previously. And here's our note. Well. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Part of the previous exhibit, the court sustained. Probably. Why, why isn't this something that Maya Kowalski is going to testify about? It can be judged, but this witness has knowledge of this, and it certainly went to uh, he and his wife's knowledge of how she was being treated at the time. And so this, by any stretch of the imagination, is a, a statement uh, for then existing mental, emotional, or physical, physical condition. And uh, it looks to me like it would come in under that exception. Judge, it's not that. It's her telling specific things that have happened according to her. It's not. Well, it's addressed to a, ju a, to a, a doctor, two doctors. No, it's, it's, and it talks about they're not doing anything for pain, saying this is psychological, uh, asking what I do at home for pain, therapy going really hard. I mean, to me, this is a perfect example of subpart uh, section three of 803. Judge, it's not written to anybody other than her attorney. It says attorney info on the bottom. It, but it's addressed to the doctors on the top. It, okay. I don't think that is a, think a reasonable interpretation of this document. And I, I don't know that that part would, it, it, to the, me, Judge, it, it just comes out of, of whether at this time she recorded a a, something in writing uh, that at the time reports what her state of mind was an intention or plan by anyone, in this instance it would be by Johns Hopkins, a motive, pain, this specific to 8033, and health. Not memory, belief, or belief, but in looking at Earhart, pain is one of the things that can be used under 8033. And she describes what's happening at that point. I feel like you're trying to use this document in an improper way with this upcoming witness. You know, it, it seems to me that this is a, a Maya Kowalski testimony. Now, I agree that the Kowal Mr. Jack Kowalski and Beata Kowalski, um, having knowledge of what Maya was transmitting, you know, certainly goes to their state of mind. But I don't think you need the document itself to make that point. This seems to be easier to address using Maya Kowalski than it, with Jack Kowalski because I'm next, if I allow it, then I'm going to next get a request for some type of limiting instruction. And then if it comes in more substantively through Maya's testimony, then do I have to undo the, the jury instruction that I've already given? I would suggest this, Judge, that I don't mind a limiting instruction at this point for this witness. And I agree with the court in that regard, and somewhat with counsel. However, it is such a key issue in this case as to whether during the course of this that Jack Kowalski, Beata Kowalski, received through the, if, if what I think he's going to say, he's going to say, which is that yes, at or around this time, they received it and it was driving Beata crazy. That's the point. The point is the notice part of this. And then Maya will come in later and verify, which again is a tie-in issue. But for the purposes of the Kowalski's notice of what was going on. 
Judge, he visited with Maya continually throughout the hospitalization. This note is to her attorney. It's hearsay. She gave it to him on one of those. I, I do think that it would help explain the Kowalski's Jack and Beata state of mind. That doesn't mean it being used for the truth of the matter asserted. And so if someone wants to draft up a limiting language, if, if the defense wants, I'm happy when, when this comes up to, to give that type of limiting instruction. So is the document actually being admitted into evidence, or he can just testify about what he was told? Well, I, I feel this document could come in to show the Kowalski state of mind at the time that they received the document. But hearsay documents of that state come in to show the state of mind of this author. I object. That we can't have. I tried. I mean, I mean, we're we're forty five minutes into this. After forty five minutes this morning, I agree. I, well, you caused this problem, Mr. Anderson. So let's. Uh, Mr. Mr. Altenburn's trying to speed things up for us, so I'm allowing it. Mr. Altenburn. State, state, state of mind is comes in to show the state of mind of the, the person who is speaking in the document that's hearsay. It's not to show the state of mind of somebody who read it down the road. I'm, I'm happy when I read Mark Twain, but that doesn't make it state of mind evidence. Show me a case on that. <laughs> All I know is we've got the jury sitting there Uh, I think there's only one more, um, and then it is. Uh, Hold on a second. I'm two. two Great. Three. Oh, sorry. I'm working on the current one. Yes, sir. I think the wiser course at this time is to not allow the document in. I, I, th th this this has a Maya Kowalski written all over it, but not a Jack Kowalski. Uh, the problem I would have is how can she testify to his state of mind at that time? Well, for, for better or for worse, it's not coming in at this time. All right, two, three, six, eight. This was a note at the time received by Mr. Kowalski. It's the same issue. Yes. So it's not coming out this time. Uh, the last is uh, FaceTime screenshots between uh, Maya and Beata. Can you give me a number, please? Yes. 2605. Well, what am I looking at? Uh, this is a uh, note made by, I believe, Biata at the time.
I'm sorry, Judge. It's Maya's handwriting. This was a note made at the time. Is that right? We got it, uh, Maya? Yeah. Okay. This was a note made at the time, at or near the time. Judge, this isn't with Mr. Kowalski. Apparently, it's FaceTime. Ms. Kowalski, Mrs. Kowalski, it's hearsay. I'm not sure. How, how is this going to be used by Mr. Jack Kowalski? Notice again to the Kowalskis of just what was happening to their daughter. It is not being offered for the truth of the matter asserted that would have to await Maya Kowalski's testimony. But this is a direct communication back to the, the Kowalskis, and you can see the face there. It's not to, it, it's, it's between Mrs. Kowalski and Maya, Judge. It's exactly. Hearsay. I don't know how Mr. Kowalski can even testify about it. I'm going to sustain the objection. What's next? Um, I don't know that it's on the list or that we'll get there, but uh, we would intend to put in, and I'll give a quick supplemental list, but the photographs. Can I just have a number, please? Just I don't a number right now. No, nothing else this time. Okay. Anything before I bring the jury in? No, Your Honor. Bring in the jury. Be seated. Members of the jury, I want to confirm while you were away, you did not discuss this case amongst yourselves. You did no investigation. You received no information. Is that all correct? Correct. correct. And since the last time you were with us, has anyone uh, approached you about this case? No. And have you seen any media coverage about this case since the last time you were with us? No. Okay. And I apologize for making you sit back there. I'm doing my best. You know, blame me for, for not being able to get everything done as quickly as I needed to get it done. So. So with that, uh, plaintiffs, call your next witness, please. I do. talking to them. <laughs> Please state your name for the record. Jack Kowalski. And where do you live, Mr. Kowalski? I live in Venice, Florida, a community called Stonewalk. And who was your wife? Beata Kowalski. And who are your children? I have three children. My oldest is Corrine Franz. She lives in Wisconsin. Maya Kowalski and my son Kyle Kowalski. And how old are you? How old am I? Yes. 62. All right. So when the events of 2016 went down, you would have been, what, approximately 55? Somewhere in that area, yes. Tell us a little bit about your background. Where were you born? I was born in Elmhurst, Illinois. It's a western, western suburb of Chicago. Mm-hmm. And what'd your dad do? My dad, he yeah. was he uh, repaired air conditioners, fetters, air conditioning, I believe. Then he moved here, and he was a boat captain in Tarpon Springs. All right. And you go to high school up there? I went to high school in North Lake, Illinois. It was called West Leiden High School. 
And any college or any training after that? Well, I started out in high school. They had a, a fire cadet program mm -hmm. where I would go to the firehouse in my junior, senior year. Um, it would be in the afternoon hours, uh, Monday through Friday. And what, they, uh, what we were able to do was learn the uh, f firefighting uh, through the state of Illinois certificates. Uh, ended up getting a firefighter state certified two. Uh, and, What's uh, a two? It's the, the highest level at that point that I could have took. So how, um, how old were you when you got that? 18, 19, somewhere in that area. So when did you, was there any more training after that? Uh, while I was still in high school, I was allowed, as long as my grades were good, I was able to go to Triton College for EMT. That's the basic. Okay. And so are you, or were you, a licensed or certified in that? I was licensed, or I, well, they, I don't know if they call it licensed or certified, but yes, I was. So your medical knowledge there, uh, you had some through the remainder of your life from this? Uh, that was the, the beginning, and then I ended up in 1986, I was certified paramedic. And so, but between you and Beata, who had more of the medical knowledge? She did, by far. All right. Okay. And so tell us a little bit about your career in the fire department. You came on as a cadet. Yeah, once happened? I was a cadet, um, I ended up... Uh, I was fortunate enough to uh, become a fire dispatcher while I was still in high school. Um, I would uh, dispatch for that fire department, North Lake Fire Protection District. Uh, I would stay overnight, school bus picked me up, take me to school the next day. Made about $60 a, a day, which seemed like a ton of money at the time, uh, but it was a great opportunity. And did you stay in firefighting? I stayed with North Lake until 1985, and I moved out to Phoenix, Arizona for a short period of time to help my sister with her landscape business. But while I was out there, I ended up going into the, it was like a cadet program through Phoenix Fire Department. Got it. And so when you came back, what year would that have been to restart it in Chicago? That would have been 1986. Mm -hmm. uh, I received a letter while I was in Phoenix, Arizona, that I was accepted into the paramedic program at Loyola, Loyola University Medical Center. And so what was the next fire department that you worked for? As soon, almost as soon as I graduated paramedic school, I was very blessed. I ended up uh, getting hired by Broadview Fire Department. And did you stay with Broadview for very long? For my whole career, 28 and a half years. And what position did you start in? Started out as a firefighter paramedic. Uh, we rotated. We had a 12-man shift. We were in a community. It's about 2.2 square miles. Don't sound like much, but there was a lot within that area. And then we also belong to, uh, it's called Division 20. It's, it's about 16 other fire departments that we worked with. Uh, so it was a very large area, anywhere in between Midway Airport and O'Hare Airport. So this was a suburb of Chicago? That is correct. A fairly populated area? Very. All right. And so as a, uh, I don't want to call you a junior firefighter, but at, at that level of firefighting, what types of things did you have to know and do? Um, at our department, we rotated, so one day you're on the ambulance, next day you might be on the heavy-duty rescue squad, ladder, truck, or the engine. Uh, so you had to be certified in everything, uh, which was nice. Did you see any fires? A lot. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and during that, I guess, what did, did you have a specific, specific uh, task there that you were tasked to, uh, either the hose or the ladder or anything like that? No, like I said, we rotated, but in addition to that, there's specialty teams. There's a photo unit that I belong to, uh, technical rescue. That's anything from confined space to high angle, going off a water tower, um, uh, below grade, things like that. And I was also on the hazardous materials team for the division. Now, in addition to the firefighting, did you also have some certificates from FEMA? If you explain what those are. Yes. Uh, 
I had the basic FEMA certifications, the NIMS training, and then also I became certified as a uh, FEMA certified uh, safety officer. And that was for the urban search and rescue team. Uh, Illinois has a team, um, and I was part of that as well, which I was deployed to Katrina for that. And did you actually go down uh, to New Orleans for Katrina? Yes, it was a two-week deployment. Um, was, uh, we had, I believe, a, the first deployment was 100 piece apparatus and maybe a thousand firefighters. I could be wrong, or that was two deployments. But we stayed for two weeks. I remember getting there and it was very nasty and my wife called me on the phone and she was all upset the dishwasher broke, but I'm looking at water at top of roofs. Yeah. Like <laughs> and, the, and the Superdome. Um, did uh, you do the search and rescue job there? Is that what you were tasked to? The state of Illinois went down there for humanitarian services to help out New Orleans Fire Department. Mm -hmm. uh, all their fire departments were non-functional at the time, so we helped get them functional. And then we also had different teams, uh, hazmat teams, uh, firefighting. So yes, I was a, uh, I was fortunate to be able to join up with FDNY from New York and fight fires. And then next day you might be doing decon, you know, for hazmat things like that. Sure. And then we also uh, did humanitarian. We tried to get the firefighter and police officers' homes back in operation for them to come back and live. So in 2001, you were uh, promoted to deputy fire chief. Is that yeah. right? Yeah. Prior to that, I was uh, a lieutenant, mm -hmm. uh, 1998 to 2001. So, uh, yeah, uh, on the shift, there was a captain and lieutenant. Um, There'd be lieutenant? one officer on the truck company, one on the uh, engine company. What did a lieutenant do? Dealt with a lot of problems. No, <laughs> uh, no, it was a great job. Uh, you overseeing your crew. Uh, like I said, you could have been on the truck company or the uh, engine, and uh, you manage a small crew when you go to a fire. All right. And so um, did you... Uh in that same period of time, 2001, become involved in 9-11? Uh, we did go to 9-11. Uh, at first, we were going to be deployed immediately. We had to run home, get clothes. I signed a bunch of checks. Uh, I was raising my daughter on my own, my oldest daughter at the time. So I went to her school to say goodbye to her. Uh, and then, like I said, I filled out a bunch of checks because I didn't know when I was going to come home. Uh, we went for a briefing near O'Hare Airport, and at that time they told us stand down because they were worried the potential of Chicago getting hit. So Needed you back home? Yes. So um, several weeks after that, uh, we started sending crews to New York, and that was more for humanitarian services as well. Um, so, yeah, we went to all the uh, memorials and things like that. So then from lieutenant, you became deputy fire chief. Is that right? That was in 2001, yes. All right. mm -hmm. And did you ever uh, do anything in addition to going to 911 in terms of raising money for 911 firefighters and, and police officers? Judge, object to the relevance of a role. Uh, the first time we went to New York... Um, we were in front of a uh, rescue company, and there was a woman walking back and forth, and I kind of stuck my foot in my mouth. I asked her if she was waiting for somebody, and she stated her husband died. Uh -huh. uh, she started talking about the kids, how the kids are not being able to handle it. They're pulling their eyelashes out and that. And at that point, it goes to something right now. Let's get there, because right. this really is borderline. Okay. At that point, I felt the kids were not being taken care of. So I ended up uh, going back to Illinois. I designed license plates for the state um, to raise money. So I made one for New York, and we went back with lots of money and called it Dad for a day and made sure that we took care of the kids. So tell the jury... Uh, 
a little bit then about how old you were when you met Beata. I would expect that. Before we get into that, uh, uh, when did you leave the fire department to move down here? I left uh, in 2014. That was the summer, uh, right before the children would start school here. And then, uh, so you retired in, in 2014? Yes, after 28 and a half years. And so what brought you to Florida? The weather, uh, to be able to be outside with the kids, do more. Uh, my wife and I, we do scuba diving. Uh, we traveled all over for that. And we just thought it would be a great place to come. Uh, she was able to transfer, so it made it easier. Well, let's talk about that a little bit. Uh, do you remember meeting Beata? I do. Um, like I stated, I uh, raised my daughter on my own, my oldest daughter. Um, my neighbors asked me to go out to dinner with them, and I was cutting the grass, and I told them no, and then they finally talked me into it. We are having dinner, and in walked this girl, and that was it. I, I knew she was it. I I take it you were introduced. Yes, uh, one of the firefighters' wives is also a nurse, and uh, they came in for, uh, it was like a drug, a drug rep, pharmaceutical rep. They had a back room, and they were doing a uh, little talk on that. Sure. Um, and so how long was it before you were married? It wasn't long. but uh, How long was the romance before marriage? I don't recall, but it was real quick. A matter of months? Pardon me? A matter of months? Yes, yes. All right. So what did you and Beata like to do after you, uh, after you, well, before and after you were married, although that was only a few months? Uh, we built a house. Uh, we tore the house that I had on the property. Um, we built a, a house for us in, within three months. And then uh, after that, it was planning on having a child. Okay. And uh, did you have any hobbies or things at this point in, in common you like to do? I made uh, wine, so she kind of liked that as well because she enjoyed her wine. What was that? The wine. Oh, making the wine. The wine, yes. We'll get to the wine in a moment. Yeah, And then the scuba diving. We okay. went all over scuba diving. And I think we have a photograph with the court's permission, 2528-1. That would not be it. That's not an evidence check. It's 2-28-21. Two 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 Remember this trip? I do. Where was this? I believe that was uh, Belize. Did you take uh, just that one trip, or did you have other scuba trips? Uh, we did uh, several. Belize, Honduras, Mexico... Um, was she certified? Yes, she was an advanced diver. And how were you at that time? Just uh, basic. Okay. And did you enjoy these times with your wife? This was a great time. I really enjoyed it. Like I said, I was raising my oldest daughter on my own. It's been a while since I had a relationship, and I knew she was the person to be with. Okay. And we do have one wedding photo at 2528-14. We can get that relatively quickly. Where are we all married? We had a uh, cruise ship. Uh, we went on a cruise and we ended up getting married in Montego Bay, Jamaica. And then the family wasn't happy. We did that, so we had to have another wedding afterwards. Two? Yes. So tell us a little bit about Beata. We want to know what kind of person she was. Beata, she, uh, at that time, she was working for Loyola University Medical Center. She was working in the cath lab. Uh, she was extremely dedicated to her job there. Uh, Loyola is a very big hospital. It's probably on a mile-long property. It's huge. What, was uh, her, what did her job entail? She worked within the cath lab, you know. Catheters? Yes. Did she work at that job the entire time you were in Chicago? 
Uh, after Maya was born, or around that time, she worked for Walgreens. And it basically the same thing as with CVS, uh, doing the infusion treatments. Now, was, um, Ma, was uh, Beata a uh, kind of a retiring type, or was she more outgoing? How would you describe the personality there? Beata was always on her feet, always looking to do better, mm -hmm. uh, not only for her, but everybody else around her. An overachiever a bit? By far. All right. To try to keep up with her, it's impossible. And, and she was uh, originally from where? Uh, I'm going to say it wrong, but uh, Stola Wola, Poland. Okay. She and it, uh, came over at, at the age of 16, I believe. And did that, from what you saw, influence her insofar as the way she dealt, dealt with things, the fact that she had come over prior to Poland becoming free? I know she, you know, she told stories how rough it was in Poland. Um, you know, you don't go to Walmart and buy a pillow. You have to make your own pillow, pull the goose feathers out and make your own. Uh, same with groceries, things like that. A lot of it was farming. And uh, so uh, I, it's a lot rougher. Uh, when she came here, she came without speaking English. She learned. And she started out in a high school, I believe, in Chicago. And it was difficult for her. But she's... She's very determined, and uh, after high school, she went to college. Uh, her professor said she's not going to make it, and she ended up being the first in her class. Uh, she did learn. She was determined. Do you know what her uh, what, what her uh, dip uh, no, uh, diploma was? Her degree is. What? She did have an associates, uh, mm -hmm. Marine Valley, I believe it was, and then a bachelor's, and that was. Uh, Oh, now I'm going to go uh, Lewis University. That's in Aurora, Rockford. I could be wrong. And was her income helpful to the family? By far, yes. And she, uh, after I retired, she carried the health insurance. Um, and I assume that was a fairly big help. Yes. So now, uh, were you Roman Catholic when you met her? I was not, um, but I did... Go the through the, the classes and then became Catholic. And she was Roman Catholic? Yes, she was. Polish Roman Catholic? Yes. Very Roman Catholic? Very. And uh, did you go to church uh, every weekend? We went pretty much every weekend. Uh, in addition to, uh, you know, when the kids were born, they went to Polish school. Uh, here, when they were here, they went to Sunday school after the Mass. Um, so was she close with, say, the parish priests, people like that? Yes. Stayed involved in the church? Yes, she stayed involved. We attended, you know, picnics, things like that, that they had. All right. Um, so the jury would probably like to know how Beata was if there was a dispute with an outside person, in this case these doctors. But just generally, what was she like? Was she... Uh, was it hard to get it out of her, or was she direct? What was she? Beata was unique. Um, I, I, you know, when she's right, she's 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 going to prove yeah she's right, and you, she is right. Um, a lot of times, you know, we had differences, and I found out I was wrong. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> not just saying that. Uh, a lot no, of husbands she, find that she, out regularly. Yeah, you know, she stands up if she feels she's right. She's gonna. She's going to stick to her guns on it. Right. And do you think that the, from what you saw, her background in Poland made her more direct than, than um, the American way? I believe so, yes. Can you give us any examples where she would, uh, people would, would wonder, like, is she mad or angry, but she's actually just being Polish-American? Yeah, it, that's, that's the hardest thing, you know, when I first started out dating her. Um, they say things different, and sometimes they're more blunt than we are. Mm -hmm. uh, after time, I learned that she's not trying to be rude, things like that, but uh, it, it does come out differently, yes. And did there come a time that you had a child? 
We did. Um, we had difficulty. Uh, we did the in vitro, mm -hmm. and uh, it took some time, but then we ended up having little Maya. And uh, when she was pregnant, that's when I was deployed to Katrina. So. <laughs> I'm sure she appreciated that, you being gone for the first. I think she appreciated dishwasher being fixed <laughs> after that. All right. So... Um, Maya then was from an in vitro infusion? Yes. And was that uh, a, an expensive event to do? It took some time uh, expense. I honestly don't recall what it cost, but... It takes some effort? It took some effort, yes. And so did Beata express uh, a need or want to have children with you? She before? wanted a child very bad. And uh, before I even left to Katrina, that room was decorated. I bet you every shelf in that closet had baby clothes to whatever. And so then uh, there come a time when you had a second child. Yeah, Kyle was a stroke of luck. He just came out of nowhere. Um, I remember walking into the house. Beata was at the little table in the kitchen crying and laughing at the same time. I go, what's wrong? She goes, you don't want to know. And I said, you lost your job. She goes, worse. And she goes, I'm pregnant. So. <laughs> but uh, we got Kyle. Right. Now, was there something that indi might indicate to the jury uh, Beata's determination in terms of having Kyle? Well, Kyle, after he uh, was born, he was born in Elmhurst Hospital, which was in our town that we lived in. Uh, he was born with petechiae. That's, he had little dots all over him. And uh, the doctor seemed very concerned. And uh, after a little bit of time, they stated that he needed to be transported to Loyola University Medical Center to the PICU. He had a condition called uh, neonatal thrombocytopenia, common spelling, I guess. <laughs> um, it's no platelets in the blood. So... He had to be transferred uh, to Loyola, and mom could not be transferred because she's no longer, you know, she's not a patient at Loyola. She just delivered a baby, and she checked herself out of the out of the hospital to be with her child. How uh, how long was this after ha giving birth that she checked herself out? I'm guessing less than two hours. And so, what did she do then? She went to Loyola with Kyle yeah. and us. Um, did she do anything to help? She, no, she laid baby? on the couch at first, you know, and while Kyle was being assessed and treated. Um, they originally gave Kyle donor platelets, which he would take them for some time, and then he, his body would reject them. Um, it was like washing out a soapy bottle. It's going to take time. But the donor platelets weren't taking and he needed moms, and mom just gave birth. So that was an issue, and uh, finally there was an agreement that she could give the platelets, but unfortunately that wasn't at Loyola. We had to go up in the northern suburbs, I believe Northbrook, which was about an hour away, and then she would get, her plate, get the platelets taken out of her, and they had to radiate them and then bring them back to Loyola to Kyle. And this was all within a few days of his birth? A few days. And uh, this went quite a while um, because, like I said, it takes a while for him to accept them. Um, he did accept them, and then he was released. And he came home, and Beata knew something wasn't right, and she called the hospital, and they admitted they read the platelet counts wrong and uh, he had to go back. So he was admitted for about a month in the whole span. Was uh, Beata protective over her children? Extremely. She, that, was her, that was her life, was those two children there, including my oldest daughter. Now, was she involved in uh, any activities for uh, Maya and Kyle? Beata would work out every single day. I mean, and then we started dance classes, things like that, to, you know, before the wedding. Did Maya start uh, 
put it this way, did, were there skill sets, sports and things that Beata knew of or had done that she was teaching to the children? Uh, number one would have been the Polish language. And mm -hmm. then they went to Polish school. They learned, you know, the, the, the history uh, along with, I don't think they did handwriting or anything, but they did speak, uh, they, they learned how to speak Polish. Are you still able to, or is everybody able to speak Polish still? Is it I believe well, Kyle lost it. Maya still knows quite a bit, um, not as good as she was. Mm -hmm. And what about uh, Maya beginning and Kyle in different sports and activities? Was Beata supportive of that? Very supportive. They both, uh, number one, they both went to school before the age of five. They went to the public school for a special program at the age of three. Um, and that's probably why they're so smart. But uh, <laughs> and so, they did piano uh -huh. at the age of three. They were involved in gymnastics. I believe she was in ballet as well. But uh, there was, they were always active. So ballet gymnastics and piano, and would Beata uh, take them to these different activities? Yes, them? and I completely forgot about another one. It was ice skating. That's right. I understand uh, Maya tried ice skating once she was able to get out of the wheelchair. It did not last very long. No, I think it was just too much. Um, you know, it, she was ice skating and working out. Um, she wanted to go back to ice skating because her mother did skating as well. I think she just wanted to continue it for her mom. Did she have a hard time with it after a while in terms of the emotional impact? Yes, there was some emotional issues with that. This was an activity she did with her mom, so. That's correct. Now, um, there came a time then uh, when Maya got sick. Is that right? Yes. Okay. The jury's heard a little bit about this, but why don't you tell them from your perspective what happened that weekend of July 3rd, 4th? Yeah, and if we could, Judge, we'd like to uh, publish our timeline that, uh, as a demonstrative aid we provided at the council. You have it? Yeah, it's good. Publish it. Um, we're not entering it into evidence. It's the same timeline. It's the same. Yeah, that's fine. This transcript will just put it on the screen. Yes. That's time. No objections. Just the timeline. Just yeah. So keep the jury oriented here. All right, so um, tell us about now, did before July 3rd, 4th, had Maya already been to Johns Hopkins once on June 16th, 2015? Yes, originally she went to a doctor's hospital mm -hmm. uh, for asthma complications. Uh, and I believe doctors do not hold pediatrics overnight. I could be wrong on that. Um, so they were going to airlift her to Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital. The weather was bad that day, so they just did a ground transport. That may have been after July 4th. I was looking at the, uh, the June 2015. Before. This was June 16th. Okay, that was the June 16th? Yes. All right, my mistake. All right, and this was for, again, her asthma? Severe cough, bronchial spasms. Now, generally speaking, as the kids grew, were growing up, uh, were they healthy? They were healthy. Um, Maya has seasonal allergies. Uh, most of us do. But uh, she always seemed the allergies bothered her a little more. She would have the little, you know, around the eyes and that. Um, she did have asthma. She was diagnosed, I believe, at Lurie's Children's. Uh, it was a satellite in Westchester, Illinois. Um, but didn't have too many complications. She did have croup. 
here and there. Mm -hmm. A lot of times I would put her in the car to take her to the ER, and up north the cold weather helps the croup. So by the time I got there, it would be gone. But Did, uh, did that uh, keep Maya down from any of her activities? Or was it... At that you, time, no. Um, you know, she was gymnastics, you know, um, ice skating, everything like that. But, uh, you know, she did have allergies. Other than the allergies and asthma, was it just typical childhood illnesses? And not much other than that. Yes. And Kyle as well? Kyle, healthy as well. He has seasonal allergies. I don't think it bothers him as much. Mm -hmm. All right. And so now let's get to uh, that weekend of July 3rd and 4th. And I believe the jury's seen some photographs and maybe a movie of that. But uh, can you tell the jury the first time you thought or saw or heard that Maya was in trouble? Well, she was having, in between that June 16th and up to July 4th, she was having quite a bit of asthma problems or a weird cough, mm -hmm. which wasn't the cough we used to hear. So it was kind of alarming to us. But, uh, yeah, in between that time, she did visit different ERs uh, uh, for that condition. All right. So by the time of uh, July 4th weekend, she had been in uh, one outpatient and one inpatient at Johns Hopkins? Yes. All right. So tell the jury what happened then on that July 3rd, July 4th weekend. So we have a neighborhood, as you've seen, I think, the picture. We have a neighborhood bike parade for the children and then uh, also a party afterwards. Um, she was riding her bike in the morning, no problems whatsoever. And then at that, uh, later that evening, uh, she was having a problem with asthma. There was some sparklers the kids were playing with. We cannot pinpoint if that's what triggered it or not, but... Uh, um, so Beata took her to the emergency room, to Sarasota Memorial. All right. Uh, this was on what day? That was July 4th, I believe. Okay. Were you there then for the episode with her on the floor that's been testified to, uh, the scream? Yeah. Unfortunately, we were the ones hosting uh, the party right. that year. Um, so, yeah, everything became chaotic and Seeing her in that pain, we knew something wasn't right. You know, it wasn't something we'd seen before. She was in more pain than that. Uh, well, were you present or not present for the, the this the sound that uh, witnesses have testified to? I, at a certain point, I was, but I don't recall being there in there when it first happened. Uh, I may have been outside at first and then was notified and came in. Well, describe Maya's condition after this. Was she calm, cool, collected, or was she acting out? What was going on? Um, there was, like I said, it was a weird cough, and she was uh, also, I believe, there was chest pain with it. Mm -hmm. And so you then took her to the emergency room? Uh, Beata took her to the emergency room, and then I was home trying to get everything shut down or taken care of. Okay. And you were worried at that time, were you? Yes, I was worried every time she went in. All right. So on July 11th, 2015, uh, did, uh, was Maya admitted to Johns Hopkins? Or July 6th? July 6th, yes. yes. July 11th. All right. Yeah, this was a uh, admission of uh, July 6th to July 11th. Okay. And over that period of time, did anyone at uh, Johns Hopkins ever raise any issues or concerns about your relationship to Maya or Kyle, like that they were troubled? No, not at all. Did anyone ever doubt either Maya or your Beata's description of what was happening with her? No. So then Maya came out, and then there was a second admission on July 15th. Tell us how that happened. Uh, July 17th. 17th. That, was, that was my birthday. Okay. Happy birthday. And yeah. what happened, if anything? Uh, she was admitted again. Um, 
that uh, Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital. That was for um, difficulty breathing, I believe. And then she also had acute pain all over, which was something that we didn't experience before. I, um, I believe she was diagnosed with uh, myopathy or uh, due to the steroids. Okay. Uh, let's, uh, if we can, it's in evidence as 1008-002. So what was the uh, diagnosis here, I believe, as you just testified to? Yeah, generalized, I'm sorry, generalized pain, mm -hmm. myopathy, Weakness or fatigue. Okay. And it's got the names of some of the doctors up there. And uh, from your memory, did you get along? You wouldn't be able to get along well with the doctors there? I don't recall any problems. Okay. Um, and then let me show you um, Joint Exhibit 1008-0003. Again, this is uh, in evidence as part of the records. And I'll direct you then to the second paragraph there where it says presented as soon as it comes up. Okay. So if you would, uh, take a look at this. And if it refreshes your recollection, can you tell the jury what happened then while she was in uh, Johns Hopkins? The 17th. Second paragraph. Second paragraph. Uh, she had acute increased pain, in pain, I'm sorry, everywhere, mm -hmm. and mainly muscles. Okay. Over the past six days since discharge has been stable. Pain uh, and weak weakness have been constant. Well, um, it says, ha but had been able to sit in a wheelchair uh, and something there. Um, before this time, was she even having difficulty sitting in the wheelchair? She had one, diff, uh, one time she came back from the emergency room, she had weakness where Beata had to carry her into the home. But the next day she was able to, to get up, okay. I believe. Well, did she end up leaving Johns Hopkins on this admission in a wheelchair? Um, I'm sorry, there's so many roller coaster rides we were on here. I'm sorry. I believe she was in a wheelchair at this time. Okay. Uh, so let me also ask a little bit about um, the consultations while you were there on Joint Exhibit 1008-0004. Okay. And if you look at the first full paragraph about five lines down, All right, and so tell us what's going on here. Excuse me. Uh, she's she's in pain. Well, what are they prescribing for that pain? I I'm gonna really. Did bad they, with these names. Let me ask you this. Toradol, right. yeah, oxycodone, mm -hmm. Valium. All right. And uh, was this able to control the pain, or was she Not still in, in pain? As you go right Inject, after that. Inject, um, it's, uh, lack of foundation and predicate. Overall. Did this control her pain, or was she still in pain? No, after, as if you continue to read right after the highlighted area, over the course of her stay, uh, it was increased. So it, it obviously, no. And I, I remember something distinctly from when she was being discharged, or right prior to discharge. Um, there was a doctor wheeling her little computer and having, I guess, students following her. And she came up to me, and she honestly, this she put her arms up in the air. She goes, "I don't know what's wrong with her, but we could give her pain medication." And I said, "No, that's not acceptable." And that's when we decided to go somewhere else. All right. 
So <coughs> it says the patient was discharged uh, PO with Valium, oxycodone, Tylenol, ibu- ibuprofen for pain control uh, after extended discussion with the parents and previous outpatient provider in <coughs> Chicago. The, 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 who was the outpatient, previous outpatient provider in Chicago? The outpatient previous? Well, was this Lurie's? Oh, she was going to go to Lurie's Children's Hospital in Chicago. Okay. That's where we grew up, uh, so we were not familiar with this area. Okay. Now, um, if you look at 1008 006, um, I want you to just count up the number of medications that she was prescribed there. The objection. Again, record speaks for itself. Also, it doesn't say the number. Overall. Under prescriptions? Yep. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. 15 on this page. Okay. I, I could be wrong. All right. And so why Lurie's? Why did you want to go back to Lurie's? Like I stated, uh, we're newbies here in Florida. Uh, we went to Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital. The name, you know, it's a big name hospital. We thought we would get the answers there. Unfortunately, we did not. Uh, so we went back uh Maya and Beata, uh, they flew back to Chicago to go to Chicago Leary's. Now, before anybody said, we don't know what this is, uh, did you ever hear anyone questioning Maya's pain or your concerns over it? What was this? Did anyone at Johns Hopkins, up to the point of Leary's, ever mention anything about problem with either your treatment of uh, Maya or your um, relationship with Maya? No, there was no, nothing brought up about relationship. Um, We were concerned because we never seen a lot of these things that were going on, and it Mm -hmm. seemed like it was one thing after another, blurred vision or sensitivity to light, things like that. Uh, But uh, when I got the arms up in the air and stating that we don't know what it is, but we could give pain medication. That's not the answer we wanted. All right. And so um, what happened when you went up to Lurie's? Um, Beata and Maya flew there. Um, I called ahead of time, and uh, Chicago Fire Department, along with our fire department, met them at the airplane and took her off the plane. Um, they took her directly into Chicago, a fire chief waited for their luggage and brought it right after. But uh, she was went to Chicago Leary's. Was after. this an inpatient? I believe so, yes. And approximately how long was she there? Um, I think it was only, it was a short visit, I know that. A week uh, 21st so? through the 24th. There you go. Um, and over the course of this, did Leary's come to any conclusions beyond this uh, muscle pain I don't, I, it's such a short visit. I honestly do not know if they came up with a conclusion of what it was, but they recommended to go back to an inpatient rehab for Maya. So no solutions at this point? Uh, no, we're still undetermined of what's wrong with her. Now, had Maya started rehab, any kind of rehab by this point? Uh, she did go through... I I don't know if it was at that time if she was going to All Children's Satellite in uh, Sarasota. Mm -hmm. Uh, I could be wrong. It could be after. Honestly, there's just so much of this. I understand. All right. But in any event, what, if any, diagnoses can you recall that Lourdes came up with? Uh, They did not diagnose. Did they ever talk to you about any psychosocial problems while you were there? I was not there. So. Yeah, with Beata, this year. Beata was there. Um, I don't know if that's where 
this conversion disorder or fictitious disorder came from? I honestly don't know. Well, did any information come to you from any source to indicate that Lurie's had reached out and tried to explain why they went from not knowing what it is to uh, allegations of conversion? Yeah, I honestly don't know. Okay. So let's continue on then. After that week or so in Lurie's, um, and I guess she had been seeing uh, Dr. Wassenaar. Who is he? Dr. Wassenaar is our uh, primary care physician. He's, he's in Saras or Osprey, Florida. Okay. Um, can we move the um, slide to the next one, I believe? I can go to the October admission. Okay, sorry. Got to go to the October admission on the timeline. All right. So, there was, a, a, sorry to interrupt you, but there was also a, a visit with Dr. Nathan Tang. He was an allergist. That where? was uh, that was in St. Pete, and, what and that was July for? 29th. And what were you looking for there? Uh, just to, uh, that was in reference to the asthma. Were you looking for different doctors that were on your health insurance plan? Uh, a lot of it, that? yes. There, that was a big factor as well. So on October 20th, 2015, uh, was there another ER visit? October 2015? Uh, yes, October 20th, 2015, there, the uh, end of this. Yes, I do not have that listed on mine, but uh, yeah, that was. Take a look. Uh, I think. 1015? Yes, mm -hmm. 2015. Yes. All right. And so they went back, you went back to Johns Hopkins for what? An abdominal pain, uh, constipation, and then someone proposed RSD, reflex sympathetic dystrophy? Uh, that was, October, you said October 15th, I'm sorry. Yes, 10, 10, the 20th of October 2015. Okay. There. It's the yeah. last one on the top. Your Honor, yeah. we object if we could approach. Okay. Up, uh, 1014-0002. Okay, I'd like you to look down under uh, diagnoses. Um, what's under the, di the discharge diagnosis? Uh, what are they saying it was? 
abdominal pain. Yes, and under that? Reflex sympathetic dystrophy what and constipation. Really? I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. And what is uh, RSD in terms of CRPS? That's, that's the old name. Now it's CRPS, chronic regional pain syndrome. So effectively here on October 21st, 2015, Johns Hopkins is diagnosing reflex sympathetic dystrophy? Ob objection, uh, lack of foundation. This takes it's right here. Sustain, you got to do the foundation. For, I'm not sure for what he's talking about. Which well, part? I'm happy to say more if you'd like. I'll, com I'll continue. Um, let's take a look at uh, Joint Exhibit 1014-0003. And again, for the record, this is a Johns Hopkins discharge summary of our, uh, admission date, October 20th, discharge date, October 23rd. <coughs> and is this the narrative, to the best of your knowledge, from that stay for your daughter? Uh, objection, lack of foundation. What's the, what's the evidence? evidence? You can answer, sir. Yes. Thank you. I'm sorry. All right, if we look at the top line then, does it again reiterate uh, what their diagnosis was here? Same objection, lack of foundation. Overruled. Yes, it does. Reflex sympathetic dystrophy syndrome. Okay. And here she had, did she have some abdominal pain? Yes. So in terms of new symptoms on this October uh, 7th, 2016, the next year, that she had abdominal pain at that time as well? The one we're, we're about here? Uh, the first admission? Yeah, the, the one on October 7th that we're about here. Oh, October 7th, yes. All right. And so then um, it says there about three quarters of the way down, if you'll note, because of RSD symptoms, she has a lot of opiate treatments such that Maya takes more oxycodone and baseline. Mom ensures that she has her on Marilax. So from your knowledge, uh, were you familiar with the different medications that your daughter was taking? Sure, to the leading line. Overall. You can she, answer. She was on quite a bit of medications. And were those prescribed primarily by Johns Hopkins Ultra Lens Hospital? Lack of foundation. Overall. Most of them, yes. And so if we're talking about whether Maya, had Maya then uh, started to go through treatment regimens with opiates at this time? She was. All right. Um, now, it says on the bottom, neurological, unable to fully examine lower extremity at any time during hospitalization due to patient reluctance and complaints of hypersensitivity. I lightly touched her right knee one morning and she nearly jumped off the bed and began shaking and crying. First, let me ask you, over this time, have you become familiar with what the symptoms of CRPS are? We, uh, just prior to this, correct, is when we went to Dr. Kirkpatrick. What I'm saying is now, are you familiar? Yeah, oh, yes, yes. And, and what is this called when, uh, when somebody, when you're, you just jump off the bed or you jump out of the chair when there's a light touch. Uh, that, I believe, is called elodynia. And what other symptoms did she have at this point? She had, did she have blurred vision? Uh, <clears throat> hypersensitivity, light touch, her right knee in the morning, there he jumped out of bed, began shaking and crying. From the last visit, did it, uh, if you recall, did it state that she had blurred vision? I, I think you just testified. I to believe it. so. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So we've got extreme pain, blurred vision, and we have what did appear to you now, knowing what you know, uh, that the allodynia was appearing. Yes. Okay. At this point, had her legs, uh, ankles started to turn in, or are they still straight? I believe at that time they might have been dropping down. Kind of like that? Yes. Okay. All right. 
Um, but then says, I found this unusual. She's capable of moving her legs around under numerous heavy blankets without experiencing pain. Um, so tell the jury from what you know about allodynia, why that is significant or not significant. Well, there's, there's days that you, I mean, if you start approaching her, she'll retract from you. And then there's days that it doesn't really bother her as much. But uh, the allodynia, that was, it was very difficult. To, I remember Kyle trying to help her and her legs would just start to shake. I mean, it was bad. Okay. Now, prior to this date, uh, had you tried physical therapy at a hospital? What is, T what is Tampa General Hospital? Tampa General, we went there for a month admission, and that was for intense uh, physical uh, therapy. Uh, she was admitted for one month. So she actually went in-house for therapy? That is correct. And at that point, her arms were extremely weak. They worked on her arms to be able to groom and eat by herself. And then from there, they worked on the lower extremities. And the, her and the uh, jury's heard from the physical therapist there. But uh, did you visit her there? I was there as much as I could be. And did you observe your daughter there? I did. And was she in pain the times that you saw she her? She was in uh, pain. And then they made these boots for her to try to straighten her feet out. And... Uh, when those were placed on her feet, it was extremely painful. Um, <laughs> what was it like watching her? Doc was there was a doctor there, Dr. Kornberg. He said if he, she doesn't straighten her feet out, he's going to break them and straighten them out himself. Was and that, I'll never and, forget that when he said that. Well, did you take that in jest or did you take that as serious? That was, you don't, you don't joke like that. Not to a person in pain like that in the first place. Well, did they give you any additional alternatives other than, okay, we tried PT and that's not working? they give you any other things to do? Uh, we, we agreed to try the PT, you know, and we... More PT. Yeah, we, we were there for a month. And was it successful or not successful? Partially. Partially. Uh, did it help the upper, a little bit? The upper extremities, yes. So it did help on the yes. upper extremities. And did it help on the lower extremities? No. Unfortunately, it was getting worse. All right. And so uh, I can show this uh, if we need to, but it's at, uh, did I show 1014008? Zero, 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 Not yet. Huh? Not yet. All right. Let's show that. Okay. So in this last visit from Johns Hopkins, skipping ahead, um, it was, you know, if you count up here on the two pages, uh, does it indicate that there were 24 separate distinct medications or vitamin remedies that were prescribed for Maya when she left? Uh, right, oh, yeah, now I see 24, yes. And those include <coughs> oxycodone? Is it number uh, 19? Yes. And 11 diazepam, yes. which is Valium, right? Mm hmm And baclofen, what is that? Is that a muscle relaxant? I honestly couldn't tell you. Okay. But in any event, were they continuing now on the opiate physical therapy train in terms of treating your daughter? Yes. Object to the foundation speculation. <clears throat> All right. So now you've been to how many hospitals, including Johns Hopkins, to try to get this diagnosed? Quite a bit. And had you seen some outpatient providers here and there? Yes. Did anybody have any answers for you as to why your daughter had these reactions, different reactions than what the doctors expected? Up until that point, did any doctors? Uh, what was the last date on that? I'm sorry. Uh, I thought that was 1020 to uh, 1023. Yeah, so, October 20th to 21st. All right, 20th to 21st. Yeah, so prior to that, we did see Dr. Kirkpatrick. 
Okay. And uh, so let's talk a little bit about that. So how did you find Dr. Kirkpatrick? Beata was at a patient's home doing a, a treatment. Uh, the gentleman lived in Naples, Florida. Okay. So she would be given the treatment, and she received a phone call from uh, Tampa Captain General. Madam Court Report, can I have the specific question back? Question. So let's talk a little bit about that. So how did you find Dr. Kirkpatrick? Overruled. You can answer. So while she was there treating a patient, uh, she received a call from Tampa General Hospital. Bonnie Rice was the nurse practitioner. And she basically told Beata that Maya has conversion disorder or the fictitious disorder. I don't know which one. Beata was not pleased to hear that. Um, I'm sure she got a little vocal on the phone. Uh, the patient overheard it. So um, after she hung up with the nurse practitioner, the gentleman said, it sounds like your daughter has CRPS. And she's like, what is CRPS? She did not know. Uh, she came home, she did research, and then she did find Dr. Hanna. Uh, this patient that she was taking care of, his daughter was in Mexico with CRPS, getting treated. So how did you get to Dr. Kirkpatrick before Dr. Hanna? Which came first? Dr. Kirkpatrick was first. Um, she did research. Uh, she, she did uh, set up an appointment to have Maya evaluated. Uh, I went with her. Um, that was in Tampa. Um, he did a pretty thorough um, evaluation. Was that videotaped? Uh, yes, it was. Yeah, regardless of the videotape, can you give an idea to the jury about how far your daughter at that point could lift her arm? She did not have much motion in her arms to raise them up high without being in pain. Uh, she did have more dystonia. That's the turning of the feet. Uh, there was allodynia. That's the sensitivity, the touching. Uh, she had some other weird things going on, temperature differences. I had no clue that, you know, that all this was going, you know, some of that. The nails, uh, some of the hair, I guess the growth of the hair was different. But he was asking questions, and it's like, yeah, you know, it's the first time we're hearing somebody ask us questions, and it seemed like he was on to something. Um, it made sense to you? Yes. Uh, we were somewhat relieved to get a diagnosis, but also extremely sad. Um, it's a diagnosis that we have to live with the rest of our life. So he informed you of the basics of CRPS? Yes. All right. And so um, at first then, what did Dr. Kirkpatrick prescribe? Did he go straight to ketamine or did he go to a one, another treatment first? I think there was some exercising. Um, we did pool therapy. Uh, right away when he recommended the pool therapy, we do have a pool at home. Uh, it is heated by the solar panels on the roof. But we added extra panels to make sure that it was, it had to be at a certain temperature range. It's like a bathtub, basically. Is this known as warm water therapy? Yes. And so he wanted more warm water therapy as PT? Yes. So and, and only, a, he limited it to a certain amount of time, not to exceed a certain amount of time each day. So he did not go immediately to ketamine. He tried what? you'd had before, or had you had warm water therapy before? Just to believe, Your Honor. I don't believe we had. Hang on, I'll rephrase. Oh, sorry. Had you had warm water therapy prescribed for you before this? I don't believe at that time, no. And was this his first treatment before he went to medications? I believe that's the first treatment. All right. And so by this point, uh, it doesn't need to be exactly accurate, but can you tell me about how many different weeks how many times your daughter had been to physical therapy for this problem by this point? You know, uh, physical therapy at that time, we had to be careful. We couldn't, you know, overdo it. And we had to do it, you know, slowly. And, um, but I honestly do not remember the amount of time. You'd been at Tampa General for four weeks? That was a whole month, yes. A whole month. 
And you had had some PT at Johns Hopkins, different point? Yes, that was at the satellite office in Sarasota, I think on Clark, I could be wrong. And you'd been to Lurie's, and they had PT as part, as part of it, did they? Lurie's, I, I couldn't answer to that. I do not recall that. So at least four or five yes. weeks of PT? Yes, and including at home. And I believe physical agility at that time was, we were with them as well. That's in Venice. I want to talk for a moment about Maya's pain. And I want you to tell the jury how you know when your daughter's in pain. Being in the house and hearing your kid screaming 24-7, there's nothing that we could do. Was um, she... Was this every night at this point? It was most mostly throughout the day and night. Um, after hearing that Bonnie Rice saying it's conversion disorder, this child was screaming and crying. If she took a shower, the droplets of the water would make her scream. You put a sheet over her legs, it, she would scream. She had to be assisted on the toilet, and she would scream. She'd look out the window, see her friends playing, and you knew that she's not faking this. Did I ever think she was faking at first? It was like a light switch where, you know, all of a sudden everything changed. It's like, it's, it's, it is just so unbelievable that something could happen that quick. Did they ever figure out if it was uh, a... Uh ankle sprain from gymnastics or the the asthma that was a precipitating event? We never determined what it was, but prior to this, I believe it was April, May, uh, she was in gymnastics at the uh, YMCA in Venice. Mm -hmm. uh, she did have a right ankle injury. It was like a sprain or strain. Uh, they called and asked if we wanted to be, you know, have it followed up by a doctor. They were very good about it. They were concerned about her. But in time, it went away. But uh, we it. cannot pinpoint that injury on it. Where was everybody sleeping in this uh, period of time from uh, once it got worse after July 4th of 2015 up to this point, you know, the, the fall, early fall of 2015? Honestly, it didn't matter where you're sleeping in the house. Mm -hmm. You could hear her. Uh, we took turns uh, taking care of her. Uh, Beato is still working. Uh, she's the one that maintained our health care insurance, so we, you know, we had to switch off. Um, it was very difficult, extremely difficult. Poor Kyle's close to her room. Uh, I'm sure it interfered with his sleep as well, and he's going to school. All right. And so um, you went to Dr. Kirkpatrick, and there was uh, he prescribed some physical therapy again, this time water. What was the next step? Uh, she, sorry, before that, can you tell the jury whether Maya, by temperament, is was a child that would make a mountain out of a molehill, you know, scream a lot louder for just a little thing, or no. is she more on the stoic a side? Absolutely not. Uh, I'm, they're just like me. I could tolerate pain, but. When I had a kidney stone, that's what kicked my butt, you know, and uh, I'm sure that's what she felt like, if not worse, you know. It, and, uh, and and the from just her facial expression, uh, can you always tell she's in pain or does she hide it well? She would try to hide it and uh, I don't know if Dr. Chopra is the one that mentioned it, but there's there's ups and downs with that, where it could be extreme for some time, and then there's times where it's not as severe. Um, you could see her face. You knew she had pain. Are there days when she doesn't look like she's having pain, but she is? Uh, yes, and in fact, we were in church several times where we had to leave. You know, it, it bothered her that much. Do you have any explanation for why somebody would put down in 
the Tampa General documents or Lori's documents, this idea that it was all in her head uh, when you had all of these instances you brought to their attention? Objection calls for speculation. Sustained. What, if any, mention did they make to you up until Bonnie Rice uh, that th that you should consider that Maya was uh, making this up? Did, or did they not talk to you? Objection to the lack of foundation. Overruled. You can answer that. <clears throat> I'm sorry. Can you repeat that? <laughs> sure, sure. Other than Bonnie Rice calling you and telling you, did any doctor there uh, before Dr. Kirkpatrick in this period ever uh, set you and be out of down and explain why they thought it, or was this just a diagnosis you discovered? Nobody ever sat us down. Did you sense frustration at all, or whatever emotion, from the doctor's inability to identify what was wrong with Maya? Objection calls for speculation. Sustained. What, if any, reactions did you note if you uh, brought up the pain your daughter was having with the different doctors and nurses? We brought it up, but they had no answers. Um, and through looking at their face and their mannerisms, did they were they frustrated? Do they appear frustrated with this? Objection calls for speculation. I'm Overruled on that one. Well, like I said before, you know, the doctor holding their hands up and saying, "We don't know what it is, but we could give pain medication." Uh, was that was that concerning to you? It and was PA? very concerning, and that's why we left. Did not want. Did you we want your daughter? Did you want your daughter on opioids, or did you not no, want your daughter? No, on we want whatever's wrong with her taken care of correctly. All right then. So I want you to then, uh, considering the PT and opiate therapy to this point, I want you to explain to the jury when and how you learned about ketamine. Uh, that was with. The consultation with uh, Dr. Kirkpatrick, Anthony Kirkpatrick in Tampa. And if you recall, what did he tell you about that? He explained the procedure. Uh, he talked about, you know, um, it's been around for quite a long time. You know, he mentioned that it's used for many things. It's safe. Um, uh, there it is. The side effect when they're coming out of it is a hallucination for a short period of time, but then they come, you know, everything's back to normal. Did he explain that that was generally controlled by another med like uh, Presidex or others? To I'm overruled on that one. Did he explain at that time that uh, hallucinations could be suppressed or controlled with the use of other medications? I don't recall, to be honest with you. Well, that's not uh, he, your did, he did give us a website to look at also for in another literature. Uh, once again, I wouldn't expect Bia to go put out a house fire, and I, won't, I don't want to be a nurse, so right. uh, that was in her part. So how is this affecting Viata now before Dr. Kirkpatrick? Was there a, uh, what, 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 was, what, what was her sense about it? Viata was looking for the answer. Um, she knew there was nothing wrong with Maya's head. Uh, you know your child. Um, the child's not going to all of a sudden just decide I'm going to fake this and not play with my friends outside and, you know, just sit around and watch your body uh, deteriorate. Um, Along with that, you don't put lesions on your body by yourself as well. When I mean, do those start? Uh, I don't recall exactly when, but uh, um, that that was another sign of the CRPS. Mr. Anderson, in the next five to ten minutes, can you find us a good landing spot for a break? Yes, sir. I'm just going to finish up with Dr. K and we'll be done. Five to ten minutes. Dr. K? Dr. Kirkpatrick. Oh, I thought you meant me. <laughs> <laughs> I'll refer to you as doctor from here on out. <laughs> All right. So uh, what we'd like to know now is did Beata start asking questions of Dr. Kirkpatrick of uh, the specifics about the safety of this before uh, the, the whole procedure, before uh, she gave her blessings to it? Beata is very thorough. She... Uh... 
she'll ask many, many questions and she won't stay there. You know, she'll research more mm -hmm. and what she did. Uh, she, I believe, asked about who's going to be in the room, who's going to be doing this, what if, you know, a lot of questions. Uh, she's very concerned. It's not like, go ahead and do it. Uh -huh. And, uh, you know, he, he's very knowledgeable. And uh, that's the first person that we were able to get good answers and a good diagnosis. And so did you press forward with a ketamine treatment? Yes. Tell us how that went. Um, originally, I, um, well, he, he told us how it's going to be. She's going to get the treatment. She will hallucinate during that time. Um, you know, sometimes some patient may uh, do better than others. Mm -hmm. um, she, we did see some improvement, but unfortunately it wasn't the, the lucky one to, to have better improvements. Did the symptoms uh, reside... Uh, reduce in any way or was this just yes they did and uh, I forgot how many treatments she had I honestly don't remember but uh, it did help and we did you know what it was here we're on that roller coaster and finally we're climbing up and feeling good but then unfortunately at some time we took that big dip again right um, and so after uh, the series of in, uh, infusions that she'd had with Dr. K. Um, did he make further recommendations? Yeah, there was, you know, there was uh, still we're doing PT as, as much as we could. Um, but then at one point, uh, he stated that, uh, or stated, he, he had, uh, recommended that we go to Monterey, Mexico to see Dr. Cantu. Uh, he does a procedure there. And did he explain why? The reasoning was in the States, you're only allowed to do a certain level, um, and it's not FDA approved. And then... Uh, the procedure. Yes. Right. So we had to go to Mexico. Um, he did, in detail, once again, explain the process. Uh, the ups and downs with it, you know, and uh, um, we looked at, uh, once again, Beata not saying, okay, let's go. It was research. Um, and unfortunately, during this whole time, Beata would be running around doing all this, doing her work, and also going home at night to late, late at night doing research. And then in the evening with Maya... Yes. Taking care of her. We can pause here if you'd like, Judge. Okay. Uh, members of the jury, why don't we take an afternoon break? Let's try to keep this about 10 minutes. Let's try. Uh, please do not discuss this case amongst yourselves. Do not do any investigation and receive no information about the case. Have a good All break. Rise. Juries out of our presence. Are there any issues we need to address before we go on our break? The defense, Your Honor. Not that we're aware of. Okay, okay, so let's try to keep it to 10 minutes, folks. We'll be in recess.
issues before we uh, continue. And how lo much longer do you think your direct is going to be? I believe, Judge, I have at least 45 minutes and maybe an hour. But, uh, you know, it, it just depends on how fast we get through the questions. And I sometimes it's going real fast and sometimes it's rather slow. Is there a particular stopping point you want me to look at? Well, I was just, I'm assuming probably cross is going to be tomorrow as opposed to today. Yes, sir. Well, at that point, yes, sir. Uh, Judge, we are, because I am definitely calling him back, can we postpone the cross until no. after the second one? No. All right. Got to ask. <laughs> Let's bring in the jury. Everyone, please be seated. Members of the jury, I want to confirm while you're away, you did not discuss this case amongst yourselves. You did no investigation. You received no information. Is that all correct? Correct. And since uh, you went on that uh, break, uh, has anyone approached you about the case? And have you seen any media accounts since you were last with us? No. You love my questions, don't you? <laughs> Mr. Anderson, you may continue. Let's uh, bring up that timeline. Um, around this period of time, after Dr. Kirkpatrick had uh, had to start the ketamine infusions, did there come a time that you went into Johns Hopkins to have what's known as a PIC line installed? That is correct. And this was in the fall of 2016? Yes, somewhere around this. And tell the jury, best of your knowledge, what a PIC line is. What the, was it a procedure? Yes, it's a procedure. I believe it's a long 
it it goes into the the vein or the artery. I honestly. I okay, know. and so did you have to check her in for this? Was yes. she admitted? Yes. And do you know how long she was in? No, I honestly do not. And the medical records, you explained that the PICC line was for these ketamine infusions? That is correct. And did you explain in the history that this was due to CRPS, she was having ketamine infusions? Yes, I would have received the whole history of why it was needed. And did you, after that, or as part of that, did anyone from Johns Hopkins come to you and challenge you about either the diagnosis of CRPS? Objective of leading her. Sustained. What, if anything, did you hear from Johns Hopkins about protesting, saying she didn't have CRPS during the PICC line admission? Nothing. What, if anything, did they say about conversion disorder during the PICC line admission? Nothing. What, if anything, did they say about any uh, issues that Maya, it may be all in her head during the PICC line procedure? Nothing admission. Okay. And also during this period of time, um, did you have a chance to go in and see a pulmonologist at uh, Johns Hopkins called, uh, or not called, named Dr. Kreisman, Anthony Kreisman? I did not. I believe Beata did. Okay. And have you ever learned that in that uh, the upcoming trip to Mexico was related to them? Objection leading. Overruled on that one. <coughs> yes, uh, it was for the upcoming, and she also uh, had a cons uh, consult at uh, Eagle Wings as well. I was just getting upcoming. to that. Okay. okay. Sorry. All right. No, Didn't mean absolutely. That. All right, so let's talk about e Eagle Wings. Do you remember approximately the time you started? What is Eagle Wings so the jury knows? Eagle Wings is uh, a company in uh, Venice. It's for counseling. Therapists or psychologists? What was it? I honestly do not know their titles, mm -hmm. um, but uh, they were extremely helpful. And it wasn't just for Maya, it was for the whole family. Okay. We were all trying to cope with the uh, for counseling. How was all this, how was it affecting the family? Uh, we were all getting pulled in different directions. Uh, Explain that a little bit. I mean, what did, what did you feel? Well, you had your normalcy at one point, and now... You know, this here we're, I was supposed to retire and enjoy my life, and the kids were supposed to be outside having fun, and mom, dad go scuba diving, and none of that happened. When that uh, happened, we had a new challenge. And for the longest time, it was an unknown. And did you have Maya at Eagle's Wings throughout this period in 2016 to for various visits? That would have been. 2015 and 15, I'm sorry, 2015 and then into 16. Mm -hmm. All right. And we'll have the records in. If, I think they already are in. Are the Eagles Wings in yet? I think so. But in any event, um, did Eagles Wings ever raise any concern about uh, uh, you and Viata being damaging or inappropriate with Maya? Absolutely not. And did they ever raise anything about Maya making this pain and the disease she was suffering from make that up in her mind? No. Was it, this was to, for you and Beata, was this to deal with the stresses of having a child with a difficult disease? Check to the leading. Sustained. What, if anything, was the uh, goal there with you and Beata at Eagle's Wings? Like I said, it was a new challenge for all of us. We needed some somebody to talk to and guidance if, if that was available. Um, Let's show you exhibit uh, 1036 from Eagle's Wings is in evidence. <clears throat> it's 27 pages, Greg, just so you know. You got the right exhibit on Yeah. Time. It's 27 pages. Okay, so um, that's the. You know what? This is a big long it. record. Um, I'm going to hold off on this because it'll take a long time to go through it. We'll have a psychologist on that in any event. All right, so 
at this point then, approaching uh, the end of the year, uh, did there come a time that you, well, strike it. So did a doctor at Johns Hopkins, were they aware, any of the doctors, aware that you were taking Maya to Mexico for a ketamine coma infusion, Production as they call it? Speculation. Overall. I believe there, uh, the one doctor, I, I, Christman. Christman. I am very bad with the. Oh, there's too many of them. Okay. In this this horrible story. Um, yes, he was aware of it. All right. So, did you receive any feedback from Dr. Christman, or did anyone else from Johns Hopkins call in this period of time after you first notified them that you were having the ketamine coma in Mexico? No, I, I don't recall from anywhere having a problem. None of the doctors you saw that you informed said no. anything? All right. So tell us a little bit about that procedure. How did it come about? What happened? Well, like I stated, it was recommended by Dr. Anthony Kirkpatrick. Mm -hmm. uh, Maya, or Maya, I'm sorry. Beata did some research on it as well. Uh, mm -hmm. Like I said, it wasn't a decision made overnight. Um, it was a very difficult decision. Uh, also, financially, it was uh, a nut that was part of it as well. Was the PICK line installed in part for this yes. procedure? Yes. And as part of that PICK line procedure, was it made clear that what they were installing was to was assist for... in the Mexico uh, infusion? Okay. Yes. Continue, please. So it, it took a while. Uh, I'm not saying I don't know the time frame for the decision, but uh, yes, we decided to go ahead with the treatment. And uh, unfortunately, at that time, my oldest daughter was getting married at the same time frame. Uh, we were all originally supposed to go to Playa del Carmen in Mexico for Corinne's wedding. Um, so family once again was wedged. Beata and Maya went to Monterey mm -hmm. to start out with the treatment. Who was the I, doctor? That was Dr. Cantu okay. under his and, supervision. And what happened with uh, you and Kyle? Kyle and I went to uh, Playa del Carmen to attend my oldest daughter's wedding. All right. And then after your daughter's wedding, did you join uh, your wife and, be, uh, and Maya back in? Uh, I did. I flew back to Florida first to uh, have my brother watch Kyle. And then I jumped on a plane and went to Monterey. Did you have a chance then to actually uh, witness the second round of uh, the infusions? When I arrived, she was coming out of the procedure. And how was she doing? She was doing fine. Um, you know, they explained certain things that she would look like. And, you know, and I'd seen things prior to that mm -hmm. through Beata. But, um, no, everything seemed to be good. And uh, we'd seen the lesions on her legs. They healed. Uh, dystonia wasn't as bad. She woke up after they removed the uh, tube. She was hungry. And, you know, it, that was a very, very uh, rewarding thing to hear. Um, she was weak, you know, going through that procedure. It's going to take time. But uh, she did very well. And we've seen changes. We, once again, the roller coaster was going up. So. Now, from the time that Maya had her last infusion through Dr. Kirkpatrick up until the point of the infusion in Mexico, approximately how many days or weeks passed, either one? From Kirkpatrick to? Yeah, the last Kirkpatrick infusion. It was October 9th, I believe, mm -hmm. the last one at Kirkpatrick. Yeah. And then the, and the infusions and were? went November 17th. I think he's got the the timeline. Oh, just the timeline. Just what's up in front of. I'm so sorry. The what's being broadcast is the timeline. Right. I just want to know what he's testifying from right now. Timeline. The 
gave this to you guys a long time ago. Okay, members of the jury, what I'm going to ask you to do is to please step into the um, to the room for a few minutes. Do not discuss this case amongst yourselves. Do not do any investigation. Receive no information. All right. Mr. Anderson, yes, sir. Kindly retrieve the materials from Mr. Kowalski and then show them to all of the materials, sir, and show them to the defense counsel. <coughs> what are those other things? On? Oh, this is I wasn't using them. Well, then let's put them okay. at your you put them down. No, yes. let's okay. put them back at the counsel table. Do anybody have a, does anyone have a machine here? I can print whatever you need. Sure. What do you need? Um, this well, was an exhibit at one of his depositions. Yes. Well, it's a timeline I can yeah. prepare by the app. Hey, can you come they have, They're going to print it. Is that what it is? I know they're in us, I guess. I, I believe that. Yes. My, my assistant, right look, let's just, my assistant's going to come through that door. Let's just have yes. a I got chicken scratch on there. Yeah. Two or three copies of it. Yeah. I don't even know he brought it up there. But it was an exhibit to his one of his depositions, first or second depo. Well, while we're on the record, um, we just want the record to reflect that he had notes with him on the witness stand and would inquire from counsel whether there's any other notes with any what? Witness. Any other notes that he no, has with him? No, I honestly did not know he had brought any up there. Okay. I, mean, I thought he was just referring to this. And I would, for the record, put in a start and finish document for every one of these visits, and then we would be here past Christmas. So I felt the timeline would be better. I mean, for every one of his the, the visits, instead of having a timeline, I guess I could have put in to refresh his recollection the first day and the last day of every one of these doctor's visits. But that would not have been efficient. Haven't you had this since his deposition? Are you asking me a question on the record or off the record? The pages that were my apologies. Oh, yeah. 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 That's okay. That's so, right. Mr. Shapiro? Yes, Your Honor. Is there anything we're doing? Uh, I'd like to mark it. Yeah, we'd like to mark it for identification. Oh, you just file it in the court file? Yes, Your Honor. As, a, as an exhibit? Defense, defense exhibit. 
Right. Whatever it is. But, yeah. Whatever the next number is. Yes. Right. I'm sure the clerk will tell us in a few minutes what that number is. I'm sorry? Three. Three. So it's been marked as defendants 3325. Thank you, Your Honor. Okay. And we're returning the notes to them or not returning the notes to them? I plan to return the notes. I'll let it play a prag if I need to, but it seems to be a bit so more. I'm fighting for you, Your Honor. No objection, Your Honor. You can have this case. Okay, so no the well, notes no, will go don't. back. Sorry about that. Are we ready to bring the jury in? Yes, Your Honor. Let's get the jury. Yes, Members of the jury, I just want to confirm while you're away, you did not discuss this case amongst yourselves. You received no information and um, you did no investigation. Is that all correct? Correct. And no one approached you about the case? No. And you didn't see any media reports in the last three minutes? No. Okay. You may continue. May it please the court. I think when we were last talking, we were talking about the number of days between October 9th and the no November 7th infusion. I'm trying to figure out the period of time between infusions. I'm sorry, I misunderstood. So 21 plus 7. I thought we were up to uh, Mexico. Yes, but I, what I'm trying to do here is figure out, if you look back to October 9th, the inf last infusion with Dr. K, Dr. Kirkpatrick, and then the November 7th, which I believe is the first uh, oh, yes. infusion there in uh, Monterey. 17th. November 17th. Okay. And during this period of time, several weeks, did you ever see anything what you would call withdrawal symptoms from your daughter? No. At any time, strike it, at different points, be it between Dr. Kirkpatrick and Dr. Cantu, Dr. Cantu, Dr. Hannah, in the periods where Maya was not using ketamine, did you ever see anything that you would call a withdrawal symptom? Objection, lack of foundation. <clears throat> Overruled. You can answer that. No, sir. All right, so now let's continue on with the treatment down there. Um, the, was the second treatment what was called a booster? That is correct. And how many days after was it on the booster? You mean from the initial? Yes, sir. Uh, I went back with Maya December 18th through the 24th, and that was a three-day, three separate uh, booster treatments. Okay. And did Maya come out of it well? She did. All right. And afterwards, I think you were talking about the period for the next uh, few months. Tell the jury what, if any, changes you noted insofar as Maya's CRPS uh Symptoms. She was improving. Um, we did seek uh, additional booster treatments here in the U.S., but uh, she was improving. Okay. And were her lesions become strike it? We'll get there. Um, so after the booster, then um, what was it? was there a decision made to go back to Dr. Kirkpatrick or Dr. Hannah? Um, in January, I believe uh, Beata was researching that. And in, uh, one of the factors was cost. Um, okay. And I believe that's when she chose Dr. Hannah. And I don't know if he was referred by Dr. Kirkpatrick or not, but uh, uh, we ended up going with Dr. Hannah. Was he Dr. significantly less expensive than Dr. Kirkpatrick's and program? He's, he's in Clearwater, so it, it wasn't based on travel. And so why start back on the ketamine infusions? It was booster treatments. I believe it was recommended. I, 
honestly don't recall. And then how long was it before the, the <coughs> symptoms started to go bad, uh, stop being as bad, improve? We seen Heal. her in the springtime, I believe it was. She was doing fantastic. Um, upper body, she was doing very well. Um, I believe one of the videos of her swimming, it wasn't using her legs, but she was using her arms to swim. She was able to lift uh, herself out of the pool? Movement. Yes, and there was a time where she could actually lift her entire body with just her arms and have her legs out like a gymnast. I mean, she was getting so close to and so regain all her strength. There were a couple other uh, treatments that were uh, employed over this period of time. Can you, uh, first one was Dr. Spiegel. Can you talk about uh, Dr. Spiegel's? Sure, and just before that as well, I mean, PT was always involved as well. Okay. So I don't want you to think we discontinued that. But um, before you get to that, let me ask you, and we'll show you uh, joint exhibit 1022-0021. That's an operative note of March 10th, 2016. Can you see that? Yes, if you could blow it up, it would be great. Does that... Uh, remind you of a procedure that Maya had at this time? Mission date 310. Let me ask it this way. Did Maya have a port installed? She time? did. Who installed it? Uh, it was at Johns Hopkins. And who was the surgeon there on the top under operative report? Nebby E. Waldford. And Indeed. what was the preoperative diagnosis? That was for... Your Honor. Right underneath. Oh, I'm sorry. He's merely reading the re re medical record at this point. Lack of foundation. Sustained. Is reflex sympathetic dystrophy, as you explained, the same thing as a di diagnosis of CRPS? CRPS, correct. And from the best of your knowledge, going in and coming out of this port placement, was the diagnosis reflex sympathetic dystrophy, otherwise known as CRPS? Same objection. I think that one we're going to overrule. It's a different question. Are they the same? Yes, they are the same. And why was it necessary to have a port put in? After all these procedures, you know, every time she was going in, they're sticking her uh, veins. That's a tiny little girl, first of all, nine, ten years old. Indication. Um, at, at, after time, it was difficult to access the vein. Um, this was the choice to go. If you didn't have, if you didn't believe that this was absolutely necessary for your daughter, would you have done it? No. It was a benefit instead of, you know, them trying and fail and try again. Was it recommended to you or did you just come up with it out of the blue? No, it was recommended. Do you remember which doctor recommended it? No, it's most likely uh, Dr. Hannah or some, or Dr. Patrick, most likely Hannah. Let me ask you something. Every one of these treatments the jury's hearing about, was there a prescription for them? Yes. Was it always under a licensed doctor's uh, recommendation and prescription? Yes. So uh, now she began the fusions with Dr. Hanna, and then did she try other treatments? Did she try a, a hyperbaric therapy? Yes. Um, How'd that come about? Beata did some research. I don't know, you know, if it was within the CRPS uh, literature or whatever. But she, was she on chat rooms with other? Yes, therapy? she was. And that's, I believe, where Meg Bolin was involved as well. You know, it's a group, but I, I could be wrong on that. Right. Where she found it. But uh, originally, we tried a hyperbaric chamber in Osprey, Florida. It was basically an inflatable hyperbaric chamber. I personally, you know, from the fire service, didn't think it was beneficial. Uh -huh. um, we used to take CO patients to a hyperbaric chamber, Luther General Hospital, and it was a big chamber, and that's what was in my mind all the time was that's the place to go. Uh, when we went there, you know, she's getting in, and it's like a jumpy house. 
sandwich. Ask your next question. What if anything happened after you arrived? I'm sorry, what? Explain what the procedure was from your perspective. Um, it was the high saturation of uh, oxygen, uh, no drug therapy, which... Was that appealing to you? That was extremely appealing. Did you want your daughter to have to keep going on these uh, infusion trips or these, in, uh, or even trips up to Clearwater if there was another remedy that could do the job? Yeah, we, we looked for the alternative. And, you know, unfortunately, that was out of pocket, but that wasn't a consideration. We wanted to do something better for her, if, regardless of how much it cost. Did it come about that you actually had to uh, sell off some things to be able to afford some of these treatments? We had a second home in Illinois, Elmhurst. Uh, we had a rental house, and basically we were going to have that money for a college fund. Unfortunately, we had to sell it to pay for medical expenses. Okay. And so now in May of uh, 2016, this would be after about, what, four or five months of the combination of treatments? And we haven't gotten to IVIG yet, but she tried IVIG as well? She did, yes. Okay. And so she went back to Tony Kreisman, her pulmonologist, to check on status of asthma. Reduction of the breathing line. I'm going to try to move it along, but okay. For all the objections, uh, she did, and I believe there was a, he made a comment about. All right. Well, let's uh, pull up one zero two four dash zero zero two eight. Okay. Now, let's turn to the second page, and that's got the listing of medications that have been prescribed uh, over this period of time, uh, with the exception of some from Doctor. Wassenauer, her pediatrician, who was prescribing these things? <coughs> um, are these substantially the same medications that have been originally it prescribed looks, by Johns Hopkins? Are these substantially the same as the medications that Johns Hopkins had prescribed after that first admission. Same objection, our leading. Overruled on that one. Yes. Okay, and so um, his concern was, I guess, cortisol levels were slightly low in that next paragraph. Okay. Underneath it says medica oh, medications. Okay, nice. Let's skip it. Uh, we can go to the third page then. Okay. Under physical examination, oh, where was Maya examined? In her Phys wheelchair. All right. And what was, and, and this was at Johns Hopkins? Um, was Dr. Kreisman a doctor at Johns Hopkins? He is. Um, and this was, uh, was it in his office? I was. I think this is the one I was present that I I don't recall, but uh, All right, let's I thought I'd seen it there somewhere. But yeah, it would have been in his office. Okay. All right. And so, how does he describe Maya now since her series of treatments? She's a she complete. Actually, uh, the medical record speaks for itself. It's, just it's a predicate to comment on it. Sustained. Did he find that Maya was a completely different child from when last examined? Same objection, Your Honor. That's what we're on that one. Yes, he does note that. And did he find that she was not in any pain, she was not moaning, she was smiling, she was interactive, and she was very engaged? Same yes. objection and nope. leading, Your Honor. Sustained. What were his findings, to the best of your knowledge, about that being a different child. What did he say, to the best of your Same knowledge? Objection, Your Honor. Can I have the attorneys come forward, please? Jesus.
this visit, did you notice that Maya acted as though she was not in any pain? Uh, did you? I don't recall that day, but according to reading this, she, she was in no pain. Okay. Do you recall on that day whether she was moaning or not moaning? I don't recall that, to be honest with you, but um, it, it, reading this, I would be more than uh, satisf satisfied to say that she did what she was doing well. Well, how was Maya that day interacting with Dr. Kreisman at All Children's? Mm, she's happy. She's not guarding herself. When she's not in any pain, does she exhibit those uh, protective moves when anybody moves towards her that you just said? Yes. No. So from your perspective as a parent, her parent, if you see that reaction to someone trying to touch her, what does that indicate to you? That she's in pain. And her weight there is 25 kilograms. And uh, was she still in a wheelchair? She at this? was leading her <clears throat> Sustained. Did she walk in in a wheelchair? Did she walk in or did she come in in a wheelchair? Physical examination, she was examined in her just wheelchair. Just, now, if you recall, did you recall if you pushed her in or she walked in? I pushed her in. All right. Um, and to the best of your knowledge, uh, were there any significant rashes left? Not that I'm aware of at this time. Was Dr. Kreisman pleased? by her recovery. Calls for speculation objection. Sustained. Did Dr. Kreisman say anything to you to indicate that he was uh, proud, amazed, or happy, some positive reaction about the progress Maya had made? He appeared to be happy to see her condition the way she is in now at this time. Your, your Honor. They're asking his recollections which were from the medical records. Uh, okay, sir. What we want is what you remember. If you need to review the document, that's fine. Just tell us that you need to review the document. Okay. Okay, but let's not read the document. My apologies. So why don't you read that? Uh, it would refresh your recollection. Would you please read to yourself the uh, second uh, pair, uh, the second sentence of the first paragraph under physical examination. Yeah, I, again, I object for the same reason in terms of him just reading the medical record at this point. Now he's trying to refresh his recollection, so let's okay. let Mr. Anderson, let the witness do that. Go ahead. She's doing well here. All right. Well, the question is, having refreshed your recollection, did this refresh your recollection as to how your daughter was doing at this visit? Yes. And was she not moaning? No. Was she smiling? Yes. Was she interactive with Dr. Kreisman in terms of talking and you know, laughing or saying things, responding? Yes. And was she engaged in the sense that she knew what, the questions were, and she was responding appropriately. Objection to the leading runner. I've ruled on that one. She, she's, she's, doing, she's interacting with the doctor. And the other times, I'm sure she was the opposite. You know, it wouldn't, while being in pain, it'd be a difficult where she would interact with the doctors. So how many months was this after you got back from the Mexico infusions? I'm sorry, I don't see the date down here. This is uh, February, so this is uh, two months. Okay. And so in this two months, can you tell the jury how much she had improved? Objection, Your Honor. It's missing statements. Overruled. How she was improving. Doing very well. And then, if you go into recommendations, can you please uh, tell us whether you independently remember what uh, Dr. Kreisman says in terms of her medications, or would it refresh your recollection to read the, the same objection by reading the medical? 
Would you? I can do it. Let's just no overrule the objection, but let's stop reading the records here. If you'd read that to yourself, does that refresh your recollection about what the doctor told you as to the plan for the future? Yes. And did Dr. Kreisman object or say, or did he say anything about changing what she was doing with her infusions and other procedures? Or did he recommend continuing? Nothing in reference to the infusions, just uh, switching the ad of air. Okay, but underneath that, does it? Um, what does he? Who does he say should be uh, continuing the remainder of her medications? Same, same objection, but reading records. Let's let's approach, please. Let's take down the exhibit, please. All right. So now let's continue on. Um, how did Maya do the remaining uh, part of that spring and summer? She was doing uh, fantastic. She was improving greatly. How were her different symptoms doing? Some of the symptoms were diminished. Uh, the strength, uh, she had more strength. She was able to exercise more, pool therapy, mm -hmm. and she was determined, you know, and, uh, you know, being less, less pain, it was easier for her to do more. And how about her lesions? Did they go away or did they diminish or did they stay the same? Uh, I do not believe there was any lesions um, at that time. Her Aldenia? Aldenia, no. No, it went away or no? I, I don't recall that being a problem at that time. And then what about dystonia? Dystonia, she had dystonia for quite some time. It may not have been as severe. Um, the one picture in my mind that I think of is when she was doing that handstand where she's holding her body up, the feet, she had them pointed out, and it looked pretty good at that point. Were you going to Dr. Hanna for infusions every day or periodically? Periodically. And were there groups uh, that he recommended of ketamine infusions? Did he recommend it that you do it in groups, the ketamine infusion? Uh, usually they were in a group. And so through the course then of the summer, how was Maya doing? She was doing good. And uh, she was also doing physical therapy there as well. Now, can you uh, tell us if Maya wanted to go back to school or whether she wanted to continue in her homebound program approaching the school year in 2016? She wanted to remain at home uh, because of the wheelchair and also doctor's appointments and her PT. Uh, if she went back to the school, that would interfere with some of the treatment and uh, doctor's visits. Um, so she wanted to stay home. Okay. Um, and was it your impression that this was a stressful event from, for her? It was very stressful. And what was the effect of that stress on her CRPS from your standpoint? I, I don't understand it. When things changed, Yes. Did anything change towards yes. the end uh, of the summer, beginning of fall? Maya 
was asked by one of her school teachers to come to Taylor Ranch. Uh, the kids had a little lemonade stand, a fundraiser, and she wanted Maya to, to go to the school and see the, the children raising money for the for Maya. So we went there and we went into the library um, and um, the woman that runs the homebound seen Maya there. And she figured since Maya could come to that fundraiser, she's able to come to school every day. So I believe that's what discontinued or interrupted her homebound. Was Maya in a situation yet, in your opinion, where she should go back to uh, the, the school or to remain in homebound? To remain in homebound, uh, like I stated, we were doing physical therapy and everything else for her. She wouldn't have got everything she needed at that time. Got it. All right, so now... Um, Did her symptoms return at this point? She relapsed. And describe the relapse for the jury. Um, the, just everything that we worked for and where we what we achieved just started going away again. So did you have an inkling that this might happen before it happened? No. Were you trying, uh, you and Beata, attempting to assist her in staying in homebound? And did you ask Dr. Wassenauer to support you in that? Yes, Dr. Wassenauer did a uh, note to support it. And then we actually had to hire an attorney, uh, Jane Windsor, to help us fight for that. And, and what, was, what was Maya's concern with going back to homebound? Was it the, I mean, going back to Taylor Ranch, was it the wheelchair or what? I don't think it's necessarily the wheelchair. It was more... We were on we were on track of seeing the finish line. We thought to get her better, and we wanted her better. And uh, I honestly don't know what the main reason was, but you know, there it was physical therapy and doctors' visits and the treatments. Uh, if she went back, I think there would have been an interruption with her learning. So this was extremely beneficial, as you heard from Miss Dieter. It was. And so once these uh, symptoms came back, um, <clears throat> did you have to strike that? Let's go with this. Now, I want to go through the Johns Hopkins doctors that you saw up until this point. And I want, you, I want to ask you if you recall when I named their name, whether they said anything negative to you up to this point about the ketamine treatments. So Leslie Carroll, MD, anything? No. Diana Young, MD? No. Rebecca Plant, MD? No. Nicole Armstrong DeMores, MD? No. AJ Desay, DO? Annette Pargas, MD. No. Allison Burt, MD. No. Shayla Siraj, MD. No. Anthony Kreisman, MD. No. Amanda Groden, these are from uh, the July 6, 2015. Amanda Groden Cook, MD. Any? No. Uh, Jamie Reed, MD. Jennifer Longo, MD. No. Amy Mason, MD. No. Ashley Collins, uh, DO. No. Suzanne Jackman, MD. No. Joseph Casadante, MD. No. Sean Butler, MD. No. Magdalene Gondor, MD. No. Jennifer Castilli, MD. No. Safeu M. Demisi. MD. Your Honor, I, I, I object for lack of mistakes of record in terms of when the people saw it. I'm going to overrule the objection. Now, that same group of doctors, if you could tell the jury, uh, Johns Hopkins doctors, 
Can you tell a jury whether any one of them raised with you the best of your knowledge or raised about you or Beata to the best of your knowledge? Any concerns over medical child abuse or Munchausen by proxy? No objection during what time period, though? <clears throat> Let's deal with the time period. From the period I just went through, of, it would be July 6th, 2015, up to October 7th, 2016. Was the first time that anyone accused you of medical child abuse or Munchausen by proxy on the October 7th visit? October 7th. Was that the first time that any doctor at Johns Hopkins had challenged the CRPS as the correct diagnosis? To the relevance from the rural. Yes. This was the first time anyone? Yes, first time. So now... Um, On October 1st, 2016, there was a visit to Johns Hopkins ER, was there not? Yes, that's correct. And what was Maya's complaint? That was for constipation. Right. And what is that, to the best of your knowledge, was the constipation, what was causing the constipation? I was unaware of what caused it. Um, nobody really stated what caused it. Did not, Dr. Hanna have an impression or diagnosis of why her bowel sometimes backed up? <coughs> There's a, uh, I, I think I heard it the other day as well. Dr. Chopra may have mentioned it. It's uh, anybody with CRPS, if, if the muscles are not squeezed, the intestines not squeezed, and so everything backs up. And so uh, she had had this periodically since the diagnosis of CRPS or had she? And so what happened on October 1st, six days before this period we're about to talk about? Any problems? No, she was treated in Mar Marilex or something and they went home. So nobody accused you of anything? No, no. Anybody challenged the CRPS on that visit? No, and in fact, uh, that visit too, I explained about the blood pressure. Now, I want to ask you if we can about October 7th through July 7th, excuse me, July 14th, October. October. No. Right now, let's just talk about uh, the period from October 7th through October, let's say, 13th. Now, why did you end up at Johns Hopkins on October 7th? I was relieving Beata. She was uh, my was having a treatment at Dr. Hanna's in Clearwater. Beata had to work the next day, so I relieved her. I don't recall if I relieved her at Dr. Hanna's office or the Ronald McDonald House in St. Pete. So, uh, we were staying at the Ronald McDonald. Donald House when this occurred. And, uh, okay, and so up to the after the relapse, can you tell the jury what Beata's level of concern was that Maya was returning to the baseline of fall of 2016, the bad time? She was extremely concerned about her health, you know, deteriorating. Was that a stressful period for extremely you? Extremely stressful. And why is that? Off to the races. Yeah. All right. So who brought Maya in? You did? I did. Approximately what time in the morning? It was approximately 8 a.m., 8.30 a.m., somewhere in those things. So when you got in there, did you have to give a history again? I did. And how many times would you estimate you had given essentially the same history to Johns Hopkins doctors? It's been several times at least. Every time you came in? in including you know, to get the pick fine and all that. And so were you expecting anything negative to happen this time? No. So after you came in and you ha gave the history, what happened after that? Well, first we went to triage. She was um, uh, admitted there, you know, and then they did the vitals. And that's when I brought up where, you know, they have to, they cannot put the electronic blood pressure cuff on because if she, 
she was in severe pain. Um, uh, this is the worst I ever seen her um, with the stomach pain. Her knees were all the way up to her chest. Um, it was difficult to get her in the car and also out of the car. There was somebody that valeted our vehicle, which was extremely nice. Um, but she was in extreme pain. And like I said, her knees were planted all the way up to her chest. Okay. And ha had you ever seen these particular symptoms of the knees all the way up to her chest before? Never like that. So uh, what happens when they tried to put this, uh, I guess it was a tight cuff, the electronic cuff? Uh, with the problem with the, the electronic cuff, if you're moving, it'll keep inflating. Um, and that's gonna, it's gonna be like a vice on her arm. So well, I uh, requested that it be a manual blood pressure. And that is still painful, but it's not as severe as the electronic one. There's been testimony about Maya thrashing around. When did the thrashing around start in this process? Well, she, most of the time, she was in extreme pain, and you know she'll roll around things like that on the bed. And um, did she react was, to someone trying to put this cuff on her? There was an incident later in the bed where she was thrashing around on the floor. I believe the pick you that happened, but uh, I do not recall if they accommodated me with a manual cuff or not in the ER. And there was testimony pre previously that Maya was throwing things in this first position. No, there was no throwing. Uh, number one, she's on a bed without anything other than herself on that bed. There's no throwing things around. Did any doctors at that time comment to you that they had, I mean, to you directly, or to the best of your knowledge, uh, your wife, Beata, did any of the doctors pull you aside and say that they had seen this thrashing or other uh, unnerving behavior, whatever you want to call it, out of your sight? No. And then I, I recall it also the, the woman in the uh, triage, she didn't, uh, you know, when I explained that it was CRPS or RSD, mm -hmm. uh, she was unaware of that condition. She did not know what that was? No. Which a lot of people. But at this point, uh, were you aware of whether Johns Hopkins had a number of visits and histories reflecting CRPS or its other name, RSD? I wouldn't know that. So now, uh, what was Beata doing during this? Was, was there ever any confrontations with any of the nursing staff or First. doctors? First of all, Beata, I relieved her the night before, so she was back in Venice. I called her and I told her that I was bringing Maya to the emergency room. Maya had a treatment set up for the following day. That's why we remained in that area. Well, I, what, what I want to know is then when this first business of thrashing and throwing things was alleged, Maya, Beata wasn't even there? Oh, she was there for that. Okay. That was, that I believe, was in the picture. All right. And so she'd already been through the ER? I believe so. I could be wrong. And did you see any behavior like that in the in the uh, ER part of it? She was thrashing. You know, it's, number one, she's in extreme pain. And her pain tolerance is much, you know, it's completely different than ours. So when she's in that much pain, it, it's got to be extreme or painful. So well, you're not going to be cooperative and just lay there. Is Beata's pain and reaction to it the same whether, excuse me, Maya's, uh, <laughs> is Maya's pain and a reaction to it the same whether Beata's there or not there? No, it, it, I've seen that or I've seen things about that and she did the same thing for me at times too. And so how did this end up there, um, did you agree to stay for the evening? Uh, 
I know Beata wanted to um, go to get her treatment. Um, Were you trying to get out of there? We tried. And then uh, I believe we talked in the first day, but then after that we... We wanted to leave. Well, during that, that time, they were trying to talk you into staying. What, what kind of things were they saying to you? Objection, uh, lack of foundation, which was approved. Sustained. Do you remember the specific doctor's name that uh, told you this? No, I do not. And do, can you remember the uh, time, the space, excuse me, the place and time of this? And was it a social worker, or was it a nurse, or was it a doctor? That I honestly can't tell you. Were these comments made to Beata or to you? Beata was the advocate, and yeah, so most of most of all the communications went to Beata. How was Beata reacting to the uh, the recommendation, if you will, that you were supposed to stay the night? Number one, she was concerned about Maya. That's number one priority. Um, she was listening. Um, I don't think she at first wanted to stay there at all. And then uh, I don't know if we were somewhat talked into it at the, that one night, one night only type thing. And then uh, the, the intention was to go to get her treatments. Um, all right. Did they agree finally to... Uh, do her treatments, her ketamine treatments there at Johns Hopkins? Objection. Uh, again, lack of foundation as to the day of this. We're talking about, Jan uh, we're talking about October 7th, Judge. Let's try to be more specific with our pronouns, but you can uh, you know, let you re-ask the question. Okay. Now I forgot the question. Uh, were they a lot, were they, did the doctors, no matter who, but the doctors agree that on this evening of October 7th that they would continue the ketamine program. They continued with ketamine. I don't know the exact dosage, but they did treat her with some ketamine. All right. And they treated her, do you know, with any other pain medications? There was, I, I honestly don't know the list of that day at that time. Okay. Now, I'd like to show you what's been marked as 1001-0062. And when it comes up here, uh, first, I want to ask you about um, the, well, this is going too far. Uh, not this one right now. We'll go to that one in a little while. So now, did you stay with her overnight? I don't recall the first night if I stayed there or if Beata did. Was it your intention to stay there or did you want to leave? We wanted to leave. We wanted to go and get her treatment. Were they telling you anything about the reasons why you shouldn't leave? Again, object to the, the vagueness. And the Were the doctors thing. telling you anything about why you should leave or stay? Well, he clarified it to the doctors, so you can answer that. I believe that their justification was weaning off. Uh, weaning Maya off of what? I don't know if it was the ketamine or whatever. but the And uh, Mr. Anderson, it's, it's 4.55. I'll give you up to 15 minutes, but if at 5.10 you're still going, we're going to shut it down. So uh, there's no way. Up I, to 15 minutes. Uh, I, I've, I've got considerably longer than that, Your Honor. You've got, yes, and we can come back tomorrow. I'm just saying within the next 15 minutes, find a natural breaking point, and then we're going to call it for the day. I understand. So then, um, on the, then on the 8th, uh, what did you do? Did you continue to try to get yourselves out of there? We wanted to get out of there, yes. Did you lobby the doctors to we get out of there? Yes, and uh, why didn't we you just get up and go? We were told if we left, we would be arrested. And were you aware 
of the patient's rights at that point in the package that you received about your rights to stay or go as you desired? At that point, probably not. Did anybody mention that to you? No. So now you stay another night, the night of what, the 9th? Or the 8th, excuse me, it'd be the 8th. And where did you stay? That would have been there at the yeah. hospital. And so then on the 9th, did you and or your wife, that, uh, to your knowledge, uh, let them know that you were out of there, you were leaving? We wanted to leave and go back to Dr. Hannah. Did you inform the doctor that was handling the case that there was a treatment with Dr. Hannah? Beata did, yes. And the... Um, And were you ever told that you had a right to reject their treatments? They never informed us that. And so then, um, let's talk about after that, you were there on the, uh, let's see, that would have been Sunday the 10th? No, be the 9th, Sunday the 9th. Okay. And did you let them know that you were just leaving? You, were, you wanted to go, you had a treatment the next day? Objection again to who the they is. I've identified them as the doctors. Sustained. I mean, overruled. You can answer that. We wanted to leave. Uh, yes, we wanted to leave. And get did you up. inform the doctors you were going to leave? Um, I believe Be Beata did. Were you there for that? Uh, she had a separate meeting at one point with the doctor. Mm -hmm. Okay. I don't know the name of that person. And so when you tried to go, what happened? We were threatened to be arrested. So what happened after that? We didn't have a choice. We had to stay. And so in order to leave, you would have had to have tested whether you'd be arrested or physically held? Objection to the leaving of Overruled. Yes. And you told them that you wanted out of there? Yes. But they did not let you out of there? Objection again to the leaving did they let you out of there? No, they didn't let us out. And also, I believe that's where they were provided with Dr. Kirkpatrick, Dr. Hannah, you know, all the information, who to call and, you know, back it up. But including eagle wings? Including eagle, e including eagle wings. E eagle wings. <laughs> I can't talk anymore. So they had access to, you, you provided them with the name of all your doctors that were involved in the care? Yes. Did they tell you why they were keeping you other than this idea that uh, they had to wean Maya off of some drug? Same objection, Your Honor, to the day. The doctors. No. Kind of. And throughout the entire time here when you had stopped Maya, what we call cold turkey, for days, weeks, months, as we, you testified to before, had you ever seen any indications that the ketamine was causing any sort of withdrawal symptom? Absolutely but, but not. Again, objection to the leaving. So we're rolling. This would be a good time, Judge. Okay, okay members of the jury, uh, I think today is, for you, is now over. So, at least here in the courthouse. Tomorrow, we're gonna start back at the same time. Do not discuss this case amongst yourselves. Do not do any investigation and receive no information. Have a wonderful evening, and we will see you back here tomorrow. Okay, the jury is out of our presence. Uh, Mr. Kowalski, you can go have a seat with your attorneys. What issues do we need to address before we break? I don't have it. No, Your Honor, just um, if, if the court would be so inclined to uh, remind Mr. Kowalski about the fact that he's still in the
Well, he's a party and we're overnight, so I'm generally reluctant to do that when it's a party. Just a question to council uh, if this changes the schedule for tomorrow, given where we're at. Good time. Uh, Judge of and council, too. I paid a heck of a lot of money to get uh, Kirkpatrick and Hannah here. They are prepping or prepped. I assume prep. I assume defense council has prepped for those. I'm happy to continue, uh, Mr. Kowalski, but. It would be more efficient, I believe, and then it can cost to their heart's content. I think it would be more efficient to get Dr. Kirkpatrick and Dr. Hannah out of the way. I believe I can finish them by, say, 2 o'clock, assuming there's no more than an hour of cross-examination. Just to verify your time. I, 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 I put that out there. I, I object. I would respectfully request that my cross immediately follow cessation of the most direct. Given that this is a major witness i think it's more important that we do it in a normal fashion i'm sorry that uh your doctors are gonna have to sit for a little bit of time i understand yeah. um you know I, the court deputy asked me about a note for the maya and, and kyle i entered an order at 3418 on september 26th that they're going to email it to me. Okay, so I mean that issue was dealt Thank with. You. What other issues? The only issue I the only issue I had, Judge, was yeah, Ms. Crowell that? touched upon. Are we still looking at Kirkpatrick then Hannah or Hannah then Kirkpatrick? I don't. don't. I, you know, honestly, now with with this, I I don't know. I would still want to do Kirkpatrick first and then Hannah. Try. Now, today was a little bumpy. Let's try tomorrow not to have so much bumpiness um, on our exhibits. Have but we provided you, counsel, when you know the schedule, have we provided you with the exhibits? They are the ones to uh, Dr. Kirkpatrick and Dr. Hannah, and it's their medical file, which you previously have received. We I do not know of anything in addition. Um, the deposition. Well, we and got. We, we, did I'm we sorry. Advise you. Well, you got. I got an e email that says she hasn't had an opportunity to confirm it. Understandably, I guess with you or or um, Mr. Whitney. She's also listing Dr. Kirkpatrick's videos, which are long, and so they'll be doing edits, and she'll forward that when she has the information. So, I'm not sure what that means, Mr. Anderson. Obviously, we don't want to. You know, if you have the cut pieces that you plan on using, there's like that's a, that's seven a videos job. listed. Let's right. see. One, two, so, three, uh, the, six, seven, I'm sure eight, nine. Indulgence. Because Ms. Perry has been ill, uh, we beg the court's indulgence to give us till I don't know, 6 or 6.30 to provide them with everything. The only thing that we may not have is the final edit on Dr. Kirkpatrick's um, demonstrative aid, which, so they know, is largely taken off of the videos he already has posted and have been posted for, in some cases, decades on the RSD Foundation site. So, but I will provide them to them. They may be done by the time I get there, but uh, I think Pat probably knows better than I at this point. I, I just know the email that we received that said this, well, this I, initial list of exhibits that needs to be confirmed. I, I want the list to be specific. So, for instance, if you're only going to be using certain pages within, you know, a, a larger exhibit, you need to identify those certain pages. And then when you give me the list, hopefully it can just be in a chronological order and not like today where numbers were all over the place. Yes, sir. Now, let's get that to the defense as quickly as possible. Now, on a going forward basis, and Mr. Anderson, you need to make sure your team is aware of this, I really want that lunchtime transmittal to occur. So, you know, I said it this morning, but I know you haven't had a chance, but that means tonight you need to make sure that your team is ready to transmit Wednesdays 
uh, exhibits and, and witnesses no later than lunchtime tomorrow. Yes, sir. Okay. And for scorekeeping, uh, plaintiffs used four hours, 35 minutes today. The defense used 15. The defendant's cumulative total is 17 hours, 10 minutes. And the defense is at four hours, 55 minutes. You said the defense was at 17. You mean plaintiff is 17? The plaintiff is at uh, 17 hours, 10 minutes. The defendant is at four hours, 55 minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Do we need to come earlier than 8.30, or are we going to be able to address whatever we need to address in the 30 minutes between 8.30 and 9? There is a memo we filed, which I frankly have not had a chance to review, and I hate to have the court come in. I don't think I would have time to prepare for it tonight with the witnesses. My responsibility is there, unless Mr. Whitney wants to come in and argue it tomorrow, but I, I would prefer to argue that a little later. What are we talking about? It's the motion for child abuse hearsay admissibility. <laughs> that, that That's not a five-minute motion in the morning. Understood. So I don't know when we're going to get a chance to do that. I know we still have to deal with a Facebook issue. And then tomorrow I'd also like to deal with the issues of the allegations of sexual abuse. When would you like so my, my question is, and as you know, I do not want the jury to just be cooling their jets back in the jury room. So is 8.30 the appropriate time for us? Your Honor, we, we have a number of exhibits to, in, in continuance of Mr. Kowalski's testimony, so I think we could use an additional 15 minutes if the court would allow. 8.30. Okay. I, I sort of lost the track there, Judge. Are they suggesting 8.15? That's yeah. what Mr. Whitney is saying, and Mr. Anderson is trying not to have 8.15. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Judge, it just seems, I don't know what the issues are going to be with the exhibits. I'm anticipating there's going to be some because they have like 10 videos that they want to play. Well, I, what I just heard was that there are additional exhibits coming tonight for the continuation of, of Mr. Kowalski's testimony in the morning. There's There are exhibits on our list today that we didn't get to. They were already disclosed to you. Oh, okay. Not new ones. And, and those include some pretty lengthy text messages that I think is going to be – take some time. Hopefully not. Judge, is it the court's intention to try to deal with the sexual abuse new allegations in the morning? Well, I had wanted to, but – Perhaps we'll do that at the end. Well, if you've got two doctors after Mr. Kowalski. There, there's no way, Judge. I, it doesn't that. Doesn't we matter. come at six. Well, if we came at 8 15. You know, the, the two motions you talked about, the motion to eliminate and, and the motion to amend, are matters that I will presumably be covering. So. It would be what? Uh, that I would be presumably covering. So, I mean, that maybe if they need to talk further among themselves. I, I don't think we're doing the mo the motion in limine slash motion to amend in the morning because okay. I, I want to deal with the exhibits. I'd like to deal with that motion at some point tomorrow, but it sounds like we've got a lot of testimony tomorrow. Yeah. And then you got Cantu on Wednesday. Sorry. Yeah, Cantu flying in to go Wednesday, so we might have to bump somebody. And it's going to bump the whole schedule. I'm just going to have to take the people that are flying in from out of town and then let the in-town people get moved. I, my original intention was to break up further the deposition, but I understand the court's ruling. It sounds like 8.15 is what we need to do tomorrow for exhibit purposes. I think that's correct. And And let's try to get everything finished with those exhibits within 50, 45 minutes, if we can, can, please. Yes, sir. Pretty please. <laughs> Cherry on top. <laughs> you are very good. Okay. Thank Your you. Honor, should, sorry, sorry. should we no. advise Mr. Elegant that he needs to be available sometime tomorrow to discuss that motion, or is that going to be moved to Wednesday? I would like to do deal with it tomorrow, because I think it needs to get resolved. Yes. But I'm... 
also cognizant of a lot of money sitting out in the hallways with all these doctors, too. I'm going to try. All of us will try, Judge, to help. Okay. Let's get out of here so you all can uh, be back at 8.15. <laughs> See you all at 8.15 tomorrow. We'll be in recess.